I may have. You have a problem. I do. I just have a really bad. All right, we got and someone coming in here. The air's not a friend. It's Halloween that hurts me as much as the race. Forest Hill, and I think to be Mathieu Blanchard charging into the aid station here, mile 61 on the Western States 100 course, sitting in eighth position, I believe the Frenchman, the two-time podium performer at UTMB, Mathieu Blanchard, looks like he's moving super smooth, Corinne. Yeah, he really does. Initially, when we were trying to identify that non- racer runner on the course. This looks much more indicative of what we were actually anticipating. Matthew Blanchard coming in, as we know, he left Michigan Bluff with a slight gap over Ludo that seems to have held, and he is currently moving very smoothly into Forest Hill. And I'm curious to kind of see what kind of reset he does here before he heads down to Cal Street. A lot of ground can be made up on Cal Street. It is net downhill, but there's plenty of climbing in it. And if you're feeling, if you're feeling good, you can really move quite quickly. Yeah. Right. Surprisingly, though, no, I mean, he's already 35 minutes back of the lead. Is that right? It's 2.41 p.m. Yeah. Dakota it's and just, uh, Tom came through at 2.05. Yeah. So he's 35 minutes back of the lead. And also, it appears that it's yeah, an 11-minute gap it's between 6th and 7th between eight, Jeff uh, Colt and Dan uh, Jones. Okay. Okay. So those top six are really doing yeah. battle right now. A little right bit off. of a cushion between Jeff Colt and Dan Jones. And now probably another 10 minutes or so yeah. between Dan Jones and Matthew Blanchard. So Dan Jones thoroughly in no man's land right now, but moving super well in seventh position. Meanwhile, we're looking down at Matthew Blanchard, the great French champion, getting the help of Marianne Hogan sort of positioned behind him to his right, now to his left. She was a third place finisher here at Western States last year. Unfortunately, couldn't take the start line today due to injury. It's great to have her here though, as part of Matthew's crew. And he's looking like he's having an okay day here. Taking his time, looking smart. He was looking very smooth running down the road. He did spend all of the winter and spring training for a road marathon for the sole intention of building, maintaining, cultivating speed in his legs as somebody who would probably classify himself as more of a mountain athlete. Yep, and he's, he's here in eighth. We should point out um, he's coming through an eighth position, but I do believe there is a bit of a gap now between him and um, that seventh, uh, sixth and seventh being Jeff Colt and Danny Jones. Um, we do believe that Matthew moved ahead of Ludo in that in the exit of Michigan Bluff, and I, we have not seen Ludo come through here, um, so we'll wait for the official split on the other side of the aid station, but we do believe that Matthew has left Ludo behind and is going to be moving into the eighth position, leaving Forest Hill. That will put him approximately 10 minutes or so back from Danny Jones when he gets out of here. Like that will be like the approximate gap between seventh and eighth. So he's moving up, kind of moving up and holding this position more than anything, but he has distanced himself from ninth and 10th place on this last section of trail. Looks like he's going to get paced by Thibaut Baroni and another great French athlete from the Solomon team. Thibaut specializing more in the Golden Trail World Series, shorter distance events, but made a trip here to the United States to pace his friend and fellow countrymen. Now Chu Blanchard here in the closing miles of the Western States 100. Still 38 miles to go here. Not sure if Tebow is going to take him that entire distance or if they'll swap it out. But certainly a solid team here cruising out of Forest Hill. Yeah, really, really excited to see this movement in the Forest Hill aid station. And I think the big thing is that we want to keep in our eyes turned towards Michigan Bluff as well because we are waiting for Eden Nilsson, Katie Asmith, Taylor Nowlin, and Keely Henninger to make their way up into that Michigan Bluff aid station. Paul Lind is going to be there for both Emily Hoggood and Taylor. Um, Esther um, Cholog should also be in that group as well. Again, the Hungarian athlete who lives in Hong Kong. Um, she has moved into that eighth place position and is only about a minute behind that group. And then there's a seven minute gap back to Meg Morgan and Priscilla Forgey. So some movement in the back part of that top 10. The most notable movement is Eden Nilsson 
kind of eclipsing the group in front of her, bringing Katie Asmith with her, and then Taylor Nowlin, Keely Henninger, and Emily Hoggett are, you know, are right in that mix as well. Super, super cool to see Ida having a bit of a rally here in the middle of the race. Definitely the type of athlete that can do damage here between Michigan Bluff and the finish line. We're probably maybe five to 10 minutes away from seeing race leader Courtney DeWalter come in to Michigan Bluff. No, to Forest Hill. I'm sorry, excuse me, to Forest Hill. Somewhere, she's coming in somewhere. Hopefully it's Forest Hill. Yeah, and then we should see that super impressive train of women's top 10 runners coming into Michigan Bluff here shortly also. Here's Ludovic Pomeray coming into Forest Hill. 47 year old icon of the game. One of the most consistent, steady runners out there. Currently sitting in ninth position overall. Last year's sixth place finisher here. Running with his wife. Looks like he's moving solidly as well. Yeah, moving really, really smoothly on this section. Kind of reflecting on the splits to, you know, that Cal 1 aid station. Again, Darnell's is going to be, let me just see here, we actually should be Cal 1, mile 65.7, should be looking at splits going back that way here shortly as well. I think in 2019, Tom came through that in 9.55, elapsed. I already texted. So again, we've got now our camera on your left. The big screen is Michigan Bluff, and it is big because we were waiting for Eden Nilsson, Katie Asmith, Taylor Nowlin, and Keely Henninger, and Emily Hoggood, and Esther Chillog to come to that aid station momentarily. Who's going to come in first in that group of Chase Pack? Again, that is positions three through eight are really, really tight in the women's race. Only, you know, like two to three minutes separating that entire group as of the last checkpoint. Very excited to see what's going to happen here. We are back to Matthew and his pacer in Forest Hill on the big screen. And then the small screen again is that Michigan Bluff image. We're watching Matthew leave leave Forest Hill. We want to make sure that we pick up our race leader coming into Forest Hill as well. We anticipate, you know, that it'll take her about an hour from Michigan Bluff to Forest Hill based on previous splits. So she should be there in the next two to three minutes as well. So hopefully there's a camera waiting for her as she enters Forest Hill because she should be there in the next three minutes. It's just bananas to think Courtney DeWalter is going to be entering. Here she is. Oh, my goodness. Courtney DeWalter entering the Forest Hill aid station. Is she now in the top ten? Ludovic Pomeray was the last person we saw in ninth position. So this could be Courtney DeWalter entering Forest Hill 62 miles into the Western States 100 in 10th position. Still looking super smooth. Ryan Waving Montgomery has come through Forest Hill. So okay. she's in 11th position. She has moved ahead of Cole Watson behind Ryan Montgomery sitting in 11th right now. Unbelievable quickly through the main aid station while she works her way towards her crew. And I actually believe that Courtney will be going pacerless for the duration of this race, talking to Kevin about it last week. So I think, you know, Courtney has run a lot of hundreds on her own. She's raced a lot of European hundreds where pace where we don't have pacers. And so I think Courtney will be going solo um, w without a pacer for the remainder of the race. Everyone will have their own opinion about that. That is okay. Um, but yeah, you know, you're allowed to have pacers. Use them if you want to. I know talking to Tom Evans and Janusz Kowalczyk, they personally were like, it's too distracting for the final bit of the race. Yep. I respect that. I welcome distraction, I guess. I'm an avoidant, an avoidant type. But right now, Courtney is blitzing through the Forest Hill aid station. Not envious champion. of that camera crew trying to get the shots. We haven't seen her meet her crew yet. It could be that she did so already on the near side of Forest Hill. But man, she is just putting on an absolute clinic here today. 
Courtney DeWalter, under an hour in that split between Michigan Bluff and Forest Hill. So fast, we faster were, than herself. She's wearing bib number 23 today. We were texting earlier in the week because I wore number 23 in my first Western State. She said, was that a lucky number? And I said, Michael Jordan, LeBron James, Courtney DeWalter. Love number it. Number 23. Love it so much. What Absolutely the, the Michael goat. Jordan of <laughs> trail running, the GOAT. Yeah. Courtney DeWalter, the hot off the lead here, still well under course record pace. Yeah, and I mean, just to reflect on where she's running in the overall group, right? So she's running in 11th position overall. She came through Forest Hill six minutes behind Matthew Blanchard, two minutes behind Ludo. You know, it's it's... Not only is she putting on a performance in the women's field, like this is an outstanding overall performance as well, just like reflecting on how insanely fast she is running. Yeah. Going out on a limb, it is very likely that she will move into the top 10 overall by the time they get to the track here. Obviously still a lot of miles to run, 38 to be exact, but she is showing no signs of weakness or vulnerability here at the head of the women's race. Now, all attention will turn back to Katie Scheid, who maintained that nine-minute deficit back at Michigan Bluff. If she continues to maintain that nine-minute deficit, that's when things really start to get interesting, Corinne. Yeah, I would, I would concur on that. Right now, though, I want to point out that Courtney DeWalter is running 25 minutes ahead of course record pace, so she's putting more time... <sighs> on that course record that means we'd be looking at oh so we're back that, that quickly michigan bluff we did just see keely henninger we are jumping all over the place trying to catch all facets of this race keely henninger this is where we almost were in tears last year when we saw keely henninger try to leave and realize that she couldn't that her ankle was really really bad and she had to walk back into the aid station and ultimately drop out we saw her making that really hard decision with her crew it was a painful thing to watch but there we go there's taylor now, Lynn, yes, 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 yes. Unbelievable. So if those two are in the aid station, it is likely that the likes of Emily Hoggett and Eda Nilsson are either there or splits. very close. I have splits for you. Split e us. Eda Nilsson came through 2.49 p.m. local time, 9.49 on the clock. Keely Henninger, 2.49 local time, 2.49, or 9.49.27 on the clock. Emily Hoggett is there as well, just four seconds back, um, as well as Eli White. Katie Asmith is about 90 seconds back through Michigan Bluff. Esther Chillog, um, another six seconds behind Katie Asmith. Taylor Nowlin, um, 11 seconds behind Esther. So that is our women's top eight are all within you know, let's see, let's, let me actually, I'll do some public math. Basically 49 even to 51. Um, yeah, two minutes basically separating number three to number eight at Michigan Bluff in the women's field. Holy smokes. That like, has I, never I, happened. I, I know Courtney is way out front. I know Katie Scheid is ahead of this next group. But the women that are running in three through eighth right now, unbelievable. Astounding. Two minutes between three and eight, but an hour ahead, it seems like. Question for you. We were trying to figure out how many runners and pacers you could fit in a boat. We didn't think it was actually going to become part of this conversation. But right now, you have <laughs> five women. They better have a few boats down they have, there. You have six women running within two minutes of each other. What is the maximum capacity of the boat? It's a really good question. Six women and maybe six pacers? People are going to have to blitz through the Rocky Chucky aid station because they're not going to want to get left behind. Courtney looking so smooth here, too. Running pacerless through Forest Hill. This is the part of the course that I mentioned earlier that is a slight reroute, hopefully for just this year. We are hopefully nearing a resolution on this section of the course that we were unable to use this year as we see Cole Watson here at Forest Hill getting cooled off. Probably sitting in about 12th position overall. 
And again, it's not that they're not running the whole Cal Street section. It's mostly that they just have to go around private property. So they're running down the road further yep. before they dive back into the trail. It's it's negligible um, based on everything I've heard from Craig. Gosh, she looks so good. Yeah, she looks really, really smooth. There's no hitch in her giddy up. She seems happy. I've seen I've seen Courtney not happy in a race before, and you know that something was off. I was there at Hard Rock when she dropped out. Um, I was there to work for I Run Far and to crew and pace Megan Hicks that day, and you could tell that something was off with her. Mm. Like things were not fun, things were not funny, and so really interesting to see. I mean, you can just tell there. You can tell the difference of when things are going well for Courtney when they truly aren't. Yep. Seems like things are going well today. So again, she went through Forest Hill about seven minutes ago. So if the gap has remained the same, we should expect to see second place runner Katie Scheid, fellow American, though living in France. Katie Scheid, a fellow UTMB champion with Courtney DeWalter in second place. Back at Michigan Bluff, that gap was nine minutes it'll be interesting to see if that has grown here at forest hill my new favorite comment of the entire live stream the flu has to get a courtney DeWalter shot once a year <laughs> brilliant brilliant i'm here for the puns i'm here for the jokes lay them on me in the live chat yeah and from the splits historically on the course it looks, I mean, the top the top eight women, those three through eight positions are running in top 10 all-time splits through Michigan Bluff right now. They are moving really, really fast, akin to when Ryan Montgomery was told, hey, buddy, you're on 15-10 pace, like you're doing just fine. Just imagine here, like thinking you're suffering, thinking you're moving back in the field, you're moving for, you're moving towards the 10th, you know, ninth or 10th in the top 10. You move backward a couple spots, you're feeling maybe kind of bad about yourself. Then to hear you're running a 15-10, or you're on 15-10 pace, like, that's got to be a big boost. Goodness gracious. It's tough to tell if Courtney is ahead or behind of Ryan Montgomery here upon the exit of the Forest Hill Aid Station, but Ryan's also looking very solid here, cruising down the road. It's a gentle downhill trajectory all the way till they make that sharp left-hand turn onto the dirt road, which plunges down to Cal 1, where they can finally gain the Western States course again on the historic section known as Cal Street that's just a gentle sloping descent down to the river, although it's much harder than I just described it. Yeah, you make it sound really easy, but I, I, I describe it as there's a lot of uphill in that downhill to the river yeah. because it is and it just like kind of kicks you over and over again. Yeah, unbelievably quick running by Courtney DeWalter. I guess the question is, where is Katie Scheid? Courtney came through Forest Hill 10 minutes ago, so that gap looks to be extending a little bit over Katie Scheid. We're going to be waiting to see Katie Scheid make her way up into Forest Hill, and we want to see kind of what that gap is. Katie still had a good you know, 48 minute lead over the chase pack at Michigan Bluff. So it's not like, it's not like Katie is slowing down. Yeah. Like she has Still a running. big, she's a bigger lead over the chase pack behind her, but she's lost some time to Courtney DeWalter. So I'm curious to see what is Katie Scheid's split coming into Forest Hill. We are on pins and needles here as we continue to watch women's leader, Courtney DeWalter cruise down the road here. Looking back now. What are we looking at here? So oh, it's Cody Lind. Cody Lind exiting Forest Hill here. So he must be in 12th or 13th position, depending on how Cole Watson is doing. Yeah, it's kind of, it's always hard. Forest Hill is a hard one based on where people are crewing from. So it looks like Cole Watson in 11th for, for the in the men's race at... Forest Hill came through at 2.50 on the clock, 9.50 elapsed. Arlen Glick a minute behind him in 12th. And then two minutes back from that from them was, where it was Cody Lind. So 11, 12, and 13 separated by all of two minutes. Janusz Kowalczyk also right there, just another 30 seconds behind Cody Lind. Wow. So again, that, that, that 11, 12, 13, 14 spot is all very tight together. 
We cut to Rocky Chucky River crossing. This is still well down the trail for the athletes, but an iconic part of the Western States course, something that every runner looks forward to. Their passage across the American River before climbing up to Green Gate in the final fast 20 miles of the race here today. Courtney taking that left-hand turn. She's about to hit the dirt road where she'll have probably another mile and a half or so till she hits the next aid station at Cal 1. And it sounds like, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. It sounds like Katie Scheid is into Forest Hill per I Run Far. I don't think she's hit the timing mat yet, but it sounds, oh, she has officially hit the timing max. She has lost two minutes to Katie, or two minutes to Courtney. Nice work, nice 11, work. 11, 11 Good minutes job, back. That's Zach Marion in our ears. There's that. What is going on, everyone? It is Zach. I'm here at the Forest Hill Aid Station, and I have some updates for you. First and foremost, the juiciest news of the day. As Dakota was leaving down Forest Hill, he mentioned that he is trying to break Tom. That is a tough, tough thing to do. Tom actually looked pretty frazzled at that point. He audibly was saying he has to get out of here. He has to catch back up with Dakota. Dakota left wow. through here without ice. He hasn't been using ice really all day, just kind of dousing himself in a little water and taking off. So that is the juiciest news of the day. It looks like Dakota is in the driver's seat and he is controlling how this race is going at this point, but still a lot of race. Right behind them, we have Tyler Green who looked fantastic in typical Tyler Green fashion. If anyone has ever seen his pit stops here on Forest Hill, he comes in and it is a truly an F1 pit stop where tires are being changed, gas is being refueled. I saw ice vest coming out of uh, coolers. It was an amazing thing to watch. And he was out of here, all smiles. Tyler is putting his nick out there and he is racing like he has nothing to lose. A second place here, what, what else is there other than a first place? So he is hunting and chasing only a few minutes back. Anthony Castalis was right on his heels. He looked like he was on a mission. He's got something to prove. We all know it. He just has to put it together. He was smiling, he was happy. Uh, but he definitely looks like he is now chasing Tyler for third place in that podium spot. Shai Jing was right behind him. He looked like he was working pretty good, but just did a casual, calm, smooth move through the aid stations. Jeff Colt was hyping up the crowd here at Forest Hill. The dude knows how to feed off that energy, and he was doing it big time. He's been looking a little bit more rough throughout the day, but he's a tough, tough, tough dude. So we're going to see how he holds on to that. Behind him, you had Danny Jones who cruised through here like true Kiwi Island style. Nothing to nothing to gain, nothing to lose. He's just out here having a good time, looking smooth, making it look easy while he's doing it. Matthew Blanchard, he just wanted to be doused with some ice. He got iced up and then bolted out of here. Ludovic Pomare, my heart goes out to him. His legs are looking really shaky as he was coming through here. He's got a very, very strong background, so we'll see what he can do with this final 50K. But he definitely took some time here icing down and cooling off and working with his crew. Ryan Montgomery, typical fashion for Ryan, just all smiles. He's doing work, but he's making, he's making, making himself smile while he's doing it. He knows he's got something here that he can be really proud of. He's been working for years to get here, and so he's definitely working for that. Cole Watson right behind him. Cole Watson a local favorite. He is literally heading home right now down towards Auburn, making his way. When he came through here, the aid station lit up. They were happy to see him. He was happy, uh, moving really well, needed a little bit of uh, broth, and then he was out of here. Cody Lind, I've never seen a smile bigger. That dude is on a mission. It looks like Cody and Cole Watson and Janish, they were all racing a smart race early. And now it's their time to turn it on and they are hunting those top 10 spots. And then for the ladies side, nice work, Rod. Here's Rod Farvard making his way through. We've got Courtney DeWalter was crewed off of Bath Road. So she ripped through here in incredible fashion. She is hunting that course record. She knows it. She knows she's in striking distance of it. She knows that she just has to keep moving forward and she's got it. Katie Scheid was 11 minutes back, looking smooth, looking controlled. Both of these two ladies, 11 minutes with 50K to go is really nothing. If you think about it, that's 
10, 20 seconds per minute mile. It can get eaten up pretty easily if someone hits a bonk. So Courtney doesn't have it in the bag, but she's moving really well. Katie is making her work for it. Like you guys mentioned earlier, iron sharpens iron, and these two girls are going to push themselves under a course record pace, it looks like. Big thanks to Zach. Wow, great updates there. Incredible to hear that anecdote about Dakota, who's actively trying to break Tom Evans here, 62 miles into the race. Sort of similar to what he attempted at the Hard Rock 100 back in July of last year, where he tried to put the hurting on Killian and Francois. Ultimately backfired there, so Dakota can't help but admire him going out on a limb and taking that swing. Yeah, so, so very impressive. That's Arlen Glick now on your screen. Again, the standout from last year, something someone who surprised, I think, many and didn't surprise others because people were in the know about him. He's dominated a bunch of Midwest, very fast, flat ultras. Arling Glick was third here last year, um, currently in the chase, um, sitting in that group of men that are all pretty tight together in that 11th, 12th, 13th, and 14th position. And then there's about a six-minute gap back to Jonathan Rea in 15th. So Katie shied 11 minutes back of Courtney DeWalter. That gap has expanded two minutes since Michigan Bluff, but she is still very much in the fight. Courtney DeWalter on like a 16-15 pace so here at Western fast. States. An absolutely ridiculous pace being set by the all-time great. But meanwhile, Katie shied also under course record pace here, well on her way to a historically great 100-mile performance, though there are still 38 miles to go. I mean, and then we also have our top 10 women officially through Michigan Bluff because behind Taylor, we did have Priscilla Forgey and Meg Morgan come through. There's about a minute between the two of them, but they are about um, 11 or so minutes down from eighth position. So nine and 10, very close together. I imagine Jen Jenny Quilty and Leah Yingling are not far behind them, and they should be followed by the likes of Riley Brady as well. But yeah, there is some exciting things happening. When we had that short commercial break, I was, I peeped, peeped my head into the RV with all of our tech people and I was like, are you guys losing it? Because I am definitely losing it no. right now. We are losing it. Rod Farvard exiting Forest Hill with a nice luxurious umbrella on a warm, beautiful Bluebird California day. And these are blistering hot races, though not blistering hot conditions here at Western States. If you're just joining us, this is going to be in the this sort of like top five coolest years in Western States history. Again, we are celebrating the 50th Western States and these fast times are definitely being assisted by the cool weather. We are sitting here on the track at Placer High School. You can see in the top left, we are showing 76 degrees here on the ground. Certainly not cold by any stretch of the imagination, but last year at this time, Corinne, it was more like 96 here on the track. Yeah, 100%, though I just I just stepped off the stage for a second to give some folks an update about when we were expecting the finishers to come finish here on the track that we're sitting on. And I was in the sun for a little bit and I was like, ooh, actually, you know, we are quite pleasant here. Now we were freezing cold this morning. Megan Can Canfield had to bring me an extra jacket so I could bundle up like I was in a sleeping bag. But right now in the sun, it is definitely heating up out there. It, ambient air temperature, not that hot. That solar radiation, very, very warm. Totally. So unfortunately, it doesn't look like we're getting splits from the Cal One aid station, but we should start getting a split, at least from the Tom Evans, Dakota Jones lead a train in the men's race any minute now. I would expect that they will be coming through Cal Two in short order. They did leave Forest Hill a little bit more than an hour ago at 9.05 elapsed. That was 2.05 p.m. local time. It is now 3.08 p.m local time so i'm going to check what tom's split was there in 2019. looks like tom came through cal 2 at 10 37 elapsed in 2018. so that was uh, an hour and 13 minutes from his exit of forest hill so again we are now an hour and five minutes from his exit so probably less than 10 minutes until we get an update from Cal 2. Yeah, very, very exciting. I'm, yeah, I love the Dakota Jones, like I'm gonna break him mentality. I think that's really, really bold and very, very smart as well. How about the fact that he's not really using any ice though, you know? Yeah, I'm really curious about that. Like what is the, does that backfire at some point? Like is, you know, is it flying too close to the sun? Is it, you know, 
I don't know, that, that that's a choice, that's a risk, et cetera. You got to do what, what you think is right and comfortable. We are seeing people use a lot of ice, use a lot of pretty normal cooling strategies, despite it being, you know, in, then in air quotes again, not that hot out there. Like it definitely turns out when you've been running 40, 50, 60 miles, thermoregulating gets a little bit tricky. So even if it's, you know, pleasant for your crew, I imagine that you are quite warm. Yeah, and Zach did also say that Courtney got her crewing done up near Bath Road, so she didn't even really stop for any sort of a crew transition in Forest Hill, which wow. is pretty remarkable. And I she hasn't been using much ice or anything either, it seems like, so it doesn't really surprise me. She's probably able to do some like quick little like offs and ons to make sure that everything was working properly. So we are looking now at Luo Kanhua, one of our Chinese athletes, doing his aid station transition here at Forest Hill. Right next to the Zach Miller bus. This is the second 100 miler he's run on this these trails since April, also doing the Canyons 100 miler a couple of months ago. Luo Kanhua making the most of his time here in the US, also doing a 50 miler on my home trails in Marin County. We spent many of those hours out there together. Unfortunately, we don't share a language, but definitely we're sharing that trail spirit together. Seems like a really nice guy. Are we also not? Also, has his friends and family here from China. I was gonna say, are we not anticipating a Cal One split? Well, I mean, they'd be through there by they now. They should be through yeah. there. Or do you think that we might get a, just a mega delayed Cal One split at some point? Maybe. I know. I know that the service down there is literally non-existent. Like that's where a. a a dearth of the ham radio operators exist on the course, I feel like is along the Cal Street section in particular, and then over on Greengate where there's also no service. But I was just kind of, yeah, curious if we'll actually get a Cal a Cal split there. Here's Topher Gaylord shepherding Katie Scheid down the road here at Forest Hill. Topher Gaylord, a seven-time finisher here at the race and a board member of Western States running as the pacer of Katie Scheid, the great American running in second place here today. Yeah, really, really impressive. I mean, I think Topher has paced many a runner at Western States. He is someone that you want. If you if you were coming into your first ever Western States, he is he is someone that you would, you know, reach out to, I think, to be like, hey. I, I imagine Katie Shad had to fight fight to maybe get Topher on her team because I'm sure that the Gaylords are a hot commodity totally. when it comes to race day. Yeah, Topher's wife, Kim, is sort of the crew chief for Katie here today. Kim has been my crew chief at UTMB in the past. They are two of the great characters in the sport of trail running. Topher's taking Katie all 38 miles today. Whoa, I yeah. did not know that. I know he was a little nervous about being able to keep up. So Godspeed to Topher Gaylord as he runs under the women's course record pace here today with this great American champion and defending UTMB champion Katie Scheid. Yeah, really really cool to see their dynamic out there like yeah under course record pace i think she was worried about this flatter stuff but she is moving really really well like she's still probably on pace to run like 16 30. that's like that's silly wildly fast yeah and again i think the next you know we'll be looking for that chase pack to be coming into the chase pack at Forest Hill with this group of women is going to be a little bit bonkers. I think it was bonkers at Michigan Bluff. I think it's going to be extra bonkers come um, come Forest Hill because the atmosphere at Forest Hill is just, you know, next level intensity wise. I imagine that they will be through there at about three forty to three fifty local time. So we've got you know another. 30-ish minutes or so before we expect our chase pack to make it into Forest Hill. That That is, that has been the gap historically. I'm wondering if anyone's feeling good in that group and wants to start pushing a little bit early, but very, very cool. I need, need an update from Cal 2. I'm desperately smashing the refresh button. I need to know if Dakota Jones has made his move on Tom Evans. We will know soon enough. Again, they exited Forest Hill about an hour and 10 minutes ago. It's typically about an hour and 13, hour and 15 minute stretch there between Forest Hill and Cal 2, moving at the pace that they are cruising here today. 
So hang tight. We should get an update from Tom Evans in Dakota, though we will not have cameras from down there at Cal 2. Yeah, we're just, we are doing what you were doing, which is sitting at home and hitting the refresh button over and over and over again and praying that something comes out of it. Yeah, Aaron Shimmons in the chat reminding us that Germain, Katie Scheid's partner, just won the 90K, the Mont Blanc 90K in Chamonix, France, just yesterday. So a lot of good vibes there in their little team. Germain getting ready for UTMB this year. Katie Scheid winning at UTMB last year, transitioning her focus here to Western States this season. And she is off to a great start now, two thirds into today's race. Yeah, someone in the chat said, talk about, it was Aaron actually, Shimon said, talk about an ultra running power couple. Yeah. Jermo winning the Mont Blanc 90K yesterday, Katie Scheid currently crushing herself at Western States. That is that is quite the weekend for both of them. Yeah. So this paved road here will quickly turn to dirt and it drops pretty precipitously. It's steeper than it appears here on camera. Shout out to our camera team here who is running women's course record pace to bring us that footage. But basically Katie Scheid is gonna be running down that dirt road for probably another mile and a half or two miles before she hits the Cal 1 aid station and regains the Western States 100 trail. You then take a hard right on the Western States 100 trail and then you're on single track for most of the rest of the 15 miles down to the river. So massive lead here between the top two women. I think Corinne said that it was about 48 minutes between Katie Scheid and third place runner Ida Nilsson from back at Michigan Bluff. So Katie Scheid about 11 minutes back with the all-time great Courtney DeWalter, but with a super healthy, safe cushion back to Ida Nilsson. So I don't know. I wonder what she's thinking, Corinne, right? Is it like... You know, she obviously is running under course record pace. I'm sure her ambition is to win here today, not just settle for second. She will want to fight for the victory. She's certainly not scared of any athlete in the sport, but she knows that as long as she doesn't screw it up, she's still putting together a fantastic race. Yeah, so Liam, in my ear here, not in my ear, in my eyes, but our, our good friend, our aid station fireball, just wanted me to know that Courtney and Katie have run two of the fastest splits ever through the canyons. They ran that section. Uh, they, they ran the two fastest splits ever through Forest Hill at mile 62, arriving in 948 and 959, respectively. The next three fastest splits through that zone are the 2019 race, Courtney DeWalter, 1004. The 2012 record by Ellie Greenwood in 1013. And then Tracy Garneau in, 11, in 2011 in 1019. So Courtney and Katie, the fastest splits ever to get to Forest Hill. So that's the high country and the canyons. That first 100K, absolutely blistering fast. Unbelievable. Makes total sense at the same time as we look at John Ray here, probably just behind Katie Scheid, likely sitting in, I don't know, maybe 14th or 15th overall here. John Ray from Boulder, Colorado, super strong athlete. Cutting back to Zach Miller, I think at, oh, he's at Forest Hill. Taking the selfie with the fans. At the bus. Gotta love it. And then also from Liam as well, Tom Evans and Dakota Jones run just, just run the fourth and fifth fastest times. Tom Evans through Cal 2. Oh. No update from Dakota yet. Keep refreshing. But let me tell you about how fast Dakota and Tom ran that through to the canyon section. They ran the fourth and fifth fastest all-time splits through the canyons. Um, last chance to Forest Hill. So for mile 43 to mile 62. They uh, The only people faster are Jim Walmsley. He's done it both in 246 and 248. And Jared Hazen, who's run that section in 247. Jeez, man. And, so, and Tom Evans and Dakota Jones ran it in 250. Wow. Really, really good, impressive. Good company to be in. So basically, they're just behind the two fastest times ever run on the course. Is that right? Yeah, essentially. Yeah. 
So continuing to hit refresh here, Tom Evans, the only update we have through Cal 2, he went through at 10, 12 elapsed. That is now seven minutes ago and no update from Dakota Jones. This is mile 70.7, Peach Stone, AKA Cal 2. Tom Evans has not been broken. At least as far as we know, not been broken. So he ran that stretch, I think, like five minutes faster than he did in. Yeah, so he did it in th an hour and 13 minutes in 2019. And this year he ran it in an hour and seven minutes. So he ran it six minutes faster from Forest Hill to Cal 2. That's absolutely bonkers. silly. And Zach did say that as Dakota was attempting to break the elastic out of Forest Hill, that Tom left fairly frantically, making sure that that elastic didn't break, that he maintained contact with Dakota Jones. But potentially Tom is the one now trying to break that elastic. And, and of note as well, Tom has a pacer to the river, and I don't think Dakota does, but then Dakota will have a pacer from the river to the finish. I'm, I think, I'm pretty sure that was that was. Having talked to both of them this week, I think that's what it was going to boil down to. Still refreshing. It's been eight minutes since Tom went through Cal 2. Still no update from Dakota. That feels like too big of a gap to gain in just eight miles. Now eight minutes. So it could be that Dakota's tracker didn't read or we're waiting for a ham radio update from Dakota's bib. So things are starting to get interesting here on Cal Street, a super crux section of the course where there's always some dramatic developments. Things are, this is, we just, we live for the drama, you know? We just, we live for it. Absolutely. Cortisol is high around here. Recaffeinating now myself, Corinne, feeling on top of my game. We got Scott Treyer in that aid station. He's got the, once again, the world's biggest ice bandana on his back. Getting that thing loaded full before he heads down Cal Street towards the Rocky Chucky River crossing. Rocking the broken toe out there today along with the M10 bib. It looks like Scott Treyer sitting in about 19th position. Yeah, did I, uh, did I tell you that Tom Evans didn't even fly with a headlamp to Western States? It's so gangster, didn't even it? Didn't even bring one to the States. Sometimes you got to just bet on yourself, you know? Yeah, 100%. A hundred percent. Oh yeah, these are just some photos that came from the course. Wow. Just chaos at Forest Hill. I got sent some photos from a friend of Jeff Colt coming through Forest Hill, and you can just appreciate the chaos and the energy in the like in the Forest Hill area in these photos. It's really really cool to see. Keep your eyes peeled for everything that's got to be coming out. I haven't, I haven't had a, a second. I haven't even opened social media yet today. I feel like Mike McMonagle is probably out there just blasting away at photos. So Iron Farr giving an update here from Cal 2. Tom Evans leads the 2023 Western States 100 at Peach Stone, mile 71 in 10, 12 elapsed. Asked for lots of ice, filled his bottles, and took off. He looks good. I love and it. No Iron Farr updates since then. That was, what was the elapsed time? 10, 12. Okay, so well, well under his split of 10, 37. When he ran 14, 59. So he's he's well on pace for that 1430-ish, that 1428 that he himself predicted for the men's finishing time here today. Yeah, absolutely bonkers. We predicted that we would likely have a couple guys under 15 hours. Tom predicted that it was gonna take 1428 to win. Things are looking more and more like they're shaping up to be just that. I'm blown away. Still no update from Dakota here. Come on, Dakota. As we look back at Rod Farvard here, dropping down that dirt road towards Cal 1. Dardanelles. So there's three aid stations on the way down to the Rocky Chucky River crossing. They have official names, but most people just call them Cal 1, Cal 2, and Cal 3. 
Seems like we're not getting updates from Cal 1. We are getting updates from Cal 2. Not sure about Cal 3, but definitely we will have cameras down at the river. Which is always so exciting. That's where we saw Emily Hoggood last year kind of having taken that moment to, to re- organize herself, get things back together before she went on to fight for that fifth position after being up in that top one, two, three position for so much of the day. A lot can happen. It's not it's not over till it's over. But right now things are looking very, very exciting. I am probably gonna break the refresh button here on my internet. Our computers have yet to overheat, but I feel like by saying that, I've probably just cursed us. Some really great photos from Iron Far further back at Michigan Bluff in the women's race. Great photo of Meg Morgan here in 10th place, mile 55, with Leah just behind. Leah Yingling, that is, just behind in 11th. So this is back at Michigan Bluff here. We do now have the top 10 women, it appears, through Michigan Bluff. So now we will see that train start matriculating towards Forest Hill. And that's gonna be an exciting show to see. Yeah, I really, I'm doing the same thing here. Refreshing, refreshing, refreshing. We do expect that our lead, that, that not the lead women, but that that large pack of women, that chase pack of women that are in positions three through eight. Again, Eda Nilsson, Keely Henninger, Emily Hoggood, Katie Asmith, Esther Chillog, Taylor Nowlin. We expect them to be about 40, 45 minutes back of when Katie Scheid came through Forest Hill. So we should expect them, I think, in the next, you know, 14 to 20 minutes or so at Forest Hill. Big update here, Corinne. I run far reporting that Dakota Jones is now 10 minutes back of race leader Holy Tom Evans at Cal 2. That means that Tom Evans has made up eight minutes in, sorry, 10 minutes in eight miles on his closest competitor, Dakota Jones. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So Dakota that Jones move. went to break Tom Evans. Tom Evans said, not today, buddy. I'm going to try to break you instead. Tom Evans now a 10-minute lead as our race leader from the UK, 70 miles into today's race. We're going to go ahead and cut to a quick athlete profile while we have a couple of minutes. We'll be right back. What's up, my beautiful people? Hella CDB here, aka Hella Good, Run Shrieker, ran across America, did a 100 mile race last year. Now we're about to do the Western State 100. The biggest thing for this race is shoes. Like, I can run naked with no clothing, but we gotta have the right proper footing. We got the Tecton X. I'll be rocking this most of the race, and I will eventually switch into the Tecton X2. This is a dual carbon plate of shoes. It is really good, very grippy, and is good on technical surface. And I think it'll be perfect for Western State 100. We got the hat. It's gonna be hat. We gotta keep or head cool and everything, so rocking polka hat. I'm wearing all black everything, so this is basically a typical running shirt. It has little tiny holes in it, so I can get some good breathing air, but everything black, that's what I like, and I'm wearing shorts that are tight as well, right there. We'll have a handheld bottle. This will be for some sips and also, you know, keeping myself cool. We gotta track the 100 mile race. Is it a 100 mile race if it's not on Shava? I don't think it is, so we gotta make sure it's on Shava. Just in case, we are wearing four watches. We got the Coros Apex Pro 2. We got the Garmin 955 Forerunner Solar. We got the Apple Ultra. We got the Apple Series 7. So one of these watches will make it through 100 miles. I can never go anywhere without thinking about where I'm from. No matter how life goes, I always have to represent West Africa, Mali. So I'm wearing my fly color on my, on my arm. So we got um, green, yellow, red. So that's the fly color of Mali, West Africa. Western State, we got to stay cool. Everybody know how hot it gets. So... This is our ice bandana from Hoka. Shout out to Hoka. You already know. Hoka all day, every day. I got something very special here. I met a gentleman a couple years ago in Colorado, Bill, Bill Stealth, and he gave me this bracelet. I wore it at Leadville 100, but it's just be positive. So I'm going to have this on my wrist during this race. No matter the tough time comes, I'm going to look at my hands and say, hella, be positive. There's always something beautiful in every, in every struggle that we go through in life. So be positive, y'all. 
Okay, Adam, Mary coming through here into Forest Hill. Sitting in about 20th position here, Adam Mary from Boulder, Colorado. But holy smokes, Corinne, going back to the news of the hour, or at least the news of the last 10 minutes, Dakota Jones now 10 minutes back of race leader. Tom Evans through mile 70. Tom Evans has made his move now firmly establishing himself in the lead of today's race. And now it is his race to lose a 10 minute gap with 30 miles to go. Yeah, over the course of eight miles. That is absolutely mind blowing. So Dakota is probably looking over his shoulder at this point for guys like Tyler Green and Anthony Costales who are gonna be breathing down his neck any second. Hopefully Dakota Jones is still feeling okay out there. He's been running an absolutely phenomenal race here today. Everybody hits a low point eventually. And here at Western States, competing against the world's best, depending on when you hit your low point, you're bound to get swallowed up by a couple of those competitors. Tyler Green was sitting about 11 minutes back at Dakota Jones upon exit of Forest Hill. Anthony Costales about 13 minutes back. So we'll be looking for updates from Iron Far and from ultralive.net from back there at Cal 2 here Adam, any minute. Adam's got his wife and baby there. Oh, kisses for the new baby. I love this. Adam Mary's just got to be one of the happiest guys out there right now. There's my guy Ryan Thrower there with the camera. Tyler Green runs through in third at mile 71. He is 15 minutes back of the leader and in a big rush. Looks very strong, according to Iron Far. Holy smokes. Tyler Green, it sounds like, is now five minutes back of Dakota. I can't even. I'm so impressed with everyone that's out there, and I'm just flabbergasted by what's happening at the front of these fields right now as well. Just absolutely mind-bending. Unbelievable. Tyler Green, a new father himself. Their baby boy, Lou, is about nine months old now. Tyler Green looks like he is swallowing ground ahead towards Dakota Jones. He's not making time up on Tom Evans, but he has made up roughly six minutes on Dakota in just eight miles. So Dakota is likely suffering a little bit out on the trail there today. Again, that is somewhat inevitable, especially, like I mentioned, on Cal Street. What I would classify as the most crux section of the course where there's always drama unfolding. It's not unusual to have a bit of a rough patch there. Let's see if Dakota can rally. Yeah, and my question is, you know, is, is Tom running that fast or is it a combination of Dakota having a moment, et cetera? Like, where did that time get eaten up, right? Like, it, it could be... It could be like a couple, you know, maybe his gut's gone south, right? Or something. And he like had to take a break, do something in the bushes, avoid yeah. the poison oak, et cetera. Like, you know, there are lots of reasons why things can fall apart. And I'm wondering, is it, it's probably a combination of factors of Tom, Tom feeling good, Tom fighting, accelerating and Dakota having a bobble there. But I'm curious, yeah, I'm curious to hear the stories when we get them to the track here and yeah. not all that long. I would guess that with the course reroute, that section between Forest Hill and Cal 2 is at least a minute or two faster, just given the fact that you remain on the paved road for longer and every step of it is downhill where, you know, you have at least a couple ups and downs on the way towards Cal 1. But either way, Tom absolutely ripping it between Forest Hill and Cal 2. Again, running six minutes faster than his own split on the original course from 2019. So we should expect to see an update from Anthony Castales here soon. Let's smash refresh again here. So good to see Tyler Green back here. I know he was sort of waffling as to whether or not he was going to come back for his fourth consecutive Western States after two top five performances in the last couple of years. Here we do have Anthony Costales now into Cal 2. He is 17 minutes back of the lead. 
So two minutes back of Tyler, seven minutes back of Dakota. He looks a bit hot, took a huge slice of watermelon, and walked out of the aid station, according to Iron Farr. Yeah, the splits that are coming out on the live tracker has an eight-minute gap between Tom and Dakota, a seven-minute gap between Dakota and Tyler, a one-minute gap between Tyler and Anthony. And so my guess is that I run far is probably just ahead of the aid station, maybe. And then these splits are from post aid station or something. Yeah, interesting. But that's what the that's what the ballpark that's what the auto or the put like the manually entered splits are for that Cal two aid station is eight minutes between Tom and Dakota, seven minutes between Dakota and Tyler, one minute between Tyler and Anthony. Wow. Heck yeah, what a race. Uh, four absolutely incredible athletes as we await we expect to be Shen Ji Shen through that aid station here any minute also. Yeah, still like really hanging on. I feel like he's had a little bit of a fade, but I mean, he's like, it's not like the wheels have completely come off by any means. Super strong performance from him. I think racing in the U.S. for the first time as we see Scotty Treyer cruising out a Forest Hill down towards Cal 1. So for those who are unfamiliar with race leader, Tom Evans, you may have been living under a rock the last couple of years, but the dude has only run like seven ultras and every single one of them has been absolutely class. I recall he sort of came out of nowhere after not really being a runner ever in his life. And I think he finished third at Marathon de Sable. It was probably back in like 2016. Quick detour here. Jeff Colt now in fifth place ahead of Shen Ji Shen through Cal 2. Mile 71, he is 19 minutes back of race leader. He is a little slow coming into the aid station, takes lots of ice and seems very thirsty, according to Iron Farr, but Jeff Colt is now sitting in fifth place overall. Corinne, your comments as coach. Oh my goodness. I'm just gonna get, m my anxiety is gonna climb, I think is what's gonna happen as we wait for I mean, he's him to made, make it to the finish. He's made up time on Anthony, hasn't he? If he's only two minutes back of Anthony here, let's yep. look back. Yeah, that would be that would be him closing for sure. Holy smokes! And f and th that would put him, you know, like not that far back from Tyler either, which would be really cool. All right, so let's see here. So Jeff Colt was three minutes behind, three and a half minutes behind Anthony out of Forest Hill. So now two minutes back of Anthony at Cal 2. Yeah, so the, the splits on the ultralive.net show him two minutes behind Anthony, three minutes behind Tyler Green. That is him moving in the right direction. Man, that podium chase for the men is still very much alive and well. The race for the win is still alive and well. Tom in control right now with, you know, according to the official splits here on ultralive.net, an eight-minute gap, but still, man. But 18 minutes between first and fifth is right. nothing. It's mega That's close. That's tight. That yeah. is tight racing. And all, you know, probably sitting at or under 15-hour pace. So we look at J.P. Giblin cruising down towards Cal 1 here. Yeah, from Forest Hill, Jeff probably made up two minutes on Anthony and th two to three minutes on Tyler. So he has closed to those two guys ahead of him. Aaron Farr made it seem like he looked like he was struggling a little bit in the aid stations, but after 70 miles, it's difficult to interpret you know, body language who doesn't, accurately. Who doesn't look bad at mile 70? Uh, no Tom kidding. Evans, apparently. Yeah. Probably Courtney DeWalter, but. Yeah. Speaking of which. We'll be looking for that update here pretty soon. Back to what I was saying about Tom Evans. I recall he finished third at the Marathon de Saab stage race. I think it was probably back in 2016 or 2017. Ultimately had podium performance at CCC before going on to win CCC. He's obviously been on the podium here at Western States. He's been on the podium of UTMB. He's been on the podium of Black Canyon 100K. Here in the U.S., he's been on the podium of the Lake Sonoma 50 here in the U.S. So Tom Evans, truly a class athlete here in the lead of the Western States 100. 
on his way to accomplishing a dream here today. Yeah, I'm kind of looking back through some of the people we've been keeping our eyes on today. Looks like we are we don't have any live cameras that have runners in them right now. So they are cutting back to us in studio. Welcome. Finish line behind us. 10 hours, 40 minutes on the clock. I was uh, taking a peep to see where our oldest runners are out on the course. Gene Dyke, 75 years old, is through Miller's defeat. He came through there at 2.52 p.m., well on his way to Dusty Corners. Cruising. And then the other person I want to check in on was our oldest. So Gene Dykes is moving at a 17.12 pace, 17 minutes, 12 seconds. I think according to Craig Thornley, you have to average an 18-minute pace to get under 30 hours here. Yeah, unfortunately, the oldest female in the race, Angie, looks like to have looks like she's withdrawn at... Um, at Robinson Flat at mile 30 um, earlier earlier today. She will not be making her way to the finish. Unfortunately, she looked like she was moving pretty darn well early in the race, but the snow likely took its toll. Tom Evans now through Cal 3, oh 1036 laps. Gosh. That's mile 73-ish. So it's just a quick difference there between Cal 2 and Cal 3. Tom Evans coming through again, 10.36 elapsed. That's four minutes ago here local time. Yeah, so the question is, what is that gap going to be? The gap to Dakota Jones, the gap to Tyler, Anthony, and Jeff Colt, who are all hot on his heels, chasing really, really hard. We also want to keep an eye over at Forest Hill. So we're going to be, our attendants are going to be split here as we have cameras going. We're going to have cameras hopefully alive and well at Forest Hill. Looking for Ida, Keeley, Emily, Katie, Esther and Taylor to come through there probably in the next five to 10 minutes or so right now. Um, so we're gonna be keeping our eye at Forest Hill and then we're gonna be looking for Tom to be getting in a boat here pretty darn quickly. But those men, again, I was worried about the women getting into the boats. We're gonna first see the men navigate this whole boat fiasco ahead of time. Get in the boat. Get in the boat is right. So still no update from Shenji Shen from Cal 2, nor Danny Jones. So Shen, it looks like, is experiencing a bit of a rough patch or at least is losing ground on the competitors that he's been mixing it up with through these first 70 miles. And what a battle that's unfolding here today in the men's top 10 on the Cal Street section of the course as we look down at the Rucky Chucky River Crossing, the iconic point in the race where runners enjoy the merciful cool waters of the American River. Sometimes they cross under their own power. Sometimes they cross in boats this year due to the historic snowpack in the Sierra and the rapid water movement. They will be moving across in boats this year. Yeah, I've uh, I've been fortunate to go both both on foot and by boat. I've got to say I like going across it on foot better than via boat personally. Um, I feel like having to awkwardly sit in a boat yep. kind of disrupts your flow a little bit. The cool part when you d when you cross on foot, they've got a rope across the whole thing, right? And then they have volunteers that are literally just standing in the water, like they're in waders for hours at a time, every five feet or so across the rope. And you just walk the rope as they kind of hold it in position for you. Yep. It is an absolutely wild experience to be crossing the river as these individuals are just out there holding the rope for you so you can make your way across. It's so, so cool. Standing there for hours, our drone operator attempting to spot race leader Tom Evans. As he cruises along the banks of the river here on that dirt road, that section of the course, I always remember to be quite painful. You always think you're getting close to the river crossing, but it takes forever to get there. We do have an update from Shenji Shen back at mile 71 at Cal 2. Shenji Shen, 22 and a half minutes back of the lead. According to Iron Farr, he is asking for electrolytes whilst running into the aid station. Looks cool, calm, and collected and out like a flash. Wow. The race is on. Sixth. The race is on. It's, it's, I don't think there's anyone 
really cracking is the thing. Yeah. I think we're most worried about Dakota cracking right now in this group of six, just because all of a sudden Tom put in that huge move. But otherwise, I feel like this group is really solid right now. Yep. Super, super solid. That's one of the things that we've talked about a lot today and throughout the week, Corinne. Typically, when it's 15 to 20 degrees warmer on race day, when you hit those low points, they get a lot lower. So today, it maybe is a little bit easier for the athletes to navigate those low points, and therefore, it's keeping our lead packs sort of bunched up here in both the men's and the women's races, of course, with the exception of the Courtney DeWalter, Katie Scheid train at the front of the women's race, just behind them. We have pack running occurring right now. Speaking of which, we should have the cameras on those women as they come into Forest Hill fairly soon. Pretty remarkable just to observe the size of lead that Courtney DeWalter now has. Again, she's about, she was about 11 minutes ahead of Katie Scheid. But well more than an hour likely ahead of this chase pack. Yeah, it's the, the gap is the gap is growing. That's a redundant statement, right? It's yeah. like the depth is deep. Also fairly redundant. Um, but, you know, that's sometimes how it feels out here. So, yeah, the questions in the chat have to do a lot with, like, you know, did Tom put in a move or did Dakota slow down? And I think it's probably a combination of both. Again, we'll get a better picture as we get updates uh, from Cal 3 from that chase pack of men, including Dakota Jones. We're going to be looking for Tyler Green, Anthony Costales, Jeff Colt as well to be in that mix. And then, again, we're going to be keeping our eyes towards Forest Hill as we Watch to see that next chase pack of women come through. I do think they should be coming through very, very shortly. Um, Katie Scheid made her way through there about 47 minutes ago. That gap at the at Michigan Bluff was about 49 minutes, I believe, between Katie Scheid and the chase pack. So we should be seeing our chase pack of women that includes Eda Nilsson, Keely Henninger, Emily Hoggood, Katie Asmuth, Esther Chillog, and Taylor Nowlin. Six women. It's a six-woman chase pack, and they should be coming into Forest Hill in a matter of minutes. So don't go anywhere. We'll be making sure that we go to split screens Could here. Could this be a speak of the devil incident here? Oh my goodness. I try to will this into existence all the time. I think if I just push something hard enough, they're like, oh, Corinne, Corinne would really like to see this other location now, please. So it will be very interesting to see if there's been any shuffling within that chase pack. There has been some separation or if they still remain bunched up here at the 100K mark of the race. Meanwhile, ahead, we should probably start to see updates from Courtney DeWalter up at Cal 2, see if she's moved into the top 10 overall. We're going to cut to a quick commercial break. We'll be right back to catch that chase pack. Hey everyone, I'm Jared Smith, product line manager for Hoka Performance Footwear. And I'm here to talk to you about trail running shoes. So as we've expanded the Hoka trail lineup, we found a great opportunity and a need from our trail runners in the racing space and those looking for something that's highly responsive, lightweight, and incredibly propulsive. And that's where the Tectonics came from. Let's break down what's going on in the shoe from the ground up. So from the outsole or the rubber aspect of the shoe, we've used Vibram Mega Grip, which is the best compound we found for our trail shoes. We used a four millimeter lug to ensure that you're getting the right amount of grip, but nothing that's too overly technical, providing good traction on both wet and dry terrain. Moving on up, we have a dual density midsole. So there's two different foams, one that is close to the ground, that is highly responsive and very durable, that really is propulsive and adds to the overall performance of the shoe. And one that's directly under the foot, that's a little bit softer and more cushioned. So you have this great step-in feel, very comfortable for those long miles, 
In between that sandwich is two parallel carbon fiber plates, which really add that propulsive element to the shoe. So moving into the upper, we really wanted to focus on several things to make sure that this was exactly what you need and nothing more out on the trail. So we looked for something that was lightweight, durable, breathable, and hydrophobic, which essentially means it doesn't take on water, isn't gonna add weight or add any extra bulk. When we're talking about the toe box or the front part of the shoe here, we've added a small cutout of where the laces end to provide a little bit more accommodation so that your toes can splay or spread out. I mean, we want happy toes and happy feet. And then the eye row here is really where the laces go through and help lock the foot into the upper. I run and race in this a lot. Uh, I think the overall experience in this shoe is fun, lively, and propulsive. You definitely feel race ready as soon as you toss this on. So this entire package, in my opinion, is the best that you could have for a high performance trail racing shoe. Okay, we are back here in studio, looking at the Rocky Chucky River crossing and then cutting back to Forest Hill to catch the chase group of women who we expect to arrive imminently. Corinne and I just received an amazing update from our friend Kim Gaylord, who is again the crew chief of Katie Shide out on the course. What Kim said is, I just want you to know that when Katie was ready to leave Forest Hill, she just said to Topher, I hope you are ready. Topher, of course, being her pacer. So looking here at Emily Hoggood arriving at Forest Hill in third place. This chase pack is about to get absolutely wild, you guys. There sh we expect six women to come in in short order. We think led by Emily Hoggood, who appears to be all smiles as she makes her way into the aid station right now. But I just need to reflect on how, what a baller statement that is from Katie Shy to turn to Topher and say, hey, I hope you're ready hope for this. Hope you're ready, man. We're engaged in an epic historic battle with potentially the best ultra runner of all time, Courtney DeWalter. Buckle up. Let's get to work. Absolutely gangster proposition there from Katie Scheid. Should start to see more updates from Cal 2. We should start to see Dakota Jones through Cal 3, along with Tyler Green, Anthony Castales. But right now, we are looking at women's third place runner, Emily Hoggood, finishing fifth place last year here after running with race leader and eventual winner, Ruth Croft for much of the day. Is this? Is that Esther? Is this Esther? That must be Esther. Esther Chillog has it. made a move. I think that's what we're looking at right now. If this is the case, yep. the top two women coming out of that chase pack are Emily Hoggood and Esther Chillog. Again, Esther Chillog got that roll down spot for UTMB to be here in Western States. Unbelievable. So top, Esther Chillock. mom in the field too. Crushing in the mom division. Running in fourth place overall through Forest Hill. Currently 10.52 a lap on the clock here. Super fast split. In quickly to her aid. Nice shady seat here. Esther, our first Masters athlete. Esther and Courtney are the same age. They're both 38. Oh, excuse me. I thought she was in the Masters division. Eden Nilsson. High fives all around for Emily. Look at this multitasking. She's got someone, f like, shuffling food in from one side. She's got Jeshur in there doing one shoe. Another teammate doing the other shoe. This is a pit stop. Look at the layout at these aid stations. We've got shoes coming in on and off. We've got ice band bandanas being tied on and off. This is teamwork. This is awesome. Yeah, new shoes going on. I don't know if Esther's picking up a pacer here or not. I do believe that Emily will be leaving with teammate Jeshrin Small, who we saw play second behind Hayden Hawks at the 50K at Canyons at the end of, the, at the end of April. I do believe he is pacing her for a portion of this. I don't know if he's leaving with her now or if he's leaving with her later. And Ida Nilsson also rolling through. And Keely Henninger rolling through. Okay, people, we have a race. So that is third, fourth, fifth, and sixth 
Yeah, the people we are missing now from this group is we are looking for Katie Asmith and Taylor Nowlin. They are likely right within this group as well. Again, it looks like so Ida's aid, aid, crew aid is after the aid station. Keeley's crew aid, I believe, is after the aid station as well. I saw it looked like JT maybe running through with her. They were putting ice in the ice sleeves. Oh, I just saw Katie Asmus' green pack run by as well. Holy smokes. This is getting messy. So I don't know if Katie's seen her crew yet or if she's running to her crew right now. So basically third through seventh women now in four still together. This has definitely never happened in the history of Western States. Yeah, and we anticipate. So Ida's out. Ida has seen her crew, and Ida has, is leaving the aid station. So at least I don't know if she's first out or not. We didn't see Emily Hoggood leave. We didn't see Esther Chillog leave. There's Katie Asmus. She's currently being escorted by her coach, David Roach, on the right-hand side. And a pacer, and I'm not sure who's pacing her, on the left-hand side. It looks like they are leaving the aid station. So right now it's possible that Katie just made a big move from like 7th or 8th up until 3rd position, potentially leaving the aid station. Potentially taking the lead in the in the uh, moms division. In the, in the moms division, yeah. it's going to be a tight race between Esther Chillog and Katie Asmith. I think right now in that category, there is Ida Nilsson. Ida is the first Masters, 42 years old. I was wondering if she was going to break Ragna Debat's Masters course record and the 40 to 49 year old course record, which again is 17. And a half hours, 1720 something, 1740 something. I'll look it up. I just had it up. So we're keeping our eye on that as well. Eden Nilsson looking to throw down in this race, but she there is another record on the line for her right. here today. So we were talking about this earlier. Ragna DeBots holds the 40 to 49 women's age group record at 17 hours, 41 minutes. That was two years ago in 2021. Eden Nilsson certainly has a shot of bettering that here today. Amazing racing here as we see Eden Nilsson exiting Forest Hill on her right. That's MK Sullivan, ninth place at the World Championship a couple of weeks ago. Also, Tim Tollefson on her left. So she's got a great crew. Cutting back to Emily Hoggood here. Yeah, with Jeshrin Small on her left hand side running her out of the aid station. He jumped in to pace her last year, has been pacing her ever since. I think that, Matt, that, that Ragna's record is. Very potential, I would say, is very much under threat right now. It's going to be, I think it's going to be very, very close. If yeah. we expect Ida to be about an hour behind Courtney, we expect Courtney to be running something like 16, 15, 16, yeah. 20. Um, God. We could see both the course record go down and the Masters course record go down today. Unbelievable. I continue to smash refresh to see if we get more updates from the likes of Dakota Jones, Tyler Green, Anthony Costales from Cal 3. No updates on that yet, nor do we have anyone further back from Shen Ji Shen at Cal 2, though Iron Farr did update us that Danny Jones came through Cal 2 in seventh place, 36 minutes back the lead, said he is asking for lots of ice, seems in a hurry and looking relatively strong. So Daniel Jones representing New Zealand proudly here, running in seventh place in his first 100 mile race. Tim Tollefson peels off of the crew here, sending Ida and MK to take on Cal Street on their own before I think he tags in at Greengate to take the last 20 mile shift as a pacer here today. Here we have Keeley exiting. Who's that pacing Keeley there, Corinne? I don't know. I met so many crew people this week. I don't actually know who is going to pace her. I know Leah's here. I know, oh, it starts with an S. Susie, that's not her name. Susie's Leah Ling. Ling, Ling. No, there's a Susie too. And Keely's crew, it, it could be Susie. Th actually, this might be Susie with her now. Yeah, yeah. no, no, because Jeff Jeff Stern's pacing Keely to the finish. Awesome. So I think this this must be Susie, and then Jeff Stern's going to pick her up. And Jeff actually came out and stayed with her um, in Tahoe for like five of the six weeks she's been out here. Amazing. So they've gotten a lot of training in together. So Keely Henninger. Her one finish here at Western States came two years ago where she finished ninth place. 
She certainly has all the tools and talents to win here someday. Currently sitting somewhere between third and seventh. It's difficult to know exactly, just given the bunching that's occurring here. So we turn back to ID. Who's that? Is that Katie Asmith? Yeah, okay, so Katie must have stopped for the crew. Oh, she did, because she switched packs. Yeah, She's now in a dark pack. pack. Yeah, so her crew must have been way far down on the end. So we've got a long line of women making their way down Cal Street right now. This is absolutely bonkers. Katie's got to be super happy with how her day is unfolding here. At this year's race, two years ago, she finished fifth. She was in podium contention most of the, most of the day. So we see Taylor Nowlin exiting now. Goodness gracious, this is absolutely insane. Yeah. How close third Three through seventh through, through eighth eight. are. Yeah, and again, so the, the timing map for Forest Hills, right when you exit the main aid, but then people stop to see their crew. So the order of operations in which they leave the aid station gets a little bit screwy. But technically the splits are Emily Hoggood came in first. About a minute later, Esther Chillog came in. Oh, my thing just refreshed. A um, a minute behind Esther was Ida. Ten you know, ten seconds later was Keeley. Ten seconds later was Katie Asmith. Forty seconds later was Taylor Nowlin. So three minutes at most separated three through eight entering the aid station and they're leaving in about that same spread. Absolutely unbelievable. Truly anybody's race here for that final podium spot. Again, a comfortable gap ahead towards second place runner Katie Scheid. But of course, she has been engaged in a battle for the ages for, with Courtney DeWalter. There's a very good chance one or both of them could still falter here in the final third of the race. So any of these women still have a shot at that podium. Still no update from Cal 3 here. Obviously, those men have definitely come through. We should get an update from Tom Evans at the river pretty soon. Yeah, we should make. We do have a camera down there, and it should have pretty decent bandwidth. So hopefully, we'll get an image of of Tom making his way down to the boats. Yeah. So he went through Cal Three about 25 minutes ago. It is that kind section of, of the course should only take him between like 30 and 35 minutes. So probably five to 10 minutes till Tom gets to the river. So just kind of looking at the, the splits here, cause we, we had a 49 minute gap between Katie Scheid and the chase pack heading into, um, into what, into this aid station that held pretty much the same from Michigan Bluff to Forest Hill. So Katie didn't lose time. No one really gained time. That gap of about, you know, 49 minutes might have been extended a little bit to like 50 to 53 minutes or so. So once again, Katie is not faltering. She's not falling back off of Courtney. Courtney is accelerating, if anything, and Katie is holding a blistering pace that is still well under course record pace as well. Yep. Can you imagine running the course record at Western States and still not winning? <laughs> Unbelievable. That would be pretty brutal. Yeah, it would. We can ask Katie about it when we see her on the track. As everyone continues so it does to look push like forward. Jeff, it's suppo supposedly Jeff Colt has come through Cal 3 in second. What? Holy smokes. Hold on. Before we get to that, I just want to give a quick update. It does seem that both Hayden Hawks and Camille Heron are still out on the course. So good to see them continuing on even through tough conditions. Let's hope they can... Keep that fortitude and resolve. Where are you seeing that update? Is that on Ultra Live? Yeah, it is. Okay, mine's going slow. Uh, I don't know. So here's the thing. We don't know if for some reason we didn't get a split from the other men. And this sometimes happens at Cal 3. I feel like it happened intermittently at yeah. Cal 3. So right now Jeff Colt is showing up as the second person through Cal 3. 19 minutes behind Tom. I don't know if that's accurate or not, and we, weren't, we will not know until they get to the river. When we get to the river, we will 100% know for certain what the order of operations is for that top five men's group. M part of me really wants this to be right, and part of me knows that there's a good chance that it's not right, just because I know that Dakota Jones, Tyler Green, and Anthony Costales are all moving really well. So I imagine that we could be having a little bit of a tracker issue, and I'm curious to see what that actually looks like. I'm we've texting Ted Knudsen right now. We have Prider. eyes on uh, 
uh, Casey Licktag in that tent right there. We have eyes on Alex Nichols making his way through Forest Hill. Yeah, we are all losing our minds just a smidge right now as we try to figure out exactly what is happening out on the course. But the current splits that we do have available to us says Tom Evans in first, Jeff Colton second, 19 minutes back. We are going to wait to see if we get an update from Ford's Bar Cal 3 from the other men. If we do not, we will also see updates for, for them from them when we get to the river. We will have good official splits from there because we've got pretty decent service in that zone. Amazing to see Casey Lichtai exiting Michigan Bluff, going for her ninth finish in a row, the former champion, the three-time podium finisher here. Cruising, having a day at the race she loves most. Alex Nichols, one of the rare characters, not rocking a hat or sunglasses in the California sunshine here today. Bold move, as they say. I'm gonna check in on Camille Heron here. See what she's up to. Yeah, right now it looks like Courtney DeWalter's come through Cal 2 as well at 357 about eight minutes ago, running a ninth overall between Danny Jones and Ryan Montgomery. 1057 at Cal 2. Gosh. That is... Absolutely bonkers. I am losing my mind. Do we have Tom at the river? If anyone is listening to me. Oh, here's Hayden. Do we have Tom at the river? Here's Hayden sitting at Michigan Bluff, it looks like. He's got ice on his knee. Not looking good for last year's second place finisher. Hayden Hawks, he put everything into performing here today. Certainly feeling tremendous disappointment. That's the game, as they say. As we look on the left-hand side, that's got to be Tom Evans, our race leader, running without a pacer towards the river in the lead of the Western States 100. And just a painful juxtaposition here between Tom Evans, the race leader, and Hayden Hawks. Somebody who had winning ambitions here today who will no doubt pick himself up by his bootstraps. If that's Tom and he doesn't have a pacer, it's quite possible that he's dropped his pacer. I mean, that's got to be Tom. Because I'm pretty sure Josh Eberly was supposed to leave the aid station with Tom. And I'm not seeing anyone with him right now. I have so many questions. Okay, Ted Knutson just texted me that Cal 3 is now updated. So let's see. Mine, mine's going kind of slow. Let me see what I can do. Yep, so it looks like we shifted around a little bit. So we had an issue. We had a lag from Cal 3. So Jeff, Jeff Colt is still in fifth position, but it is really, really tight. Tyler Green is in second position. He has overtaken Dakota Jones. He came through at 10.51 elapsed. Dakota Jones, 10.52 elapsed. Anthony Costales, 10.53 elapsed. Jeff Colt, 10.55 elapsed. So we have four minutes between second and fifth in the men's race with Tom Evans having extended his lead over the chasing chasing men's field. He's got a 15 minute lead right now over second place Tyler Green, but the race is on. So Tom Evans clearly making his move here today. A race he certainly wants to win. I know this has been in his crosshairs for a year now. Since he earned his golden ticket at UTMB, it was actually passed down to him when Killian Journey elected not to accept his golden ticket. Tom Evans accepted it instantaneously, eager to come back to Western States. And he is now 15 minutes ahead of the Chase men's pack, clearly in control of today's race and on his way to potential victory at the Western States 100. He'll go around this gate and he's probably within, I don't know, 800 meters of the river crossing here, maybe less. 
Yeah, he's really, really close. This section is another one of the sections that feels longer than I always anticipated to. <laughs> totally. You're like, we're at the river because you've dropped so much elevation. And then you're like, we're not at the river yet. And you still, it still feels like you have a ways to go. Tom Evans, as tough as they come, like Zach mentioned earlier, he comes from a military background, the British Special Forces. This guy is an absolute tactician to match with his out-of-this-world talent. I mentioned earlier he's a 63-minute half marathoner. He runs a fast 5K. He competes at the national level in cross-country. He even has expressed interest in doing the Barkley. The guy can really do it all. We've got, and we have Esther Chillog on the small screen as well. I wonder if she was one of the first women to get out of that aid station. She came in right behind Emily Hoggood. It looked like she was maybe doing slightly fewer things in that transition. So I wonder if Esther Chillog is currently running in that third position, but would then be being chased by a large pack of women. Again, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight all within Forest Hill in a matter of, you know, two minutes of each other, leaving there within two minutes of each other. This is going to be the gnarliest top 10 race maybe of all time. We we're going to throw it to Zach Marion, who's got an update from the course. Basically, Zach Marion. What? We got to, yeah, we got to unplug this. We got to plug this back in. For that Zach Marion update. Almost, it seems. We've got an aerial footage, again, of Tom heading towards that Rocky Chucky River crossing. And then on the small screen, we've got Esther Chillog looking like she's maybe going to drop her pacers, moving really quick on this section. But there it seems like there's three. Is Who else is there? It's probably two women and two pacers here. What is going on? I think Esther's Ida. being. It's Ida and Esther. Yeah. It's Ida and Esther together. Because it's MK Sullivan is oh, the other pacer. Good eye. All right, so Tom Evans here approaching the Rocky Chucky River crossing on the left. Meanwhile, on the right, somewhere between the women's third and eighth position are Esther Chilog and Ida Nielsen. Running together, escorted each by a pacer. So we've got four women absolutely hauling butt down towards Cal 1. Yeah. So just to give a sort of mileage perspective here, this women's group is probably sitting at about 63, 63 and a half miles. Meanwhile, Tom Evans is making his way closer to that 78 mile river crossing. Once he gets across the American River there, Tom Evans will have about a 20 minute climb up to the Green Gate Aid Station where he will regain the Western States Trail single track and it is smooth, rolling, running, single track, basically all the way here to the track where we will welcome him with open arms in a few hours. Yeah, someone's reflecting on the fact that, you know, Tom is a great example of speed is speed. He really prides himself as an athlete, as a well-rounded athlete. Spends a lot part of, a good part of his season developing speed. Last year when he was prepping for UTMB, he utilized a treadmill, an inclined treadmill at home, plus basically a ski erg mounted to the wall so he could practice hiking at extreme elevation in his home gym because he, while well, he lives in a, a, a hilly area, he doesn't live in a mountainous area. And so that was one of his best ways to really get that. But here we go, Tom Evans at the river crossing. And what a scene it is down there. Everybody jockeying to get their camera position to take a shot of the great British champion, Tom Evans, before he jumps in a boat and makes his way across the river, currently with a 15-minute gap, remembering back to the Forest Hill aid station where he came in basically together with Dakota Jones. That means he has earned a 15-minute gap in only 17 miles. Tom Evans has made his move, and the race is fully under his control. Yeah, he is doing everything in his, in his ability to really put this thing away. Again, anything can happen. We've seen everything and anything actually happen. There's Josh Everly. Josh, catching back up. <laughs> Josh Everly is like, wait for me, dude. I got to catch a ride from Greengate. Don't leave me behind. <laughs> So Josh Eberle making quick work to get down to the river. Again, Josh Eberle will be peeling out at Greengate, I believe, and Tom will be running solo to the finish. 
didn't want the distraction of having a pacer. You know, you said Tom with Tom speed is speed, and it's making me think that he's kind of the perfect mix between strength and speed, like we've been talking about throughout race week and this day and this course, certainly rewarding people with Tom's skill set, that being with lots of ample leg speed, but also deep strength to navigate the snow sections. So good to know, Tom did not drop Josh because Dakota and Tom were rolling so well together. Tom told Josh to hold off and Josh has now met him at the river crossing. So he made a last minute decision to not pick up his pacer at Forest Hill. Josh went around to Rocky Chucky and met him here because Tom wanted to run with Dakota through this section. Unbelievable as Tom hammers a Red Bull on the boat. It's an efficient use of time for him, isn't it there, Corinne? Yeah, no, like you're you're sitting, you want to use this time as effectively as possible. I'll be curious to see, there we go. We've got a bucket with some water in the boat with him. Super, super smart. He wants to be out of sight, out of mind, yep. right? He wants to get over there, get up the hill, and not be within visual eye contact of Tyler Green, Anthony Costales. Yep. Jeff you know, Colt, et cetera. I think that's an important thing to mention here. When they get out of the boat, they sort of have this quick little single track section before pouring onto a dirt road that takes them up to Greengate. But for at least that first mile up to Greengate, you can hear and see down to the river crossing. Yep. So as you're climbing up, you can hear the cheers of the runners that are coming up behind you. And for somebody like Tom, he is going to be listening intently to see if he can hear any of those cheers creeping up behind him. And I think he will be happy happy to not hear them for at least 15 minutes. Yeah, he's going to he's going to be listening for it and not going to see it. But I also really respect that quick pivot he made to you know he was, was only going to have one pacer and to push it off a little bit later. I think was a really a really smart and interesting race. We're back up at Forest Hill. Far left is Megan Roach and then far right is Meg Morgan, she is paced by Amelia Boone. That is a dynamic trio. Duo. <laughs> Meg, Meg Morgan found someone tall enough to pace her in Amelia Boone. They're, they will be two very tall athletes heading their way down Cal Street. Again, Meg Morgan, the second youngest person in the field, 25 years old, the youngest female runner in the field, making her 100-mile debut here. Absolutely amazing. We're going to throw it to Zach Marion at Forest Hill with a quick update. What's going on guys you can see the chaos happening behind me on forest hill absolutely phenomenal as the women top 10 come crushing through so i'm not getting a whole lot of tea anymore i think everyone's figured me out and no one's juice and lemons i'm fresh out of the tart stuff but we do have some good information on the top 10 women so Obviously, we know what's going on up front. The battle between Courtney and Katie is raging on. But there is another race. The Asmuth and Taylor Nolan, all of them are right there within three or two minutes of each other as they came through this aid station. So not all of them looking great. I will say Emily Hoggood had the biggest smile. She's happy. She's excited to be here. She's ready to throw down. Esther looked like she was doing a lot of work to make herself uh, a part of this pack. She had caught in them, uh, had caught up to them, and she had to sit down for a hot second. Ida, we all know Ida, she is going to have that game face on from step one to the finish. Keely, all smiles, looking great. Katie Asmith with her coach, David Roche, just looking fantastic coming through here. I think she is going to make a move for that third place. Taylor Nolan had a little hitch in the giddy up. And as we've said earlier, the gate don't lie. And it looked like she was not as smiley and as happy as she used to be. So, or she was earlier in the course. So we've got those six ladies all within two minutes behind them about 15 minutes. We have Priscilla and Jen Quilty are fairly close to each other. We got the two Canadian contingency right there battling for those last two spots of the top 10. And right behind them, we had a Salt Lake favorite, Leah Yingling, coming in just a, well, about a minute behind them with Meg Morgan fresh on her heels. I did talk to Meg Morgan's crew earlier, and they were just saying that her whole goal is to really learn the course this first year and then come back and crush it the next year. So she's in a great place to put herself in that top 10, earn that spot for us for another entry next year and come and dominate a young force 
in this sport that is just proving that she belongs. A big thank you to Zach for that great update from Forest Hill as we look down on who we expect to be our second place runner in the men's field, Tyler Green alongside his pacer, who I can't identify. But it looks to be that Tyler Green is on his way towards the river. Tom's split was about seven minutes ago. We'll remember that Tyler Green was about 15 minutes back of Tom at Cal 3. So again, a good opportunity for us to get a split as they approach the river here. I actually think that might be Tom running up towards Green Gate. Oh, you're right. Yeah. On this drone. So that's Tom and Josh yeah. Everly making their way up towards Green Gate. Yeah. A Thank great you. drone shot of them running away from the river, trying to get out of earshot, eye shot, et cetera. Thanks for that correction, Corinne. Yep, that does look like Tom Evans moving really uh, well i mean this is an uphill trajectory it's hard to get an appreciation of it from this vertical angle with tom evans on his way up towards the green gate aid station mile 80 and once he gets there the lion's share of the climbing is done for the day the one final climb of any significance is the climb up to roby point roughly mile 99 of the race here today so good to note new updates from Aid Station Fireball. I had an over under on how many times I would say his name on the live broadcast, and I feel like this is really where it's going to pick up. Yep. Tom just ran the fifth fastest split of all time from Cal Street to the river. So again, mile 62, Forest Hill, to the river at mile 78 in 207. The four fast faster times are Jim Walmsley in 2018 in 206, Jared Hazen in 2019 in 205, Jim Walmsley in 2018, in two in 2019 and 205 and rob Carr in 203 and 2014 absolutely phenomenal so tom evans 207 on that split from forest hill to the river unbelievable a big thank you to liam tryon for that great perspective so we look at emily hoggood she's got to be following on the heels of ida and Esther. I believe Esther and Ida looked like they got out ahead. Yeah. And then now Emily Hoggett is chasing. So three, four, and five is who we've seen descending this section down towards the river. Is she she must be running with Jeshrin, is that yep, right? Yep, that's Jeshrin Small right there, her teammate. Again, we saw him race to a phenomenal second place finish behind Hayden Hawks at the um the Canyons Endurance Run fifty K back in April, not that far from where we sit right now. Unbelievable sc split screen here. Tom Evans, our race leader on the right-hand side, making quick work of the climb up towards Green Gate. He's probably more than halfway up that dirt road. Yeah, he crossed the river about 10 minutes ago. I believe that is about a 20-minute climb for the fastest men in the race. Meanwhile, on the left-hand side, Emily Hawgood from Zimbabwe, but living in Roseville, California. Cruising down towards Cal 1 on this dirt road that is steeper than it looks, sort of painfully rutted in places. Again, this is part of this burn scar that really burned quite hot last fall. I'm, d I'm just like, I'm still just blown away. I'm like reflecting on more stats from Liam here. Katie Shad and Courtney ran the two fastest ever splits from last chance at mile 43 to Forest Hill in 303 and 313 respectively. To be to, for comparison, that's a, 319 is the same time, or 313 is the same time that Courtney DeWalter ran in 2019. Elliot's course record pace was 317, and Ruth Croft last year ran 327. Wow. So Courtney just ran that section 24 minutes faster than Ruth. Gosh, that's insane. And Katie Shine, Shide ran it 14 minutes faster than Ruth last year, and we thought Ruth was absolutely flying. Unbelievable. Once in a generation athlete, Courtney DeWalter. Being chased by another absolutely incredible future goat, I think, oh. in Katie Scheid. We should see Courtney through Cal 3 here pretty soon. She went through Cal 2 about 27 minutes ago. Yeah, we'll see if we get a delayed, a delayed split out of that Cal 3 aid station again. And let's see if we get an update of, you know, we Katie Asmith on the left. A very happy Katie Asmith on the left. 
So I guess the thing is, is that, so Tom went through, you know, about 12 minutes ago. Right? Yep. Doing public math on the fly. And so we should expect Tyler Green to be at Rucky Chucky at the river crossing in the next two, three minutes or so. And he should be followed very closely by Dakota Jones, Anthony Costales, and Jeff Colt. Man. Tom is well in control here today. It's astonishing the gap that he has earned here on the Cal Street aid station. He's nearly all the way up to Green Gate. We haven't even seen the second runner cross the river here today. Yeah, just absolutely blown away by these athletes once again. Yeah, so again, just looking over that Cal 2 split. We don't always get a Cal 3 split, and so I don't necessarily count on it, I would say. But that Cal 2 peach stone split from Col Courtney DeWalter, she came through there at 10.57 elapsed. Oh, my goodness. Do you want to know how far ahead that is of Ellie's course record pace? Yes, I do. 38 minutes. <laughs> I mean, is she going to run under 16 hours? It's distinctly possible. Oh, my God. And here's the thing. Chris Brown told me that she was well on sub-16-hour pace in 2019 when she dropped out. Like, this is the race she's capable of. <sighs> oh, my gosh. Courtney DeWalter, just a scary, gifted person, the all-time GOAT in a league of her own, proving it again here today. But meanwhile, Katie Scheid nipping at her heels, giving her a fight. Actually, we should get an update from Katie Scheid through Cal 2, I would think, pretty soon. Yeah, I imagine we should have an update from Katie Scheid at Cal 2 pretty soon and Courtney at Cal 3 here. We're doing math. We're doing lots and lots of math. And I do think that we think that a sub-16 is possible. I do think that we think is probably not a very confident-sounding statement. <laughs> I mean, that's insane. Here we are at Cal 1. Keely Henninger at the Cal 1 aid station. Difficult to know exactly what place she's in, just given how closely the women's field is bunched up. She's there with Taylor Nowlin. This looks like Ryan Kaiser coming into Forest Hill here. Wait, did you say you have a Cal 1 split? No, okay. that, was the, that was a camera at Cal 1. It looks like we probably have another runner coming into the shot, coming into that drone shot again, coming down from the river. So on the big, on the big screen, that's Ryan Kaiser making his way through Forest Hill. But here we go on our drone shot. We do have another runner coming into view here, making their way down to the river. And the question is, is it Tyler Green? Must is be. he alone? And who's near him? So we are, we think, looking down at our second place men's runner who we expect to be Tyler Green. It's difficult to know 100% with 100% accuracy from this perspective here. But that's got to be the case. Going back to Tom Evans' split, he crossed the river 15 minutes ago. So that means that if... If this is, in fact, M2 making their way down towards the river, Tom has extended his lead again. Yeah. You know, probably by another three or four minutes is my guess. Really, really impressive. So we're back at Forest Hill. Ryan Gosh. Kaiser getting the family treatment here. There's signs made. There's dogs around. Kids on hand. Ryan yeah. Kaiser, great guy from Bend, Oregon. Shared some good miles with him in my day. Dad, a master's athlete, a lawyer. Out here rocking it. And I think his third Western States, I want to say. 
So again, we should see on the right hand side of our screen. Oh, there, Tyler there we Green. go. Tyler yep. Green. There we go. Tyler Green and Justin Grunewald entering the Rucky Chucky near side aid station here. So Tyler Green looks like maintaining about a 16, 17 minute gap behind race leader Tom Evans. Tyler Green, fourth time in a row, fourth year in a row here at Western States. Back-to-back -to -back top five finisher here at the race, sitting in second position and executing another fantastic day here on the course. Yeah, he's uh, he's only had one finish outside the top 10. He was in that tight bunched year where I believe he finished 14th. Um, but otherwise, yeah, a, a second and a fifth, right? Am I correct in that? Second and fourth. Second and fourth. So two very solid finishes. He ran a brilliant race in 2021 when everyone was really feeling very all over the place. Ran, ran his way well up through the field. Absolutely incredible performance. And then last year, finishing fourth, closing really hard, almost catching Arlen Glick as they made their way from Roby Point to the track here. That three, four, five men's finish was super tight. So we'll recall what Zach said about Dakota back at Forest Hill, that he was not using any ice. Meanwhile, Tyler Green is meticulous with his ice usage, and he's got this great strategy where he puts that ice bandana underneath his T-shirt so it doesn't bounce. Tyler Green, again, always the tactician, always doing those little things, taking the extra couple of seconds. Yeah, so the split is 16 and a half minutes between Tom Evans and Tyler Green at Rocky Chucky. So... Tom gained a little bit of time, about 90 seconds, um, from Cal 3 to the river. So obviously anything can happen at this point, but it is officially Tom Evans' race to lose now, yes. crossing the river with a 16 and a half minute lead. Yep, I would agree with that. He's definitely setting himself up to try to take this win. It would be absolutely incredible if that is what happens today, but there are a, there is a group of men behind him who are going to be working hard to try to make sure that doesn't happen. We will see how it pans out. We should have an update here Ooh. in the next minute or so. Katie Scheid through Cal 2, mile 71, 20, 21 minutes back of race leader Courtney DeWalter. So a gap has opened up there. So that's 10 minute gap in those eight miles between Forest Hill and Cal 2. So both Tom and Courtney, Courtney just absolutely threw down in that section. Yep. Bonkers, and we did see we had that brief aerial shot of another runner making their way down towards the river. So, so far, so good on guys getting in this boat and getting out of there. Life jackets on in the boat, making their way across. But there's another, there's another runner making their way towards the river crossing right now. Coming into Rucky Chucky right now. Actually, we have our third, our third male. Do we call it Dakota Jones or Anthony Casales? I can't uh, tell. That's Anthony. Taking a quick seat, it looks like. Anthony Costales meeting up with his crew. Some crews, I, I wonder, you know, some crews go to Green Gate. Some crews go to Rucky Chucky. It does look like Anthony yeah. Costales' crew is at Rucky Chucky. It does look like Tyler Green had a person there, but I wonder if he's got crew at Green Gate. Probably. Unless Justin Grunewald's plan. Is Justin running all the way to Pointed Rocks? Maybe. Distinctly possible. Yeah, likely if Rachel's going to take him the the final seven or so home stretch. I like the the shade on this shade chair. chair. So Anthony Costales currently in third place. Salt Lake City's unsponsored hero, the 2023 Black Canyon 100K champion, where he actually beat men's leader Tom Evans in a head-to-head -head battle. There, an incredible race between these two. Phenomenal athletes and Anthony, a quick transition there with his crew as he makes his way down to the river. Yeah, so there goes Anthony So Costales. the question is now, where's Dakota? Where's Dakota and where's Jeff Colt? Yep. And what's the situation there? What's the sitch? What's the sitch? We need to know what the sitch is. Working on getting an update from... Cal three, it is very likely that like Matthew and Ryan and Cole have made their way to Cal three. Cal these the updates from Cal three and Cal two are n are not notoriously good. I would say as far as like 
picking up every single runner coming through there. And so I wouldn't panic if you're sitting here wondering where Matthew or Ryan or Cole is. I would not panic. I think that that is likely that they are well on their way. They are probably through Cal 3, and we won't actually know that they're on their way until they get to Rucky Chucky. So don't panic. Here's Anthony jumping in the boat. Looking fairly coordinated. There's a he's, go. There's a GoPro in hand with the with the pacer. He's hanging with Jimmy Elam there. I think that's Jimmy Elam, his pacer. Another great runner from Salt Lake City. Okay, so right now we've got Anthony Costales making his way across. We've got boats going back over because you know what? We've got to pick up M3 or M4 and M5. Anthony Costales getting out of the boat with his pacer, we believe is Jimmy Elam. That boat's going to hightail it back over to the other side because they are going to have more athletes to pick up here. They can, I believe, drop a drop bag off at this side of the river. I believe that's what is in his hand and then he'll be making his way up to green gate it's about a two mile climb that's it rolls it's got a little bit of a steep pitch there kind of in the middle but otherwise it's a pretty rolling climb all the way across to green gate before they turn to do the final 20 miles of the race where they will finish here behind us on the track in auburn the stoke is high People are gathering. We've got 11.35, 45 on the clock. Our drone is looking for our next athlete, and I can see them, and I'm kind of thinking that this is probably Jeff Colt. It's a duo. I don't think Dakota has a pacer on this section, so I believe that the aerial footage we're seeing right now is likely Jeff Colt. Yep, that is, that is the double team. The, it's Jeff and other Jeff is what I've been told. Jeff um, Mugavaro and Jeff Colt side by side on teammates making their way. Jeff Mugavaro has met much experience pacing here. He got to pace men's champion Adam Peterman in the 2022 edition of this race. Right now, new ice bandana going on Jeff Colt, and they're going to make their way down to the river. He has officially moved himself up into fourth position. The podium hunt is on. No pun intended. We do expect Dakota Jones to be the next athlete to come in here. And then Shen Jingsheng should be shortly thereafter. They will be our fifth and sixth guys. Danny Jones should follow that. Matthew Blanchard, Ryan Montgomery, and Cole Watson have all come through the Cal 3 aid station as well. So that has finally updated. Again, Matthew Blanchard sitting in eighth position back at Cal 3. That's the 73 mile mark. He's got about a three minute lead over Ryan Montgomery in ninth and about a seven minute lead over Cole Watson in 10th. So packing it up at the back of the men's top 10, but our top 10 men are all through Ford's Bar or Cal 3 and our top four men are all through Rocky Chucky. We just saw Jeff Colt sprint onto the boat, followed by other Jeff, his pacer. Let's see if we've got an update in the women's field. We do. Courtney DeWalter is through Cal 3. 4.22 on the clock. 11.22 elapsed. Came through there about 16 minutes ago. So she is moving well. She should be down at the river pretty quickly. The Jeffs are in the boat. What did I miss, Corinne? Jeff Colt has come flying in with other Jeff to the boat. Sitting in fourth place, huh? Sitting in fourth position. No sign of Dakota Jones right now. No sign of Shen Zhisheng right now either. Jeff Colt having the race of his life here, sitting in fourth Blowing place. Blowing kisses to his crew. Nice work, Team Colt. This is the race that Jeff has always dreamed of here. This buddy, Jeff McGavro here. 
in the boat with him. Jeff, actually, fun fact, paced Adam Peterman last year, the men's champion of the you 2022 race. I oh, you already said it. it. Excuse me. Sorry. Dylan should have known. To go to the bathroom. I should have known. I'll I take was a bathroom all... break, and Corinne bestows the knowledge upon the people. I try. I try. But, yep, Jeff and Jeff, I was at their crew meeting yesterday, and he's like, I'm Jeff, and this is other Jeff. And I was like, good to know that we've got crew names dialed from the pacing team. He'll be handing off to another pacer. Um, There's Shen. Oh, no. Where's Dakota, man? <sighs> so Shen now arriving at the river in fifth position. Yes, we are now so. 27 minutes back of the men's leader, Tom Evans, who crossed the river at, is it 10, 12 elapsed? 11, 12 elapsed. Yep. Yeah, there is. So there's about a about a four, four and a half minute gap between Jeff and Anthony. Tyler Green is about, you know, another seven minutes or so clear of Jeff Colt. Tyler's got about a, you know, it's almost three minutes on Anthony Costala. So that group is still very, very tight with Tom Evans about 16 and a half minutes off the front being pursued by Tyler Green. Interestingly, there is only one M bib in the top 10 right now. Wow. That is M4. Super fun fact. No M2, no M3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, or 10. Tyler Green. Of course, you can always count on Tyler Green to keep the consistency with the M bib, huh? That, I believe, is Dakota Jones, and unfortunately, he is walking. Oh, no, he's running. We got some running. But I running cadence there. But I think that's Dakota. Must be Dakota again. Rode 650 miles on his bicycle to get here to the Western States 100. Because it's not Danny Jones, so I believe that that is Dakota in our aerial shot, making yeah. his way solo down to the river. He's had a Cal a Cal Street implosion. Which we've seen. We've seen Cal Street implosions from a number of athletes over the years. I've experienced them. You've you've vividly experienced them. I've lived I've lived them. When you, when Dakota gets here, you can look deep into his soul and say, say I understand you. I know what you've just been <laughs> I through. I see you. I have experienced the Cal two devastation. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess it's important to remind the audience that Dakota did win the Transvolcania Ultra Marathon over on the Canary Islands probably only six weeks ago or so. So yeah. he could be experiencing some lingering fatigue from that and his bike ride, but maybe more so the absolute abuse of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Tom Evans for like 100K plus of today's race. Yeah, those. I mean, that is a that is a task for anyone. In a big, big way, yeah. So we, we do know that Katie Scheid is through Cal 2. Do we have any Iron Far updates from Cal 2? I'm sure I do. Let me just do a quick refresh. We're just not we're not getting great Cal 2, Cal 3 updates, so it just it might take a second. Um, but we do know that Katie Scheid had lost time to Courtney DeWalter. That's still the most recent update. Between Cal 1 and Cal 2. Well, I guess that's to be expected. We're not going to see any more of the women for probably another 30, 40 minutes at Cal 2. This is so, very true. Yeah. But Katie Scheid, yeah, now 21 minutes back of race leader Courtney DeWalter through Cal 2. And Courtney will likely be one of the next couple runners we see arriving at the river. Yeah, she's currently running in eighth overall. She passed Matthew Blanchard on the – or she came in to – um, Cal 3 with Matthew. So she is currently moved up into 8th overall. Um, she's about 9 minutes off of Danny Jones um, and should be a, a, a ways off of Dakota Jones, but we're still waiting for Dakota to get into that Rocky Chucky aid station and then get into the boat. I do not know if he's got crew. So here's Shen Ju Shen. Accompanied by Patty O'Leary, the great Irish mountain runner, the recent Dipsy champion. Patty O'Leary, it looks like going to shepherd Shen, potentially these final 20, 22 miles from the river crossing to the finish line here. Patty does have experience crewing at a, and pacing at a high level here at Western States. 
I know he helped Drew Holman at least once, if not twice I think here. he's been dropped by Drew Holman twice at <laughs> Western true. States. To be fair, that is a tall order. Yep. Many good men have been dropped by Drew Holman. That's True, for sure. Truer words have never yes. been spoken. But yeah, we do think that it's very likely that Kate Here's Shot Dakota. Check out our guy here. Having a little walk. Looks like we're giving some high fives. Yeah, the smaller image is Meg Morgan being followed by Amelia Boone. I know that on the right-hand side. Yeah. Dakota's going to take a moment, get some cold water, discuss discuss the situation in which he's experiencing. But I do think, you know, Courtney's moved into what I think is eighth overall, and Katie Scheid, I believe, is sitting in something like 15th or 16th overall. We have men's splits updating through Cal 2, but for some reason, Katie Scheid's split's not updating through Cal 2. The Giannis Kowalczyk, Ludo, Arlen, Cody Lynn, all through Cal 2. We know that Katie Scheid has come through Cal 2, but it's just not updating on ultralive.net right now. Dakota still appears to be in decent spirits. Again, the ice bandana ready to cross the river here. So he's still, is he sitting? Yeah, he's sitting in sixth overall now as he prepares to cross the river. But certainly he's been losing dozens of minutes on the competitors around him. Yeah, no, I mean, he's he's lost a lot of time on this Cal Street section. He's We went from being mo moving quite well, leaving Forest Hill, wanting to really, you know, take Tom Evans out to lunch, as some might say. Yeah. And just not have it quite work out. We do. The aerial shot is now Danny Jones coming in to Rocky Chucky. So we do have Dakota Jones here in the aid station with Danny Jones. So that would be number seven, way. meaning that likely Courtney DeWalter will be the next runner into the river crossing. Yep, yep. L likely with and or around Matthew Blanchard. I'm not sure which one of those two athletes will come in there first, but Courtney should be one of the next people we see coming into Rocky Chucky. Dakota is going to make his way down to the river, get on the boat, and get out of here. Yeah, so his official split back is... He's got about a five, six minute gap back to Shen Zhisheng. And, you know, more like, you know, seven or so minutes to Jeff Colt and et cetera. So, so on and so forth. So he's moving, but he's definitely lost a lot of time on that last section. Got to give it to Dakota. He always takes his swing, you know. He's always here trying to win. When it goes great for Dakota, he really is one of the best in the sport over the last 15 years. But certainly you can miscalculate. Looks like he has appeared to do so here today, but great to see him jump in the boat and continue on across the river and along the course, even if his legs seem to be failing a bit. We look down at Daniel Jones, the great Kiwi athlete, sitting in seventh place overall here. A Jones brother reunion about to yeah. happen. Jones, Jones in sixth and seventh. Dakota having a watermelon picnic there in the boat. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Wish we could get the audio from Dakota. I mean, he seems to be in a good mood, you know. He's not like, he's not wearing the suffering on his face, is he, you know? No, def definitely not. I think that he's just, it looks like he's just kind of dealing with it, you know. Yeah. Like, just having a day. What, what a stud. I was going to say, what ultra running giveth, ultra running taketh away. Very true. We've all been there before. That is for sure. Dakota Jones. Jumping out of the boat to prepare for this climb up to Green Gates. So Tom Evans officially went through Green Gates about 16 minutes ago. So the next update we'll get from him is from the ALT. 
Aid Station, which is roughly mile 85. My guess is Tan will continue to extend his lead over the chase pack, including Tyler Green, Anthony Costales, Jeffrey Colt, and Shen Ji Shen. Super impressive. Mega, mega impressive. Yeah, so Green Gate, 11.32 elapsed, 4.32 p.m. local time through Green Gate, essentially mile 80 of the race. That individual is moving quite well. I think that's Danny. Daniel Jones getting a bit of a second wind here as he approaches the river. Yeah, looks like he's moving at a very respectable clip in here. In comparison to what we just saw from Dakota coming in there, Danny looks like he's looks like he's moving. Yep. First hundred mile race here for Daniel Jones. Running with a pacer there. Dan Jones, super interesting guy. I had him on my podcast several months ago after he won. Tarawera. Grew up in the bush, as he said. He's an outdoorsman. His family is filled with outdoors oriented people. He's obviously a great runner. He's done some training over in Kenya. So I just want to mention that uh, Tom is currently running 27 minutes faster than his 2019 time at Green Gate. Sick, sick, sick. Very, very fast. He came through Green Gate in 11.59 elapsed. You know what would be hilarious? If he finished in 14.28. As he predicted. That would be kind of wild. That would be amazing. And that would be so Tom Evans if it was like to the minute <laughs> accuracy. Yeah. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be really close, to be completely honest. Yeah, Chris Warden here pointing out in the chat how few elite drops there have been here today. I mean, have there been any? I mean, it looked like Hayden Hawks was likely not going to get out of that chair at Michigan Bluff. I mean, I think, I think Camille Heron is moving up through the women's field right now. I mean, yeah, she's she's moving, but she's currently back in 18th. She came through El Dorado Creek about 30 minutes ago. So making her way towards Michigan Bluff. Um, yeah, so, so sitting in 18th right now. Lee Yingling's back there in 16th as well through El Dorado Creek. Not 100% not sure what's going on there. I feel like that's probably behind where she would like to be at this point. Definitely. Um, yeah, Christine Mosley is up in that, is just ahead of her. Casey Licktag we saw come through Michigan Bluff. Stephanie Austin, who had a golden ticket back in 2020 and had to defer to last year, um, is through Michigan Bluff. Riley Brady. We've seen Meg Morgan come through Forest Hill, but there seems to be a bit of a gap now between that 11th position and then this kind of chase pack that goes through you know, the, the rest of the top 20 in the women's race. But I think Chris's point is very well made that we really haven't seen any of the elite athletes drop out of the race so far today. Can we confirm, is, is Hayden Hawks still on the course here? Um, no, look. Hayden Hawks is a DNF and Nicole Bitter is a DNF. So okay. I would say that we have had two. Oh, it looks like Leah's tracker might not be working, which would be ironic and Honestly, not all that impractical. Here's Riley Brady coming into Fort. Is that? Yeah, that's Riley. Yeah, Riley Brady coming into Forest Hill here. Riley came up to Oregon in the spring to run my race, Scourge Waterfalls. Absolutely crushed it after punching their golden ticket here at the Havilene 100 last fall. Danny Jones, look at the agility hopping into the no, boat like there. He, looks, he looked good running that last section he's of the probably, course. He's probably getting a report, hey, Dakota's slowing down. And there's Myel Backhausen in the boat with him, a great Australian friend of mine. Just represented his home country at the World Championships over in Innsbruck. Myel Backhausen, actually fun fact, he's crewed for me four times in my career, Myel has, and I've won every single one of those races. Okay, so we, I can confirm that Leah Yingling's tracker is not working. 
Um, she has come through Forest Hill, even though her bib on ultralive.net I don't think says that she's come through um, come through like Michigan Bluff yet. So there's a there's a major issue with Leah Yingling's tracker. She is in tenth at Forest Hill, which will put Jenny Quilty into eleventh, Meg Morgan into 12th, Riley Brady into 13th. And look out below if you are in front of Leah Yingling. She is known for being a closer. I wouldn't be surprised to see Leah Yingling move up through that middle part of the top 10, potentially into the top five by the time the day is through. And we are getting at least some reports in the chat here that Heather Jackson is a DNF, which if true is a Big bummer for a lot of trail fans out there after she had a disappointing mechanical at the unbound gravel race a few weeks ago. Heather Jackson, one of the stories of the year in trail and ultra running, unfortunately succumbing, it looks like, to a DNF here at Western States. Yeah, we'll get try to get confirmation on that from Heather Jackson's crew out there on the course. But, yeah, things are going to get interesting out there, particularly if Leah's tracker's not working because no one's going to know where she's coming from. <laughs> yeah. You can't know you're being chased yeah. if you don't know you're being chased. It's just a, a ghost creeping up from behind. The grim sweeper, as they say. Yeah, so not a bad place, place then for her to be. I was a little bit worried. I was like, how is she still back at El Dorado Creek? Like, that makes no sense to me. Zhao Zhaiju also drops, and now everybody in the chat is saying that I jumped the gun, saying that there's been very few elite drops. And here we see Courtney DeWalter in the bottom right approaching the river crossing, sitting in eighth position overall. Continuing a historic, astounding, ridiculous performance here and moving at a pace that seems unrealistic. Like, look at her, Corinne, holy smokes. Yeah, moving so, so fast. Gosh. Yeah, no. the, the drone operator texted me and said, Courtney is flying. I think that's Matthew Blanchard. No. Stopping to cool off? No, but like who? Must be. Who else would it be? Because I don't think she didn't Courtney, have a pacer. Yeah, does, Courtney doesn't have a pacer. So could, yeah, that likely is Matthew. Unbelievable, man. Defy is all superlatives. It's impossible to articulate just how impressive this person is. Breaking the course record at Hard Rock last year, demolishing what felt like an unbreakable course record at UTMB two years ago. Also just obliterating a course record at the Grand Raid of Reunion Island. Here she is, well on her way to a course record performance here at Western States. She must be feeling pretty optimistic here, Corinne, now that she's officially passed the point at which she succumbed to that injury back in 2019. I mean, yes, and I, I guess I don't know where when she started walking, but she didn't get to, she dropped that at Green Gate. Right. Okay. So I think it was it might have happened I think on Cal Street at some point, but she definitely had to go across the river and then make it up to Green Gate. But I think the walking started on that uphill somewhere. So when she gets past Green Gate, she's gonna have green lights all the way to the finish. Green lights. So we expect that to be Matthew Blanchard just behind her, running in ninth overall, eighth male. Yeah. Remind our viewing audience, Courtney is also going to be running the Hard Rock 100 in just three weeks' time. I know people were speculating that maybe she wasn't going too hard because the Hard Rock was on the horizon. But, no, we know that this course record is something that she really wants. I think she said that she's not really focused on the time, but I think there's a little bit of that going on of, like, wanting to absolutely smash this. I mean, how could it not be? I mean, an athlete of her level, she's already won here, right? So no. we, do, we do have an official Katie Scheid split now from Cal 3 as well. And that, grap has, that, that gap has grown. I tried to use grown and gap in the same sentence or the same word. 
and it's grown another three minutes from Cal 2, so that now Courtney has a 25-minute lead over Katie Scheid at Cal 3, and we'll be waiting for updates from the chasing pack of women ranking in th third through eighth position making moves up to that top 10. This is also where Leah Yingling started to make some moves last year, was on her way down to the river. She was, I think, actually around 10th position, leaving Forest Hill again last year as well. So she's hunting in that kind of exact same spot. And someone in the comments said, Leah loves running from behind, loves being on the attack. How perfect is it that she gets to do that without her tracker working now too? <laughs> it's so true. No it's one's like gonna running know. without a headlamp on at night when you're chasing people's people down. And Courtney DeWalter doesn't even stop at the aid station on the near side of the river. Just quickly dives down to the boat that awaits her to carry her passage across and the climb towards Green Gate. Just... <sighs> I don't know what else to say at this point. She still has 22 miles to run, but it's just like, God, I don't, you can't put it into words just how impressive this is. Yeah, it is incredibly impressive. And we also have a new update between M1 and M2. Tom Evans has extended his lead over Tyler Green on his way up to Greengate. That lead is now 21 minutes. Tom wow. making another three and a half minutes on that river crossing and uphill to Greengate. That's substantial. I that mean, that's is, only like two and a half miles, three yeah, miles. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very, very quick little bit of time. Courtney in the boat. So Tom Evans with over a 20-minute lead. Last we saw, Courtney DeWalter had a 25-minute lead over Katie Scheid. Big smile, still looking happy and cheerful and strong. Certainly no Waving sign. to people on the bank as she makes her way over to the far side of the river. Having an absolute blast Gosh. as they come into shore here. People are going to be losing their minds as she makes her way into Green Gate. The goat. That's all you can say. I'm going to, yeah, it's oh, all the feels going on right now. And we're going to get, we're going to peep a little rucky chucky split here. 11, 58, 57 elapsed. So her Rocky Chucky, she came through. Yeah, so this is where things fell apart. It was in this zone somewhere, because I think her Rocky Chucky split all of a sudden was 13-10. Last time, so she really? was well ahead, and then yeah. she must have started walking down somewhere between Cal 3 and, and Rocky Chucky. I think while we have a moment in between runners coming down to the river we are going to throw to a quick commercial break and then we'll be back to continue to be the eyes in the sky Okay, we're back as the eyes in the sky, watching more runners. That is, that looks like Scott Trayer to me. This is Scott Trayer, and maybe? No, that's, that's, Who that's, is that? that's Courtney ascending the climb towards Oh, Gate. her crew's come down to meet her? 
That's Possibly. what that is. Yeah. Okay, this makes way more sense. I was like, Scott Trayer's made up a lot of time on his way to the river. No, he's carrying a backpack in his hands, which would also be <laughs> super odd. It does look like Scott Trayer. Right, Trayer's. doesn't it look like Scott Trayer? We got a doppelganger out there. Come on, Green Hat crew. You know that's run fastest thing. Yeah. No, that's amazing. Courtney is gabbing and catching up. And what we were talking about before that commercial break is that I am quite positive that Courtney DeWalter is currently running 50 minutes 55 zero minutes ahead of Ellie Greenwood's split at Rocky Chucky. Which means she has a very good chance of running under 16 hours here on the Western States course. And just to emphasize something that we've repeated multiple times, nobody has been within 23 minutes of Ellie's course record here at Western States. And Courtney is well on her way to absolutely shattering it. Yeah, this is kind of bonkers. Like, very, very, very insane. I've got some more stats, it sounds like, coming in from Mr. Aid Station Fireball. Holy expletive. Courtney DeWalter has just run the fastest split of all time on the Cal Street section of, of the course, Forest Hill, i.e. mile 62 to the river at mile 78 in two hours and ten minutes. I'm pretty sure that's just three minutes slower than Tom Evans. It is. She just ran that section only three minutes behind Tom Evans. The only times that are faster are her is her own split from 2018 in 231, and Trayson's split of 233 from 98. Ellie Greenwood's course record split of 235 from 2012, and Anne Trayson's split from 1994 of 236. She just ran a 210 from Forest Hill to the river. Again, that is only three minutes slower than Tom Evans ran that exact same section. That is that is next level crazy. Next level crazy. It's hard to really articulate just how beyond precedent this is. Watching the all-time great Courtney DeWalter absolutely destroying the Western States course here today, of course, she is running in favorable conditions, but man, is she putting on just an absolute master class, running well inside the top 10 overall, likely going to swallow up at least one or two more men ahead of her before she reaches the finish line here. And on the left-hand side, we see Ryan Montgomery, who sits in ninth, pla ninth place overall. Or do, have we seen Matthew Blanchard yet? I don't know that we saw Matthew, but I think he was running with Courtney, so I believe he is ahead yeah. of Ryan oh, Montgomery. Let's see. There's no... Yeah, no, there's a Rocky Chucky okay, split great. for Matthew. So he came through at 4.59 p.m. local time, 11.59, 10 elapsed. Ryan Montgomery, Montgomery came is into this eighth station six minutes behind him. We expect Cole Watson, Arlen Glick, Cody Lind to be some of those next men in. Just behind them is going to be Ludo Pomeray, Janusz Kowalczyk, and Jonathan Rea. Wow. I think we're just all still completely in awe of what we just, of what Liam just told me for the splits. Like that is, I can't, I can't even. Like that is. I mean, it's hard to run a 210 on the cow loop in training. Yeah. Let alone after 62 miles of racing. Like, if I was going out to rip some intervals on Cal Street, I don't know if I could run 210. After running 62 mile, like a 62 mile, mile, mile warm-up? Uh, yeah. God. That is next level. So this, that's, what you're, that's who you're watching right now, just run her way up to Greengate. Like, it's no big deal. As we see Ryan Montgomery get in the boat, making his way to the other side of the river where hopefully he's got a friend or two waiting to bring him up to Greengate. Again, Ryan tried to start this race in 2021 and 2022, but was unable to make it to the start line due to injury. I actually saw him here this time last year. He had a foot injury, so he was on the bike, and then he got hit by a car on the bike and had a broken shoulder. Like, just could not catch a break. Yeah. So to see Ryan back here running makes me so, so happy. He and looks strong and happy, too. Hopefully hopefully grabbing one of those M-bibs for next year. Heck, yeah. So by my count, we now have... And just so you know, too, according to Liam, according to 8th Station Fireball, that 2.10 that she just ran is the eighth fastest time ever, male or female. That split from Forest Hill to the river. It just keeps getting better. Like, will that ever be replicated again? 
It won't. Uh, like we were just saying off mic during the commercial break, if she runs under 16 hours, this is going to be the type of performance where it is like a Matt Carpenter at Leadville or a Matt Carpenter at Pikes Peak type record of like, how does anybody we're, beat we're that? like at some point there might be someone good enough, but then they have to have like the perfect, perfect weather yeah. and the, yeah, the perfect weather and the perfect day. Like that is just the tallest undertaking. Let's not get too ahead of ourselves. This is absolutely ridiculous what we're seeing here. Courtney DeWalter in full control of the women's race here today. I would say that's Cole Watson making his yeah. way down to the boat as well. So, yeah, so Cole Watson has moved himself into that M10 position. Again, he's been kind of slowly moving up all day. He definitely... You know, I mean, I think I'm I'm hopeful that this means that he's going to end up in that top 10 last year after finish, finishing 14th or this year after finishing 14th last year. But holy Toledo, just I'm in awe of everything that's going on out there. I'm going to do some check ins on some other folks that we've been keeping our eyes on, including Hella. Hella is on course. My computer tried to correct it to hello. He is out on course. He has come through. Last chance as of 3.37 p.m. We expect him to be at Devil's Thumb sometime between now and now. So he should be at Devil's Thumb momentarily. Cole Watson accompanied by Adam Kimball here crossing the boat, crossing the river, sitting in 10th position. Cole Watson... Definitely hoping to secure one of those M10 bibs for our viewing audience. I think it's important to remember this is going to be sort of one of the subplots and storylines that we'll be following throughout the rest of the broadcast and into the evening is the battle not only for the win and for the podium, but for those top 10 positions. And often those battling for those, call it 8th through 12th positions, are pretty darn close approaching the end and everybody's fighting for those coveted F and M 1 through 10 bibs. Cole Watson looking pretty good. Alex Lore from Hoka texted me that Cole Watson put on the Rocket X2 shoes from Forest Hill, which is apparently their, like, hyper-performance carbon-plated That's what Heather road was flat. planning to run in yeah. from Greengate to the finish as well. I just checked in on Gene Dykes. He's the oldest entrant in the race at 75. If he finishes tomorrow before 11 a.m., he'll be the oldest finisher ever. He is currently through mile 38. Dusty Corners came through there at 3.40 p.m. We expect him to be at last chance here any moment, um, like really, really close to now. So we'll see if that updates, um, making it to that 43.3-mile mark. Casey Licktag on your screen right now, coming through Forest Hill, working on getting her ninth finish here in a row. That will allow her to come back next year for her 10th finish and get that 1,000-mile buckle. Unbelievable. Absolutely. We're just going to say unbelievable over and over again. I think we're. I don't think we have any more words. I think we're out. No words. Out this of words. This is now my 11th year at the Western States 100 in a row, I may add. Every year is special. This one will definitely stand out in my memory bank. Yeah, so Leah's tracker finally did update. It says that she came through basically with Jen, Jenny Quilty in 10th and 11th position. So Leah Yingling, the jig is up, kid. We know where you are. <laughs> I texted, not I texted her, up anymore. her final pacer, Matt Mitchell, and I said, her tracker not working has been driving me crazy. Good luck, team. So it's been probably... I don't know, 15 minutes or so since Courtney exited the boat. It'll probably be another 15 minutes or so before we see Katie Scheid jump into the boat. As we walk, I mean, here's the thing. Katie Scheid isn't fading. She's just being, uh, everyone's being blown away by Courtney at the front. It's like Kate, Katie Scheid is doing nothing wrong and is going to have a superb run here more than likely. But Courtney DeWalter is on another planet. Another galaxy. Yeah, but it is going to be really interesting to watch that sort of third through tenth battle in the women's race. Yeah, we've I, been spending a lot of time obviously following Courtney DeWalter, but there is a super interesting battle occurring for those spots behind her. 
Yeah, no, it is it is super, super interesting. We don't have an updated Cal, any Cal splits. Do we have an updated Cal 2 splits from the women from Iron Far? Because they, they're not going to come up on ultra, ultralive.net, I think. Um, well, you try. Well, I've I'll, done, I'll check Iron Far. I was going to say, I've done 8th edition by 8th I've done all. I've done all the ways. I've used all the ways. Finally breaking into a hike here for Courtney. That's comforting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she oh she is human. That's what I'm getting out of this. Right. She does periodically have to walk up a hill. I love this update from Iron Far of Tyler Green at Green Gate. Tyler Green in second at mile 79. He's 1930 back of the leader. Expressive. <laughs> Period. Expressive period. I don't know what that means, but I'm totally into it. I, but I get it, right? I, I don't know what it means, but I totally understand. I don't know what it means, but I don't hate it. All right. I'm scrolling back here, trying to look for some updates from the women at Cal 2. Yeah, they should be there. Yeah, I think so, too. I think we should have splits from from this chase pack. And again, we believe that chase pack is going to be led by Ida and Esther, followed closely by Emily Hoggood. So we'll see if we can get that updated. Katie Asmuth, we know, is in there as well. Keely Henninger, Taylor Nowlin. Tell us where you are. Sending a text to Ted Knudsen now. The only gummies we're eating here, team, is fruit snacks. We've got a Costco-sized box of them. Yeah, I'm definitely criminally underhydrated and underfed here today, but my goodness, my energy has not waned for a second. Probably I have drank several cups of coffee at this point, but what an amazing day here as we watch Courtney DeWalter cruise up towards the Green Gate Aid Station. I think she's approaching it very quickly here. And now we see Arlen Glick coming down towards the Rucky Chucky River Crossing. Arlen Glick, M3 from last year, currently sitting in 11th position overall, unless we missed somebody. Cole Watson was, sorry, yeah, Cole Watson was 10th male. So I think Arlen is 11th male. 12th overall, but let me double check that. Yeah, and so people asked if that was a pacer running with Courtney. No, that's you can have anyone from your crew run with you from um, the river up to Green Gate. And so she had two crew members come down and meet her at the river and run her up to Green Gate, is what we're witnessing right now. Arlen Glick down in the chair at the river crossing, getting hydrated, getting cooled down before he gets in the boat to make his way up to Green Gate. So I did confirm he is in 12th overall, 11th male, reaching the Rucky Chucky River crossing. I'm sure eager to do battle for those top 10 positions. Oh, and here's Cody Lind in the chair too. So this is gonna be 12th and 13th. See if they jump in that boat together. Yeah, I hope so. Say, hey, let's get out of here. I mean, Luke, I, Luke Nelson is saying, hey, let's get out of here, Cody. We got to, we got to get a move on. So just thinking tactically here, Corinne, as we observed, I think Tom they're Evans. all on the move. They're all getting into the boat. That was both an Arlen Glick jumping up there. Heck yeah. And back to, uh, back to Cody Lind. As that I was that saying, looked like Michigan Bluff for a second. Yeah, it was. So just commenting for our viewers on the strategic element here. Observing Tom Evans as he jumped in the boat, he had his Red Bull and ketones waiting for him with Josh Everly. Courtney DeWalter didn't even stop at the aid station, just ran and jumped in the boat and had the crew waiting on the other side. Just Meanwhile, did a full dip there in the river. They got out of the boat and did a full lay down to get completely drenched before they got up and get, are getting up this hill. Looked like another my, crew member waiting for someone to get across the river there. My point is, is it feels like the better move at the Rucky Chucky River Crossing is to have crew and either do your resupply like in the boat 
or to do the DeWalter method and just not stop at the aid station, have your crew come down to the other side. I've never stopped at the Rocky Chucky aid station because yeah. my crew always met me on the other side of the river. I actually have a fun rookie mistake story from doing that with Dave Mackey, all-time ledge. Oh, yeah, didn't we he came get mad down, at you? He got mad at me. We don't need to talk about that, but came down to the river basically together, and I spent an extra couple minutes at, or a couple seconds in the aid station, go around the corner, and see the boat taken off with Dave and his pacer. I was like, oh, shoot. So I ended up having to hang out on the near side of the Rucky Chucky River crossing for a couple of minutes to wait for the boat to come back and pick me up. It was a good learning experience to get in the boat quickly when you have your opportunity as Arlen Glick now exits the boat to climb his way up to Green Gate. We're going to go to a quick commercial break here. Hang tight. I feel like I have imposter syndrome at all. Every time I've come to these races, I feel like I've trained hard enough and I like legitimately believe I can win. What I don't know why is like, why am I winning? Okay, welcome back to the 2023 Western States 100 presented by Hoka Corinne. We now have the splits for the top five men through Greengate, of course, led by Tom Evans, the great British champion who went through at 11.32 elapsed, 21 minutes ahead of his nearest competitor, Tyler Green, who then had seven minute advantage on Anthony Costales in third, Jeff Colt, another minute behind Anthony, and Shen Ji Shen, two minutes there behind Jeff Colt. So about 30 minutes separating the top five at Greengate. Oh my goodness. I have all the feels right now. The race is very much on. There's, no, I don't think a lot guaranteed necessarily between that group of guys. I think that Tom is running a really smart race and a hard race at the front. I think he's going to run a combination of scared and hopefully triumphant on these final 20 miles, right? Just really lean into to what he knows he's capable of. Tyler Green would be a phenomenal performance for them. Something I think we'd be really excited to see. I think that's Riley Brady on our screen nearest us with their pacer. Oh, I want to say the pacer's name is Amanda, but I am not certain that I'm correct on that. But that is Riley Brady nearest us being paced down to the river currently. But yeah, so I think Tom Evans running, running controlled. He's going to take a lot of energy from the fact that he's like, putting time on people like I think that's going to buoy him and I just hope that holds you've got Tyler Green who's running a great race and he should be absolutely thrilled I think people gave when he was second in 2021 I think a lot of people said well a lot of guys fell apart and Tyler just ran smart yep. but this is a year where there hasn't been a lot of carnage there's incredibly good like it's like everyone is kind of sticking like sticking their neck out there and it's like kind of in my mind, it's like if he can replicate that second place, it's kind of like a, yeah, you guys, I told you it wasn't a fluke. Like, I'm really good. And doing it in totally different style, too. Different styles, yeah. different conditions as well. 2021 was notoriously hot. We know that he is a tactician in the heat, so that does not surprise me. But that's kind of, you know, like I think to pull, to continue to pull that off in a, in a more ideal year while running really aggressively makes me really happy sorry we're apparently on a railroad track so bear with us there's our choo-choo train again as we look at Janish Kowalczyk I think here yep that's Janish Danny Moreno I believe is going to be jumping in to pace yep him. there's Danny new teammate Danny Moreno this year looks like Miriam is there his partner as well as our um the Adidas Tarek team manager 
Julia there, making sure he's got everything he needs to get across the river, get up that hill. Really, so really impressive running from everyone. Can't remember who said that Ludovic was having a rough go. I think it was Zach Marion upon leaving Forest Hill. So Ludovic continues to move further back in the field as Janish now sits in 14th overall place, 13th male, crossing the river. And let's see, he is, he's a full 15 minutes out of 10th place contention right now. Yeah, like it's it's still the top getting a top ten. I think is is still very much up for grabs. Yep. Here's Ludo, and he goes beelines for the chair. Yep. <laughs> Our forty-seven-year-old yeah. champion and Ludo Pomeray. And then on the smaller screen, the drone shot on the right-hand side. That is going to be Katie Scheid and Topher Gaylord making their way down to the river. We've got eyes on F two Katie Scheid accompanied by her pacer, Topher Gaylord, making their way down to the river. Curious to see what that Rocky Chucky split is. Did you already go through the updated women's splits from Cal 2? No, because I didn't know we had updated we, I think we just, just got them. Okay, so, so. Go ahead. So it's kind of as expected. We knew that Esther Chillog and Eden Nelson were running side by side along with their pacers, which include MK Sullivan. They are, they came through there at... 5.10 p.m. local time, 12.10 elapsed time. They've got about a two-minute lead over Emily Hoggood, who then has a one-minute lead over Katie Asmith, who is then, again, one more minute ahead of Taylor Nowlin. Splits we don't have yet for Cal 2 include Keely Henninger, who we do anticipate to be right near that group, if not in the mix of that group. So curious to see what the split is for Keely Henninger at Cal 2. And then we anticipate that we will have another pack of Priscilla Forgy, Jenny Quilty, and Leah Yingling. We have had eyes on Meg Morgan and her pacer. And her pacer, sorry, I got distracted there for a second. Amelia Boone and then Riley Brady we just saw on our screen moments ago. Do you know who this is on our left-hand side here, Corinne? No, I, oh, is it? Hold on. Okay, now we're looking down. Well, that we might have been Stephanie Austin. So that does not look like Katie to me from this vertical angle. It looks like a Hoka kit. Who would this be? Not Ludo. John Rea. Oh, that's probably it. Yeah, yeah oh, it is. It totally is because his pacer's yep. in a blue shirt. That is our aerial shot is on John Rea and his pacer. That's the next Hoka kit. I was like, Esther Chill Chillog didn't make that big of a leap. Yeah, but we should see Katie Scheid here any second now, too. You got to give it to Katie Scheid, too. Like, absolutely taking a swing here as well, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Courtney DeWalter. Courtney, of course, one of the all-time greats, having a historic day here. And Katie still on that type of pace herself even with that gap growing ahead of her. It'll be interesting to interpret her body language through here as well. We did have her split through Cal 3, which was L Ludo's up 50 and minutes ago. Going toward the boat. It looks like, so. yeah. No, we do expect, while well, we knew that was John Rea, we do expect Katie Scheid to be... 40 minutes ago. Katie Scheid came through Cal 3 with John Rea, so we should we do anticipate to see Katie Scheid here any moment if we have not missed her somehow making her way towards Rocky Chucky. But Courtney has opened up a substantial lead. Courtney is officially through Greengate as of seven minutes ago, 5.20 local time, 12.20 elapsed time. So it's now at least a... What? Wait. She's 55 minutes ahead of course record pace at Greengate. So she is under 16 hour pace here at the Western States 100. Again, the current course record is 1647 by the great Ellie Greenwood set in 2012. So Courtney DeWalter now almost an hour ahead of what has been thought of as a nearly unbreakable course record pace. I mean, no one has gotten within 23 minutes of it in the last decade. 
just d defies all description. Eagerly anticipating seeing Katie Scheid here. Don't know whether to be alarmed that we haven't seen her yet, especially if she went through Cal 3 with John Ray. And our drone operator is looking well back along the course. There's a couple people. That must be her. Let's get a picture here. That, there that, she is. There is Katie Scheid and Topher Gaylord making their way towards Rucky Chucky. Shout yeah. out to that drone operator. Thank huh? you, drone operator. Just when I was starting to get nervous, he panned back along the course. Jamil Curry, I was just informed in my headset via Billy Yang that that's Jamil flying the drone here for us today. A shout out saving, to Jamil. Saving our butts. Katie Scheid accompanied by Topher Gaylord along this final stretch of dirt road towards the Rucky Chucky River Crossing where we, she will certainly get an update about the historic performance that's happening ahead of her. She will also likely get an update of the pack of women that are chasing her even though she does have a cushion that will likely give her some motivation to keep the pedal down. Yeah, it'll be, I'll, I'm curious to know when she'll get most updated course information as far as how much room she has. We do have Tom Evans through ALT, mile 85, as of 10 minutes ago, 1219 elapsed, 519 p.m., Tom Evans is making so if, moves. So if Tom's prediction is true, he will be here at the track in two hours. He's got to do what? How quickly does this day go? It's insane. We, We've already been broadcasting just, for more than 13 hours. We've been here since 3.30 a.m. We're doing great. Gosh, unbelievable. Best day ever. Best day of the year. So much fun, and again, one for the ages, one that we will never forget here as a broadcasting team, and I hope you all feel the same back at home. All right, so let's catch a split here from Rocky Chucky. Courtney DeWalter went through at 11.58 a lap, so just about 30 minutes ago now. As we watch Katie Scheid approach here too. So if she is about 30 minutes back of Courtney, that puts her about 20 minutes ahead of Ellie Greenwood's course record pace. So again, not to be overshadowed by the all-time great Courtney DeWalter, Katie Scheid putting together what could end up being one of the great 100-mile performances in history here today. Yeah, really, really impressive. which I think we've just said over and over again at this point. So I'm glad. I'm glad we, we all just are going to roll with it more than anything. But really, really amazingly happy to have Jamil being our eyes in the sky, guiding guiding us and our runners in to Rocky Chucky. Katie Scheid there, followed closely by Topher Gaylord. We'll get an official Rocky Chucky split here. Let's see how she approaches this river crossing strategically. She's already taken more time than Courtney. Dumping that ice in the hat. There's Topher getting his own rehydration. Yeah, so Courtney came through Rocky Chucky about 34 minutes ago. So the gap continues to grow, albeit only slightly. Yeah, my question is how big is the gap behind her, right? Like, I feel like that is still well, like that 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 has also been holding pretty steady. It hasn't been contracting much to the to the women that are chasing, but I do think that they've got you know some dynamic duos going on, and I think because those women are going to start jockeying for third, fourth, fifth, sixth place, etc., they're also going to be moving really fast, yeah. and they might close some to to Katie without even realizing it. Yeah, place. the last aid station where we had a deep reservoir of those updates was at Cal Two, where Katie Scheid had about a 50 minute gap back to the third place runner, who at that point was Esther Chillag running basically together with Eda Nilsson there. Followed so very closely by Katie Asman. Right. Point being, though, Katie Scheid likely still does have dozens of minutes on the women behind her. Yeah, yeah, we believe that to be true. I'm not sure if we're going to get a Cal 3 split for those women or not. Again, 
the last time we had a split from them was back at that Cal 2 aid station. We still don't have a split for Keeley through Cal 2, which scares me, but in my head it's have to tell me it's not updating, it's not us, it's just not updating. Love this. Coke to go. Katie seems, she just cracked a big smile. Topher handing her the sponge. They've got work to do, you know? <laughs> They're there to do work is what's happening here. Topher Gaylord, seven-time finisher, board member. You can think of few people better to be the pacer for the entirety of that 38-mile stretch. Topher actually paced me at Hard Rock back in 2021. Really great friend. Awesome member of the community. He's also been one of the great supporters of the sport through this entire age of growth we've seen over the last 25 years. Katie Scheid exiting the boat and crossing the Rucky Chucky River crossing here in second position. Again, she is about 35 minutes back of race leader Courtney DeWalter, but also running an absolutely ridiculous race here today. Here's John Ray leaving the aid station behind Katie. So it took, took a lot of time there. Here's Camille at Forest Hill. All right, Camille, rocking those Gooder sunglasses. And that F8 bib, great to see I, Camille. I think that's Michigan Bluff. I think you're right, actually. Yep, yeah. Michigan Bluff. Yeah, so Camille is back at Michigan Bluff, haven't had a day thus far, does not look like She's looking to drop by any means, but yeah, just, just made it into Michigan Bluff maybe three or four minutes ago. 12, 31, 33 elapsed. So Camille Heron sitting at mile 55 here. Sort of the analog to Courtney DeWalter and sort of the road and track ultra running scene. Somebody who has rewritten the record books during the course of her illustrious career. Yeah, so it does seem like um, I Run Far has Keely Henninger two minutes behind Taylor Nowlin at Peachstone, which is Cal 2 or mile 71-ish. So while it's not updating ultralive.net, we do know that Keely has come through Cal 2. That put her in the eighth position. So the question is, who is 9, 10, and 11? Because we do think that Priscilla Forgey, Jenny Quilty, and Leah Yingling are probably all very close to get together at this point. Devin Yanko helping me out via text all day long. Thanks for being my second set of eyes. So who do we who are we missing between fourth and seventh women? It was fifth and sixth position. Oh, here they are. Emily Hoggett and and Katie Asmith. So it looks like Ida and Esther were in a third and fourth, running within a minute of each other. Then Emily Hoggett and Katie Asmith running in together, two minutes behind them. And then as you said, seventh and eighth, Taylor Nowlin and Keely Henninger, only three or four minutes behind that other group, so man. That women's pack of third through eighth is still only separated by probably like a total of five or six minutes. Yeah, it is literally anyone's game in that in that group of women. It's really, really impressive. I guess I don't need this note about Courtney's splits anymore because she's destroyed those from 2019. So I'm just going to delete that note. Get rid of it. Don't need it anymore. Iron Far update from Cal 2. It looks like Priscilla Forgy now through Cal 2 in ninth position. She's 94 minutes back of the lead. I think that puts her about 15 minutes back of Keeley. Yep, yep. There seems to be a pretty big gap between that group, again, that third through eighth place group, and then the, the chase pack. Is this is this Katie motoring up towards Green Gate here? That could be Katie with her whole crew moving up towards Green Gate. Those kind of look like it. Jamil can fly his drone everywhere. What can't Jamil do? Great question. Frustratingly accomplished person out uber, here. Uber talented. <laughs> Hard rock phenom. Yeah. Gives you all the feels. Yep, that this appears to be She's Katie cruising, Shide man. cruising up Green Gate. 
you know how I'm one, you know, in my mind, I'm like, maybe aerial footage just makes us all look really fast. But I think she's running quite quickly <laughs> up Green Gate right now. I need someone to take aerial footage of me if that's the case. Yeah, make me feel good about myself. Um, so, court um, updates from Liam. We're going to give Liam Tryon or Aid Station Fireball all of the shout outs all day long. Some updates. Katie Scheid just ran the Cal Street section. Again, that is Forest Hill to the river in the third fastest time for that section ever. So again, remember how we're like, Katie Scheid isn't blowing up. Courtney is just running away with it. So she ran a 2.32 on that section. That's a minute faster than 98 and Trayson and two minutes faster than Ellie Greenwood in 2012. Okay, so under course record pacing, third fastest time ever behind two, two times done by Courtney. Just to put that into perspective, according to Walter and Katie Shad recorded the two fastest times ever by a female to the river from the start, making it there in 11.58 and 12.31, respectively. They are both well ahead of course record pace, putting um, Courtney DeWalter 50 minutes ahead of course record pace and Katie Shad 17 minutes ahead of course record pace. For example, Gosh. just to put this into perspective, Ellie Greenwood arrived at the river in 12.48 elapsed unbelievable so it's like it's like that is mind-bending to me that katie shide is literally running a like world one of the greatest races of all time yes and is like yeah so tom evans will likely run either the third or fourth fastest time in western states history certainly one of the great western states performances of all time meanwhile in the women's race we're seeing two of not only the best western states in history but two of the best hundred mile performances in history unbelievable a massive shout out to Courtney DeWalter and Katie Scheid for allowing us to bear witness to the spectacle as we see Rod Farvar now exiting the aid station heading down towards the river he's probably sitting somewhere in like 17th 18th position here is that Chris Brown maybe that he's accompanied by there that would track. I don't know for certain, but he he is here, so he definitely that definitely could be Chris. I didn't get a good look at him. This is a is this ALT? No. Yeah, ALT. Tyler Green coming into ALT with Justin Grunewald, his pacer. Tyler Green in second position here, 85 miles into the race today. Tyler Green, a second place performer here two years ago, fourth place last year. Stretching it out a little bit. We're going to get an official split here in just a second. Again, this is mile 85.2. Tom, just to put this into perspective Tom again. Tom came through 22 minutes ago. Yep, at um, 519 elapsed. So with 15 miles to go, Tom Evans has a 22-minute lead, meaning that he would either need to implode or Tyler would need to gain like a minute and a half per mile in order for him to remove that deficit. So Tom Evans well on his way to a fantastic victory here, but Tyler Green certainly is gonna put up a fight here in the final 15 miles. And what a stud this guy is, a new dad, the father of about a nine month old son. His wife, Rachel Drake, also a fantastic professional athlete for Nike from Portland, Oregon. Sort of a late bloomer in his endurance racing career. 39 years old, Tyler Green. But really, it's only been in the last couple years where he's come into his own. As Kareen recaffeinates here at the finish line, I'm going to probably do the same thing myself. Tyler Green exiting ALT now. About 23 minutes back of the Tom Evans split from that same aid station. I think we're going back towards Katie Scheid, climbing up towards Green Gate now mobbing up towards green gate i just want to make sure that we're we, we use that use the words effectively running really really fast there's scott Trayer, getting ice into that mongo mondo ice bandana run faster he says apparently running with a broken big toe that we were informed about earlier today really really good running by scott Trayer and his partner's running as well i think Callie Vinson. Yeah. Really? Wow. I wonder if she's still out there or not. We should check. We were jokingly calling them the prom king and prom queen of...
Oh no, she had to pull out early, it looks like. Oh, that is such a bummer. That's a bummer. That is a major, major bummer. I think Chris Warden knows what happened. I'll message him. Chris Warden, drop it in the chat, good buddy. So Scotty Trevor, who we just saw heading down towards the boat to carry him across the river. He was our 10th place finisher last year here. It's gonna be difficult for him to battle back up into that M10 contention at this point. But he is still proudly cruising along the course, rocking that white button down shirt with style. Yeah, our eye in the sky is going to run out of battery here in a little bit. We'll see. We'll see what happens. But wow, Scott Trayer just like, like fully slid into the boat there. No, so not slowing down whatsoever. Getting getting into that boat. It looks like we have 19 total people to the river. Number 19 being Scott Trayer, who we're with now, in the boat. So behind him, we should see the likes of J.P. Giblin, Lou Okanhua. Adam Mary, before we start seeing that women's chase pack of Esther Chilog, Ida Nilsson, Emily Hoggood, Katie Asmuth, Taylor Nowlin, Keely Henninger, Priscilla Forgey. So actually, Corinne, this is interesting. Do we have any updated Peachstone Cal 2 splits from Iron Far? I can check. You tell me what you're going to say. Well, I think, let me see here. Well, at least... Esther, Ida, Emily, and Katie all came through Cal 3 in succession. I would guess the same is true for Taylor and Keeley, meaning that there were no men even mixed up in between that group because they're Does so close. Does not surprise yeah. me. So there aren't official updates from Cal 3 for Taylor Nowlin, Keeley Henninger, Priscilla Forge, but they have we have received those updates from Iron Farr. So this battle for the podium in the women's race is going to be super fun for us to watch over the next few hours. Yeah, just, I mean, there are so many things that I'm blown away by here. We've got absolutely amazing performances going on left and right. We've got, so someone that I've been following along with, this is a little personal anecdote I guess um, some of you might know Gavin Woody run, he's run western states he's run hard rock I feel like he's a, an ultra guy his sister is running the race again Kristen Scott she's back in 31st right now has come through devil's thumb um, but she's starting her residency in emergency medicine next week by having orientation start on Monday I think it's pretty impressive to run a 100 mile race on Saturday and have to get to medical or medical school residency orientation just you know 36 hours later. It's good to get the energy out, you know, get the nerves out. Yeah, just that. get really, get ready to sit down and then take your first trauma shifts over 4th of July weekend coming up. So, yeah, kind of, it's very, very cool. She's been waiting for, I think, seven or eight years to run Western States. So, you know, I think that we've seen a lot less attrition over the last couple of years because people are waiting longer and longer to get into the race. And so I think, you know, people are really like, you, you go all in because this is like your one shot to run yeah. Western States. You know, Craig Thornley posted something earlier this week using the analog of 2019, which you and I have done many times throughout the day today. Apparently in 2019, there was roughly an 85% finishing rate here at Western States. It'll be interesting to see how that tracks here to today's field. We should see the likes of Anthony Costales and Jeff Colt coming through the ALT aid station here pretty soon. I think last we saw Anthony was about seven minutes back of Tyler at Greengate. So if that remains the case, we're about six minutes since Tyler went through ALT. So we might get a visual of Anthony Costales there at ALT. Maybe just to boost our fundraiser another time here on the broadcast for those who are just joining us. We haven't mentioned this in a few hours, but we are running a fundraiser today 
on the broadcast. So if you are enjoying the show, we would definitely appreciate your contribution. Every dollar that we raise during this fundraiser goes towards the mission of the Western States 100 organization, which encompanies three pillars, putting on a great race, being leaders in medical research specific to trail and ultra running, and taking care of this wonderful trail. I think so far we've raised a little under $3,000. So a big thank you to everybody who has contributed. To the other 11,000 people watching us now, we would certainly appreciate that support. Western States is a nonprofit organization, like I said, so every dollar does go to that cause. Yeah, just to kind of reiterate some of the things we've talked about earlier today, we've put in, people have put in, a lot, a lot of people have put in three, over 3,000 volunteer hours in, into trail work since November of 2022 to make sure that we were race day ready. Anthony Costales, Chico State, baby. The ultimate flex, Anthony Costales charging into ALT in third place, rocking the Chico State cross country singlet and that gray sun hat. He's maintaining that roughly seven minute gap behind Tyler Green sitting in third place. Anthony Costales running his first Western States. I think it's his second 100 miler. He ran the run rabbit run 100 miler. Not sure if it was last year or the year before. There's his pacer, Jimmy Elam, helping him with his ice bandana. And Anthony likely also on pace for a sub 16 hour day here today. Really, really impressive group of runners. I mean, once again, I'll say, I've said it this once, I've said it twice, I'll say it one more time. Everyone who got off the start line today, brave and impressive. What we're watching at the front of the field right now, absolutely insane. What will we be watching tomorrow, you know, come golden hour, equally insane. Opposite, yeah. very full days. An emotional roller coaster. You'll remember if you've been with us all day that we had two instances of tears in the first couple hours of the broadcast today. There hasn't been any tears since then, but what an emotional day. Highs and lows, triumph and defeat, the whole human experience. And that's why we come here every year. Yeah, it's this is my favorite week of the year. So we've got those official, I think, ALT updates coming in. Technically, Anthony Casales will say he came through at what, 5.51, does that seem? Yeah, so he, that puts him about 10 minutes behind Tyler Green at ALT. Nine, 10 minutes behind Tyler Green. That, that in, my, in my math, in my head, that seems right. So again, Tom Evans off the front followed by Tyler Green, yep. and then 10 minutes later, Anthony Costales. We expect Jeff Colt to be the next male athlete into the ALT trailhead, into that aid station. He's going to be followed by Chinese athlete Shen Jingsheng, Dakota Jones, Danny Jones, no relation. Just ironic that they're sixth and seventh. Matthew Blanchard, it sounds like he got a pick-me-up from his crew. It seemed like he's had a tough day and needed a little boost from, from his crew at Greengate. Ryan Montgomery in ninth, Cole Watson in 10th. So it'll be interesting to see at Greengate as we get more of these updates. I'm sorry, not Greengate, from ALT, if Courtney DeWalter has continued to move through the top 10 overall positions here. Recollecting back to 2021, Beth Pascal finished seventh overall. Second place runner Ruth Croft was ninth overall that year. So I don't think we've seen a woman higher than seventh overall since the days of Ann Trayson. Correct me if I'm wrong, Corinne, and the folks in the chat. But I think Beth Pascal's seventh place overall from 2021 is probably the best of this sort of current era. So we see J.P. Giblin now coming in to Rocky Chucky. I think he's sitting in 20th position overall here. Yeah, again, I think this idea, you know, with 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 where this money goes, it goes back to putting on this amazing race. It goes back to the trail work that we do for the race and for the wider community. Reopening the trails after the burn was not just about the race. It was about the community here in the Tahoe area, in the Auburn area, 
in the Forest Hill, Michigan Bluff communities and into the medical research. I didn't know this, but found out earlier this week, listening to your podcast with, with Craig Thornley, that the belt buckles, the silver buckles, cost more than the race entry itself. That's pretty wild. Yeah. What a great... That's not exactly a profitable idea, team. What a great testament <laughs> to the priorities and the incentives of the race organization. Silver buckles cost about $400 a piece, which is roughly the same price for an entry fee. Again, Western States operates as a nonprofit. It's not about making money. It's about being leaders in this great sport of trail and ultra running, the best sport in the world. Western States has always been that since they invented the sport of 100-mile trail racing way back in 1974 as we celebrate the 50th Western States this year. I just saw a team photographer Ian walked by our studio, getting ready for Tom to make his way down here. That's always a good sign. When the when the team photographer has made it down to the finish line, you know it's almost finish line game time. Holy smokes. I think we just raised about a 1,000 bones. So big thanks to those who are watching who made those contributions here. We're now close to $4,000 for today's fundraiser. So thanks for logging on and thanks for contributing. Okay, here's a great correction. Nikki Kimball was third overall in 2006. Pam Smith was ninth overall. Anita Ortiz was ninth overall. Nikki Kimball, eighth in 2007, third in 2006. Thanks to Liam for those great stats. As we see Shen Ji Shen with his pacer, Patty O'Leary, coming into the aid station here. And does this mean that Shen... Jai Shen has now passed Jeff Colt, moving into fourth position. It is distinctly possible. We will see when we get an ALT split. You know, Patty O'Leary can do that to a person. Yeah. You pick up someone. I don't even know. I like. I don't know. I don't think Shen speaks very much English at all. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to picture Patty yelling at him in his Irish accent, and like just like getting the stoke from it more than any actual interpretation. Yeah, absolutely, Patty O'Leary. I think Shen's wife generally translates for him when, like, when they're around the team. So great, and he is our top-ranked Chinese athlete here today. And here we have Jeff Colt coming in in fifth position. What a race here unfolding today for these top five positions in the men's race. Jeff Colt, maybe losing a minute or two on Shen but still absolutely doing battle with 15 miles to go. He's taking a seat. Come on, Jeff. Jeff needs a snack. We all need a snack, no shame in that. As I was saying, Shen, our top ranked Chinese athlete here today, currently sitting in fourth position. That was sort of one of our storylines coming into the race. Zhao Zhaizhu, unfortunately, DNFing. Luo Kanhua still out there, but I think he's sitting somewhere outside the top 20 at this point at the river crossing. So Shen Zhai Shen doing great. Oh, here's Luo Kanhua descending down to the river now. So we are now almost 13 hours into the Western States 100. That means we're almost 14 hours into our broadcast here today. Feeling like we're finally hitting our groove here, Corinne, after a 13 hour warm up. Jeff Colt looks like he might be struggling a little bit here. He looks okay, but he shouldn't be in a chair. Yep. Jeffy, a zero minute mile, a 30 minute mile is faster than a zero minute mile. We gotta get Jeff Colt out of this chair. Yeah, taking a moment. We'll see what happens. I know he changed shoes and got some food from his crew at Greengate. Again, that's about um, that's five, six miles ago. There's a pretty big gap back to the next the next guy. 
which would be Dakota, actually Dakota and Danny Jones. But Jeff shouldn't shouldn't want to sit here for long. He's going to want to get up and get out of there. One of his college friends is either working ALT or Brown's Bar. And I wonder if it's that guy in the red shirt. There's a bunch of Middlebury connections that are going on in this race. Really? Jeff Colt and Katie Scheid went to school together. The mid kids. Together. Yep. Both mid kids. Both geology mid kids. Wow. That's ironic. Yeah. They go way back. And they both worked in the huts together, too. Does Jeff have a PhD like Katie does? No. He works in ski boots now. <laughs> a big shout out to everybody who has heeded our call for support here in the fundraiser here today. Since I just made that call, we've had almost $2,000 in contributions here. So a big thank you to everyone who is watching. And we hope you really enjoy it. We are working hard to make this possible. And all this money, again, goes towards the mission of Western states. Wow, over 4,600. Very, very cool team. I know, they're, they're correcting me in my ears, but I'm saying we've raised 2,000 since, since I made that original call like five minutes ago. Okay, yeah. Hey, Dylan, you're an effective fundraiser. Yeah. We get it, we yeah. get it. The stoke is real. Yeah. But yeah, no, that was confirmation that the individual in the aid station was a college buddy, Joseph, in the red. Yes, awesome. Yeah, and he's with good. He's got a good a good pacer with him. Pat, Pat's going to take really good care of him, but they just got to get him out of that chair and get him down the trail. This is where we saw Jared Hazen really right. have that moment yeah. last year. That he really came, He came through in third place, got in the chair, and never ne left. Never left yeah. the chair. I think they burritoed him up in an emergency blanket at one point and just kind of sat him back there. Okay, let's see where Courtney DeWalter is. I guess we would have seen her if she was at ALT by now. She left Green Gate 40 minutes ago. She's going to be at L ALT soon. Like, Oh, she's, she's going to move up higher in the top 10 overall. It's it's without a question. She's got Jeff Colt sitting in a chair. Hopefully he's moved. He's, she's got the, the non-Jones brothers ahead of her and Danny and Dakota. And Dakota was clearly suffering there at the river crossing. Yeah, looked, but here's the thing though. Both Jeff and Dakota, like sometimes people like look like they're suffering, like in their eyes. And I don't feel like either of those guys do, but clearly something's just like kind of coming a little bit unhinged. And we haven't really looked around much today here, Corinne, but the vibe is starting to descend upon Placer High School and the track here at the finish line of the Western States 100. We see a bunch of families out here putting out their shades and their camping chairs awaiting the champions. You know, we, I would guess Tom Evans should be here if he remains on the pace that he has been on. We would expect him to arrive in maybe about 90 minutes or so. Blistering. Just absolutely blistering. And it's just shocking how quickly this goes. Feels like we're just getting started. These guys have already run 85 miles today. I know. We've just been sitting here. Yep. Some people run ultras. Some people talk about ultras. Yeah, well, we've said at least 10,000 words today. We both, you know? we both put in some days of running this week. We tried. <laughs> yeah, I tried. We're both racing a hundred in like a month. We're we're doing okay. Don't remind me. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna be okay. We're gonna okay. go to a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. I think in some aspects to be human means to learn and failure is okay. We are here in Aresh Beaufort. We are about to get some mountain legs here. It's what he's going to need to succeed in UTMB. Jess and I are doing it together, <laughs> and home is where we decide to plant ourselves. First winter in France, it's been a lot of falling. 
every day I feel like I slip, I slide, I learn, I progress. Every day I'm picking up things and I'm getting better, but at the same time, pretty ready to start running again. I've had four attempts at getting to run UTMB. I mean, fourth place without a doubt feels unfulfilling. Last year, it was a lot to handle, and this year, it's most likely to all come together. Ultra running in general is completely reinforcing goals, identity, goals, identity. And the clarity that sport brings me, it refocuses you and recenters yourself. Failure is okay. The current failure, the current fall is just one moment. So hit the stars at the end of the day. Okay, and welcome back to the 2023 Western States 100 presented by Hoka, a great vignette by the three-time champion, Jim Walmsley, who is not here today, but whose name is written in the Western States history books. And another big thank you to everyone who has made contributions, another thousand bucks raised in just the last couple of minutes. So a big thanks to everyone who is supporting our fundraiser here today. Corinne, this is one for the ages. It is one for the ages. I was just looking at our women's lead group, or our women's kind of chase pack rather, the three, four, five, and six spots. I know that seven and eight are close together. Priscilla's also back there as well, but right now I'm waiting for them to come to Rucky Chucky. I'm looking for Esther Chillog, Eden Nilsson, Emily Hoggood, Katie Asmith, all should be well on their way to the river. We just saw um, a number of our lead men come through ALT. We do think that Tom Evans should be approaching the next aid station here shortly. We should be getting an update from that. He's got a sizable lead over Tyler Green. Tyler Green's got a, a safe margin right now over Anthony, at Anthony Costales. Patty O'Leary picked up Shen Ji Sheng and has moved him back up into the fourth position. And we briefly saw Jeff Colt sitting in a chair at ALT. And I have all my fingers crossed that someone has Tipped, tipped him out of that chair and gotten him at least walking down the trail. Yep, Jeff Colt looked like he was dealing with a little bit of a low patch, but he is definitely having the race of his career today, sitting in fifth place through ALT. Let's hope he has gotten out of that chair. I just hit refresh and it doesn't look like we've seen Dakota Jones or Dan Jones come through ALT yet. So he does have a cushion that we will certainly want Jeff to keep moving down the course here on his way to a top five finish here today. Meanwhile, again, we are witnessing two of the great 100 mile performances in ultra running history today on the women's side. Courtney DeWalter almost an hour ahead of Ellie Greenwood's legendary course record pace. And meanwhile, Katie Scheid, another American though living in France is about 20 minutes ahead of that legendary course record pace. So we should start to see updates from Courtney DeWalter through ALT and maybe another 30, 35 minutes behind that. We'll see Katie Scheid. Um, Barry Casey wants you to know that Courtney's on pace to finish within 20 minutes of Dylan's and Scott Jurek's best times at 15.36 yep. and 22 minutes off of Killian's best time. Yep. Thank you, Barry. Just Thanks for the reminder. Wanted to point that one out. It does look like we have some of the Joneses <laughs> through ALT. We just got an update there, I believe. And it's Danny Jones who has made it through ALT, not Dakota. And again, they are not related. They just happen to both have D names that end in Jones. But yeah, so Danny and Dakota have been on their way to ALT and we do have confirmation that Danny is through ALT as of 6.01 p.m. He's only five minutes back of Jeff Colt. I feel like Danny Jones has gotten a second wind and I feel like he could move up still in this men's field. Dude is strong. Dude is very strong. Yeah. Yeah, looking behind him, we're going to be looking for Dakota Jones, Matthew Blanchard, Ryan Montgomery, and Cole Watson with Cody Lind knocking on the door of that top 10 group as well. We're going to get a split from Courtney at ALT in not all that long. She came through Greengate, mile 79.8 at 520 local time about 48 minutes ago. 
I imagine that we will actually be seeing her not in the not too distant future, potentially even passing Dakota in the process. We should start to see Tom Evans come through the Quarry Road aid station and a fun anecdote from there. That's been manned by the Rogue Valley Runners for many years, which is of course owned by two-time champion Hal Kerner. I saw Hal on Wednesday at the 100 Mile Happy Hour. Here's Courtney DeWalter coming into ALT. Uh, of course she is. Holy smokes, now sitting in seventh place overall. Courtney DeWalter still with the big smile, the smooth gait, and barely stopping. Oh my God. How do you compete with that? She's on a completely different level. I don't know how to do it. I don't know what to say. But as I was saying, <laughs> Tom Evans should be approaching the Quarry Road aid station here pretty soon. Again, manned by Hal Kerner and his team at the Rogue Valley Runners. And Hal said that Scott Jurek himself will be there volunteering at the aid station throughout the evening and into the night. A total of nine Cougar trophies between the two of them. Okay, Courtney DeWalter, what was our official split there? What do we have on the time from Courtney? We don't have the, they're really slow to update at Greengate. She came through, let's call it 6.09 p.m. She's too fast for the tracker is really what's happening here. But 6.09 p.m. would be about 13.10 elapsed. That's going to look like a solid... Yeah, I mean, she's she's an hour plus. She's 62 minutes ahead of, of course record time right now from Ellie Greenwood's split back in 2012 on her way to that outstanding 16 plus hour time. So she will likely run somewhere in the neighborhood of like 1540. Sick. Like, I don't know how that ever gets broken. I, Not to jump to conclusions yeah. here, but my God. So again, we are awaiting to see early leader and fan favorite Dakota Jones come here into ALT. He lost a lot of time on Cal Street, but he did successfully cross the river and it looked like he was gonna continue along the course here. Looks like he's continuing to lose some time back to the competitors behind him after going for it in the early miles and doing battle with Tom Evans, our current race leader through at least the first 100K of the course. Yeah, really, really curious to see if Tom's prediction is going to be correct. We do have a quarry road split, 90.7 miles in as of six minutes ago, 6.05 on the clock, 13.05 elapsed. He has less than 10 miles to go before we see Tom Evans potentially better his third place finish from 2019 to take the Cougar home to the UK with him. Unbelievable. We will likely <laughs> lay our eyes on him at least two more times, one at Pointed Rocks and one at the No Hands Bridge. And up at Roby. And then at Roby, yeah. So we'll see Tom Evans for much of his home stretch as he approaches the track here where Corinne and I will gladly greet him to do our finish line interviews. What an honor. As we continue to look at the Auburn Lakes Trail. This is the aid station at mile 85. We do not have cameras down at Quarry Road, mile 90, where we just got that update from Tom Evans. So now that Tom is through about seven minutes ago, we should probably get an update from Tyler Green. Last we saw Tyler was, I think, 22, 23 minutes behind Tom. Also still running strong himself. And if Tyler's able to wrap up a sub 16 hour performance for him, that would probably be his career best performance in a career that has a lot of great performances. 
And again, he was flying under the radar. There was no justification for him to be under the radar, but here he is proving his point again that he is truly one of America's best, especially over the 100-mile distance. Working, working, working. Yeah, if you guys are trying to make it to the track to see the to see Tom Evans finish, I'd start skedaddling on over here. Things are starting to heat up at the Pl Placer High School track. Photographers are gathering. We've got kids on the infield. We've got Here's people Matthew. with umbrellas in the stands at, at ALT. Matthew Blanchard through ALT in eighth place overall. Still no Dakota Jones. Yeah, so Dakota must be walking out there right now. He's clearly losing time. Again, Matthew is joined by his pacer, fellow Frenchman Thibaut Baronian. You see there with the red vest. Thibaut is one of the great athletes on the European short course circuit, competes in the Golden Trail World Series. Made his yeah. way over here to help his friend Matthew at Western States. Yeah, pretty cool. Pretty cool pacer dynamic duo there, I feel like. Yeah, Courtney DeWalter continuing to plug away. Currently in seventh position behind Danny Jones, ahead of Matthew Blanchard. I don't think we've seen Dakota Jones come through ALT, have we? We've not. Okay, so Dakota Jones, we are waiting for Dakota to make it to ALT again. That is mile 85.2. Tom Evans so far, the only man through Quarry Road. We expect him to have about a 22 minute lead or so over Tyler Green. Courtney DeWalter running away with this. And at the same time, Katie Scheid having a mega impressive run coming through Greengate at, at 5.54, 12.54 elapsed. Again, that's 20, 21 minutes faster than Ellie's course record time. Uh, here, here's Dakota now coming into ALT. He's now in ninth place. And he's picked Overall. up Pacer Peyton Thomas there, it looks like. Yeah. So Dakota still moving, even if he's fading a bit. Dakota, 15 miles to go here, sitting in ninth place overall, eighth male. Looking a little tired. That's to be expected after a solid 13-hour day on the course. Yeah, I think you're allowed, to, you're definitely allowed to be tired 85 miles deep into 100. Yeah, so those who are just tuning in, so I think some of the notable drops I would say include, we believe Heather Jackson. Yep, Heather Jackson officially. It looks like her DNF They've listed it as El Dorado Creek, but I feel like you got to get up to Michigan Bluff to get out of there. Um, Hayden Hawks, Zhao Zhizhou, Nicole Bitter, all kind of out of that group, out of that group that we expected to be in and around that top ten on both the men's side and the women's side. Who else is in that mix? We had some of the people get timed out. Remember, there were no cutoffs today at um, Lions Ridge or Red Star Ridge. Our first time cutoff came at Duncan Canyon, and I believe that is where a number of our Duncan Canyon drops come from, is that people were timed out at that location. So still and we have Ryan Montgomery coming in just behind Dakota's exit. Ryan Montgomery now in 10th place overall, ninth male. He's been solid all day, hasn't he? Yeah, I really feel like he's been kind of in the mix all day, trying to hold on for one of those top 10 spots. I think it's definitely something that he can do if he keeps on pushing. Having a pacer at this point is definitely going to be helpful in that regard to help get everyone down the trail. So 
So looking for updates from our women at the river crossing. Yep, Courtney is through ALT. If you guys missed that, she literally ran in and around, uh, ran out. I think she was there for all of 15 seconds, maybe. Literally, literally a run through, I think. Yeah, less than that even. I think she just poured some water over her head and kept going. Yeah, expeditious move through that aid station. Yeah, and we saw her do the same thing at the river crossing, right? No aid whatsoever, cross the river, likely got some aid from her crew on the yeah, other she, side. Yeah, she had she had runners come come down, and so I think that's where she had that aid going. But I think while we have a moment, we're going to take a quick commercial break. Stay right here. Is, uh, I got to think about this for a sec, actually. The box is kind of the place you go in a race where it's just you're working really, really hard. It just feels like the world's kind of tiny. All you have is your effort, your water and nutrition and like your watch telling you how far you have to go. You're going in the box whether you like it or not. Hi, I'm Tiffany and I'm here to tell you about the functional features of Gooder sunglasses. When Gooder says no slip, they're referring to a special grip coating to construct their frames to help eliminate slippage when sweating. When Gooder says no bounce, this means that their frames are snug and lightweight with a comfortable fit to prevent bouncing when crushing any workout. When Gooder says all polarized, they're referring to their glare reducing polarized lenses with UV 400 protection that blocks 100% of those harmful UVA and UVB rays. When Gooder says all fun, they're encouraging you to be unabashedly yourself, unless you're an asshole. I know what I'm talking about because I'm wearing a lab coat. Okay, we are back in studio here at the 2023 Western States 100 presented by Hoka. My name is Dylan Bowman, joined all day by Corinne Malcolm, and we have a special guest in studio here working out some audio glitches. Yeah, I don't think we have ears. No, that's oh. my mic. I hear it now. You hear now? Perfect. Yes, it's awesome. very loud. Yes, it, it is very, very loud. Okay. So we're joined right. in studio with Shelly. She's here in part with Rising Hearts and Goo Energy Labs for a land blessing for the land that we are holding Western States on. Shelly, if you would like to expand on anything for an intro, we're here to hear you. Great, thank you so much. Hamakani, everyone. Uh, my name is Shelly Covert, and uh, I am of Nisanon descendancy. So we are here in Nisanon homelands, and in previous years, um, we've received a land blessing and a welcoming to the runners from um, the Washoe side where the race starts and so to receive people here in the Nisanan territory on the end side of the race I think is really beautiful bookends to one another. Um, as we're talking about racing, you know, the runners in the tribes used to be of such incredible importance. That's how gossip got everywhere. You know, you've, your politics, your family information, whatever it is, danger, um, all came through our runners and they had, they held such a place of importance tribally and um, so much culture has been erased and that's not the world we live in anymore because we have the internet and everything, <laughs> telephones. So, um, but to, to see, especially native runners um, in a race like this really it just calls back to reminding myself of these pieces of culture that held such importance that may not be with us today but we can see it today and rep being represented in, in a whole different light and still harken back to the importance of that of that cultural bit that you know I would love to see more tribal runners it's it's fantastic yeah a hundred percent so um, what I would like to do uh, is just sing a song, um, and it is in the Nisinan language. And when I grew up, I was told our language was extinct, and yet I heard, you know, my grandma telling stories and different family members and tribal members speaking bits and pieces of it. And so I feel it's quite an honor to be able to sing um, a spiritual song uh, to bless this homeland where so many of our memories are and to welcome those runners and maybe bring some good energy and good luck to them. Amazing. Hey, you, you, where 
Vietnam, A U U Vietnam, A U U Vietnam, A U U Vietnam, A U U Pineta, Estumian im Yamenam, Le U Wheel, Le U Wheel, Le U Wheel, Le U Wheel, A U U Vietnam, A U U Vietnam, A U U Vietnam, A U U Vietnam, A U U Pineta, Estumian im Yamenam, Le U Wheel, Le U Wheel, Le U Wheel, Le U Wheel, A U U Vietnam, A U U Vietnam, A U U Vietnam, A U U Vietnam, A U U Pineta, Estumian im Yamenam, Le U Wheel, Le U Wheel, Le U Wheel, Le U Wheel, A U U Vietnam, A U U Vietnam. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Shelley. Thank that you so fantastic. much. That was fantastic. And to remember the ancestors and to bring good luck for the day. Thank you, Equa. Thank you so much for joining us. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so very much. We're going to return out to the river crossing where we're seeing Eden Nilsson and M.K. Sullivan make their way across the river. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Wow, Corinne, that was pretty powerful here in studio. And we do have... Some exciting news from the river crossing. We just saw Katie Asmith come through in third place last year's F9, who we've been talking about all day here. Katie Asmith crossing the river in third place in the women's race after a hard fought year dealing with injury, coming back from surgery. She actually broke her foot securing that F9 bib during last year's Western States endurance run. It's been a tough year for Katie Asmith, and she's putting together what could be a podium performance here today. Yeah, I've got to imagine that while this is what she hoped would happen and dreamed would happen, I, I have to imagine that even with her optimism and the joy that is so infectious that we know from Katie, she has to be, I have to imagine, to some degree outperforming her expectations a little bit. I don't know if that means she took pressure off of herself going in knowing I, I, she's not one to make excuses by any means but i just know what like what an absolute roller coaster she's been through over the last like year and even more so like the last like four months this looks like adam mary jumping in the boat here but it's still so close i mean we i don't know if we saw esther chilla get in the boat but showed that she was only one second behind katie asmith's split at Rocky Chucky, and then we did see Eda Nilsson get in the boat. Her split shows about two minutes behind Katie Asmith and Esther. So those three duking it out for that final podium position behind Courtney DeWalter and Katie Shad. Yeah, really. So someone just asked, has Cole Watson come through ALT? I don't. Speak of the devil. I know, I'm like, is that our Barracuda? That's the Barracuda. That's our Barracuda. Nice work, Cole Watson. All right, so where does that put him? 10th male still? I think so. I think he's right at that. My ultralive.net has like finally decided that there's too much going yeah, on. Yeah, mine here. too. We're losing all of our internet functionality at the track as people pour in here. Happens at some point to every watch, year. To watch Tom finish. This is, this is the time of day where it's going to start to fritz out for sure. Yeah, I, I have no internet connection. I think we finally have lost it on our personal computers, but I've got a phone, I've got Twitter. <laughs> we can make this happen. So I've got an iPad too. We've got, we've got more devices we've got, than you can shake a stick at. As we look back at Forest Hill, seeing some of our mid-pack runners in the mid, oh, I was gonna say mid-afternoon sunshine, but it's actually more like evening sun angles here in Forest Hill. It's almost 6.30 p.m. local time here in California, which means we are now 13 and a half hours elapsed into this year's Western States. And again, we are predicting that we should see men's champion Tom Evans arriving here at the track in just about an hour. Yeah, no, he is well on his way here. I'm gonna win a bet, I'm pretty sure. 13, 27, 21 on the clock. Emily Hoggood making her way down to the boat with Jeshrin Small in tow. She's run a gutsy, heart-filled race, and it's not 
over yet just yes there you go so remember rocky chucky is where emily kind of got stuck last year she ended up in a, in a seat for not very long because apparently she doesn't remember that but i distinctly remember being like emily get up you got to get up and so i feel like we we've got we're be things are going a little bit better there's taylor nowlin her teammate and good friend just Gosh, behind her they've been running basically within like a minute or two of each other it seems like for the entire 13 and a half hours they've been out there Yep, and I think that we have Zach Marion live at Pointed Rocks. We're going to throw it to him to see what's going what's going on out there. What's going on, guys? I'm out here at Pointed Rocks 94.3. This is the throwdown stage. If it's a close race at all, moves are going to be made right through here. So we're expecting race leader Tom Evans to be coming charging up the hill here. As you hit Pointed Rocks, you make your way down to the iconic No Hands Bridge. And then from there, it is only a couple miles up to Roby Point and then a few miles to that track. So he should be here very shortly is what we're expecting. But one thing I did want to ask you guys, Corinne, Dylan, how are you guys doing in that nice, cushy, plush <laughs> studio you got? You guys staying hydrated? You guys doing okay out there? I mean, yeah, we're pretty cozy in here, but our internet isn't working right now. Our I mean, I don't want to complain <laughs> about it. But. Yeah, our internet finally crashed. We made it to 6.30 before it went on the fritz this year, which I think is a record. Ethan Vosberg's here to fix our stuff for us. Ethan Vosberg, we have Well, I'll no tell internet. you what. We out here are crushing ourselves to bring you guys the most tantalizing tidbits, the most salacious gossip right here from the course. I want to give a personal shout out to two of our sponsors, Stoked Oats and the Goo Crew, Magda Boule and the Goo Crew over at Forest Hill for keeping us both hydrated and making sure that we had the sustenance to maintain all of this hard effort that we're doing out here. I will say, years past having run cameras, I have made it 30 miles on this course with several thousand feet of vert. It's not an easy job. And I have seen a few comments in the comment section, kind of giving us a little gruff at the, what we do here on the live stream. Let me tell you, it's not easy. We're out here working. We're treating ourselves like some of these athletes, but what we aren't doing is volunteering. Look behind me, we've got the Pointed Rocks aid station. These guys are crushing it. We have aid stations all throughout this course that are manned. There are 1500 volunteers out on this course, making sure that the athletes can do what they're doing. I can tell you right now, they wouldn't be out here if it wasn't for the athletes. But the athletes could not be out here if it wasn't for the volunteers. So huge shout out to all of them. Thank you guys for throwing to me here. We're going to keep an eye out for Tom Evans and some of the more exciting uh, paces and trades that might be happening here between Anthony and Tyler. I talked to their crew. Uh, it sounds like it's going to be a really fun race. So as soon as we get some updates, we'll bring it back out here from you guys. So thank you. Back to you guys. Thanks so much, Zach. I have breaking news from Liam, our aid station fireball. He just wanted to update that Katie Esther and Ida have now run even faster splits than Katie Scheid from Forest Hill to the river. So they now have the second to fourth all times. That is absolutely insane. You've got to remember that we already was, we were already talking about how Katie Scheid ran faster than, than um, Ann Trayson, faster than Ellie Greenwood. And now Katie, Esther and Ida have run even faster than that. Their splits from Forest Hill to the river are in the timeline of 226.37, 227.49, and 225.14. Besting Katie Scheid on that section, who ran a 232. So Katie Scheid is giving back a little bit of time on that section. But we got to remember, Courtney DeWalter, the GOAT, has run the eighth fastest time ever on that section in comparison to anyone who's ever run it. She was only three minutes behind Tom Evans on that section today. But guess what, folks? We have a special guest in studio with us. I can't see what's on our screen because they took our screens away. Can you see us? Can you see the man sitting next to me? Am I introducing anyone or is it a ghost? We are joined in studio by the 2022 champion, Adam Peterman here. Adam Peterman, we are witnessing history unfolding here on the Western States course yet again, every year keeps 
getting better, keeps us on our toes. Where you been all day and what are your reactions? Oh man, it's it's been unbelievable. Uh, yeah, I was at Forest Hill for most of the day and then down by the river, uh, saw Courtney go by and just came back here to see you guys. What was it like watching Courtney at the Did, river? Could you even see her go by? Did she just like, was, was she visible? It, I mean, she looked so fresh. Like <laughs> I had my hat on, my sunglasses, she recognized me and I was like in a crowd and like, she's just really coherent. Uh, I didn't see her wearing an ice bandana. We haven't seen her put ice on herself all day. Uh, I, mean, I don't even know if she really was sweating. Seen her stop at an aid station all day. We she she spent less than ten seconds at ALT. We're pretty sure she ran through as someone squeezed a sponge on her, and that was it. Yeah, she didn't stop at the aid station at the river. I mean, I'm assuming she went to Green Gate, but I don't know. Yeah, it's it's magic. I'm pretty sure. What do you think about Tom Evans, your British colleague here, coming back to? Western States after a couple year absence, and it looks like he's gonna throw down a super fast time too. Oh, he looked great. I mean, uh, is he about to run maybe 14.30, 14.35? We think about 14.30-ish, yeah. Yeah, and he he, call, he called it, right? He said to win, he thought someone had to go 14.28, and we're pretty sure he's gonna be pretty spot on. Oh man, I know, when he called that and he was looking at the variables like the snow and the conditions and even the temperature, I mean, you, you know when he calls it, he's probably talking, he's telling the truth. He's, he's put some thought into he's it. He's dialed, but yeah. oh, he looked great. He, he wasn't looked really messing good. with, he wasn't just messing with us, it turns out. No, it wasn't, it wasn't spray, it was, uh, yeah, he's telling the truth. So what sort of jumped out at you from hanging out at Forest Hill all day? Were you there just to see the leaders or you started to see some of the mid packers come through too? Yeah, we were there. Uh, you know, we saw Katie Scheid come through and then we went down to the river. So it was mostly the leaders, but it was cool. I mean, that's the first time I've been there as a spectator and uh, it's cool, all the energy and you see everyone come down and yeah, people, and it's crazy the difference, uh, you know, see, you see people at Forest Hill and they look pretty fresh and then some people at the river, they don't look the same. I mean, it's only They've about gone on 16 miles later, but it's been a voyage. Yeah, yeah, did you see Dakota Jones down at the river? After seeing him up at Forest Hill. Oh yeah, he looked he he looked a little tired for sure. Yeah, yeah we t I said I said Dylan, I think you're gonna be able to look into Dakota's eyes when he gets to the finish and like see into his soul because you yeah. both shared the same experience. He looked he was running fast at Forest Hill too. I mean he was right with Tom and oh. I I couldn't tell who was gonna who was gonna be and then you know at the river Tom looked really really fresh and Dakota I think had he sold out by that point. Well we heard from we heard that Dakota was like ru like rushing through Forest Hill and was like and like vocalized like I've got to break Tom right now type of thing as Tom stopped to change shoes and then we heard that when they saw Tom at the river he basically said I feel expletive good or he expletive amazing yeah. like at his crew and then like was across the river oh yeah he looked great he was yeah he was moving well and I someone I think uh, was looking at the splits and they said he was running like 720 pace uh, that was his split from Forest Hill to the river which that's fast sick fast that's, that's really very fast, fast. So I think his plan from Forest Hill to the river was to average I think with aid like 847 pace or something oh wow so they moved they moved fast yeah he was Crazy. moving really fast quick update from the course here we do have Tyler Green through Quarry Road mile 90.7 he is 24 minutes back of race leader Tom Evans he came through in 1329 a lap. So Tyler Green, I think, still on pace himself to finish under 15 hours here today. What do you think about Tyler, man? Here he is coming through for his third consecutive top five performance here at Western States. Flies under the radar, finished fourth, a little bit behind you last year. What do you have to say about him? Oh, man, I know every year he flies under the radar, and I don't know why. He's just such a humble guy, and I feel like he's never in our predictions, and he totally should be. Uh, and you know, you saw him this morning, he's through mile 10, I think in second place. And that's a different Tyler than I've ever seen at this race. I totally. mean, he was out aggressive for him and yeah, it's, it's paying off. He looked great at the river as well. Well, this is super cool to have you in studio with us as we wait to see Tom Evans come through the meadow here, this iconic golden stretch of trail through this quintessential California landscape. We should see him here any second. Corinne, do you remember seeing Adam Peterman come through here last year? I mean, I think we were losing our mind at this point of the race last year. We were like, oh my goodness, Adam Peterman's gonna do it. It was unreal. I mean, up until this point, there was no cell service. So I knew I was leading, but I didn't know how far it would be. And uh, I thought, I knew I thought Hayden was gonna catch me any second. But here I remember looking, uh, <laughs> saw my crew and they had service and they're like, you have 30 minutes on him. I had sunglasses on, but crying tears of joy <laughs> under those sunglasses <laughs> love it man. I was gonna say, so I've you never, knew you had it the, the only time i've ever been to this aid station during the like during daylight hours was a, a, like an, i was pacing a friend who had a bad day and 
we were coming through here for like a 28 hour finish, unfortunately. And so yeah. it was like the morning and they were like cooking up bacon and gave us donuts <laughs> for the road. It was great, but not exactly, you know, it's a different experience when you're finishing in that like 18 to 20 hour window. It's definitely it's dark, dark there and your crews are, your crews are being kind of sketchy, trying to give you information away from other people's crew as oh, you yeah. duke it out towards the finish. But yeah, like Tom Evans putting on, I think a classy performance here and then Right now, Courtney DeWalter just, does, she's not running out of her mind. Her running is causing us to be out of our minds, I think is what it boils down to. No, it's the perfect storm. I mean, you got her and crazy field and it's just a cold year. It's it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're, we're thinking that if she goes sub 16, that that record is like potentially untouchable. We're talking like Matt Carpenter-esque feeling mm -hmm. record in which there might be someone good enough to do that at some point, but then they're going to have to be good enough to do it on a day like this or better. Yeah. Have a live yeah, it's unbelievable. Sort of stand up around around in there. Yeah. And then she's that's why I'm like down here. Yeah, she's it's currently so like 62 minutes up little bit. on Ellie Greenwood's course record. Absolutely sick. That's insane. Yeah, you want to follow that Chris a little bit? Chris Brown told me that in 2019, <laughs> Courtney was running sub 16 hour pace before she dropped out. Oh, at the river? Yeah. Uh, and I was just like, I didn't know that. That yeah. did not occur to me. Yeah, and there's years, I mean, men, like the second place man might be over 16 hours and i know it oh, yeah. depends on the temperature yeah. but still it's it's unbelievable yeah absolutely yeah. really really and, and and not to put anything past katie shide who is you know in, in comparison to courtney you're like oh like katie's falling apart yeah. that's not yeah. the case yeah. at all like yeah. she's yeah. running well yeah. under course record pace no, I mean, and if you want to take it and, and track them on the bit. record i wonder yeah. as someone who is very talented and is gonna at least eventually go up against guys who you're gonna be you know jockeying with i know we're, we're missing you in the field this year but just like i don't know speak a little bit to this idea of like katie shad's likely going to go under course record pace and still not win this thing yeah it's tough like actually uh i was talking about this the other day with someone they asked me if i would rather win western states in like a slow time or maybe podium <laughs> and be like under the course record and i think i mean I think I would rather podium and be under the course record because it just shows like what an athlete you are. And I mean, it probably means you're going to win in the future. Come on, dude. I'll you know? take that cougar trophy. How about off like your one hands, of both? Buddy? Like one of both, you know, like yeah, one, one, of both. Like That's one year perfect. where you get a cougar, one year where you, you, you lose, but you break for the sure. course record. No, I wouldn't want to be like 10th and go under the course record. But if you were like second, I think I could deal with that <laughs> yeah. for sure. But Quick yeah. update here. Anthony Castales now through Corey Road himself. He's a little over five minutes back from Tyler Green, so Anthony Costal is still putting together a fantastic. But he's himself. he's closing on Tyler yep. Green. Like I'm yeah, pretty Ty sure Tyler I, looked like he was struggling a little bit there. Tyler at had ALT. ten. Tyler had ten minutes at ALT. Is that right? I'm pretty sure. Uh oh. And Anthony, when he smells blood, that dude can shred. Yeah, well, I think he smells blood because I'm pretty sure it was ten or eleven minutes at ALT, and is now if it's down to five. Hey, he, we we were he just might run out of ground. Oh, it sounds like we may have an update from Zach here at Pointed Rocks. Let's go down to Zach. Hey, guys, still out here at Pointed Rocks, mile 94.3. We're expecting Tom Evans to come through any moment. We have gotten word that he has crossed Highway 49 a few minutes ago, so he should be making his way up through here. Uh, I did talk to Tyler Green's crew and Anthony Castales' crew both. Um, it looks like it is going to be a fun duke out between the two of them. Um, you know, Tyler Green wanted to come out and prove that there should be some respect on his name, that he's not too old, that he doesn't always play it safe. And he threw down today, and we're seeing that happen. Anthony Castales also running with a chip on his shoulder, being a free agent, as we've liked to hashtag on that. So he's out here trying to prove himself today as well. And I think there's something about that, wanting to prove yourself, having that little extra grit to your day. And I think it's playing out really well for both Tyler Green and Anthony Costello. So it's going to be really fun to watch those two. As you've mentioned, Anthony is closing on Tyler a little bit. Both of them have incredible flat speed, which is what you're going to get off the descent here. And then it is a runner's race to the track. We're expecting Tom Evans to come through here any moment. We're hoping that he found his way from Highway 49 here, uh, but we should be expecting to see him any moment. Still shooting for that, 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 that 14, 28, 14, 30 range that he already called out. Um, he is, he said big words and he's, he's matching those big words. Sweet, thanks for the update there, Zach. Adam, another thing I'd love to hear you chat about briefly while we wait for Tom to come through is we saw your buddy Jeff McGavro get in the boat with Jeff Colt. 
He accompanied you on the last 20 miles last year. He was telling me all about it. You didn't walk a step in the final Rumor 20 miles, it. he said. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about Jeff and his pacing ability. You can still oh, man, find yeah, Jeff's Jim a good friend of mine uh, up in Missoula. We trained together. Uh, he's with On now last year with Hoka, so we were teammates and pacing me in for the last 22. And, oh, man, he, he crushed it. Like, you know, he he let me lead. He kept me on track. He was telling me to eat, just keeping it simple and keeping it encouraging. And, yeah, I think uh, Jeff Colt's in really good hands. And this is a big day for him. I mean, what, is he going to be fourth or fifth probably? It's He's crushing it. Yeah. We're, that's what we're hoping for, m improving on that 11th from last year. I think the split was at Forest Hill. He was an hour ahead of where he was last year. Oh, man, yeah, he's, he looked really good. He's he's definitely leveled up, and, yeah, yeah. We saw thanks him to great coaching. Yeah, we saw him sitting in a chair <laughs> for a little bit coaching. at ALT, and that, that, like, coach in me is texting his entire crew being like, get him get out, out of the there. chair. Yeah. Looks like uh, Corey Woltering here in Forest Hill. Nice. Good to have Corey Woltering Corey. back at Western States again. So Adam, maybe give the people a quick update of your status here. Obviously you didn't join us here today due to injury. I'm sure people would love to whatever extent you want to reveal how you're doing. No, for sure. Yeah, it's a, it's a bummer for me. So Western States was going to be like my big race for the year. I intentionally didn't race very much since World, which was in November. Um, but I ended up, I was having some like lower ab and adductor pain for a lot of the spring, you know, February uh, through April and May. Uh, but it turned into like pretty severe back pain one day, just over one run. So got an MRI and turned out I had a sacral stress fracture, which uh, is pretty tough news for me. You know, like I've only had one other bone injury and. Hey, quickly, we're going to cut down to Zach as we see men's race leader, Tom Evans coming through. Tom, good job, buddy. You're crushing. Tom. This is basically mile 96 i believe here yeah but the, like you saw the the look on tom's face right and he's, like the very limp high five to zach marion he's he's in it right he's now. in the box he's in the box yeah for sure <laughs> in the tom box is in the box taking some swings <laughs> right now he knows it he feels it he knows he's got to back up those words he said earlier he is dropping a vest hey zach get up next to him if you can we'd love to watch his transition here Love it. He is stripping down, getting ready. Heck yeah. He looks great. Come on, Tom. I wouldn't say he Nobody. looks great, but he's definitely still moving here. It reminds me two years ago, I remember Walmsley came through here, sat down in a chair for like five minutes. And we were like, what is going on? He, and then he popped up he and he ran an, away. He had an 80 minute lead at that point. He sat and drank his. Pellegrino and then got on his yep. way to run another sub 15 hour performance here. Zach, tell us what you saw. Tom, you guys saw that look on Tom's face. He is in the batter's box taking swings right now at anything coming his way. And he knows what he has to do to reach the goal that he set. And he is willing to reach deep down to that pain cave. He's willing to go in and redecorate that pain cave right now in order to get to that finish in that goal that he set. He's a tough minded individual with that military background. Once he sets a goal, he's going to do anything it takes to get there. And he's doing exactly that. His transition through here was stripping down, dropping a vest, picking up a bottle and getting out here. We've got all sorts of fun people in the background today waiting for their runners to come through. That was Tom Evans on the pace that he wanted to be on. It looks like Highway 49 isn't going to take another leader's soul today. I, rumor has it Jim Walmsley's spirit is still wandering 49 somewhere, but not Tom Evans. He's making his way out to Placer High. Amazing. Thank you so much, Zach. I'm looking at our friendly guest, Adam Peterman, splits here. It looks like you split between Pointed Rocks and the finish line about 56 minutes. So we are now Perfect under an timing. hour until yeah, we yeah. see 2023 likely champion Tom Evans arrive here on the track. So you are not going to want to go anywhere. I think he's going to be a little bit slower than that 1428, yeah. but I think he's going to sneak under that 15 hour mark. Which means so he will likely run. I win a bet. The fourth or fifth. Well, yeah, he will likely run about the fourth fastest time ever. But then, yeah, the fourth, fifth, and sixth fastest times are all super Is that punched up. Priscilla Forgy on the ground there. Yeah, that's Priscilla there. That Pris must be the river crossing. Mm. Yeah, it must be. I don't ever think I've been on that side of the rope at the river crossing. I avoided it, generally speaking. I was like, let's get in the water. Let's get out of here. 
But yeah, Priscilla Forgey again, she got a golden ticket at Canyons Endurance. Kind of a big surprise behind Ida Nilsson. Um, wasn't on many people's radars. We didn't know who she was early in the race, and she ran in second the entire day. Basically, her and Ida went one, two, wire to wire, and uh, is likely going to run her way into a top 10 here today, or just outside the top 10, maybe. We do think that Priscilla Forgey currently in eighth. Keely Henninger's tracker, I think, is having an issue because we do actually think that she's closer to Taylor Nowlin than that, possibly. Also, Leah Yingling's tracker has been all sorts of messed up today, so I'm not going to trust anything until I have eyes on people. Here's Megan Morgan arriving at the river here. 25-year-old ascendant star out of Boulder, Colorado, being paced by Amelia Boone. Here at the river crossing, there's Bailey Kowalczyk, her friend, crewing for her there as well. Another great up-and-coming athlete also from the Boulder area. Yep. So that is a great team there for Part, Meg Morgan. Yeah, the Boulder Buds getting it done today. Meg will have Riley not that far back from where she has, is at right now. Excited to see what the Boulder Buds can get done today. This might be, I don't know if they're going to do a pacer exchange here or not, or if they're going to do it across the river. My guess is if she's exchanging a pacer, it's going to happen right now. So it doesn't look like we have any other updates. Oh, yeah, we do. Okay, so Shen went through Quarry Road 10 minutes back of Anthony Castales. No update yet from Jeff Colt, who we expect to be in fifth position. Coming up quickly behind him will be Dan Jones from New Zealand, along with the legend Courtney DeWalter, who last we saw was sitting in seventh overall position at ALT. Yeah, we've got... It doesn't sound like Keeley has come in to that checkpoint yet. Uh-oh. Yeah, it makes me a little bit worried. There's Leah Yingling. So her tracker is so far accurate. She's going to be rounding out that top 10, but we think that that means that Jenny Quilty and Keely Henninger are going to be just outside the top 10 potentially coming into the river crossing here. We're going to wait to get confirmation on what's going on from Keeley's team or from someone else out on course. So but that's what we're worried about right now. Yeah, and this is increasingly worrying because according to ultralive.net at Cal 3, Keeley had a 24 minute lead on Leah Yingling. So in case, in, 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 I guess if we haven't missed Keeley at the river, that means that she's given up at least 24 minutes on Leah. Yeah, which is- In five miles. Massive. Yeah. Uh -oh. Meg Morgan trundling down to the boat and she's going to be joined by Priscilla. I think this is the first time we've had double athlete, double yeah. pacers in the boat today. We thought it was going to be a complete cluster at the boats because we had we had six women, three, four, five, six, seven, and eighth place all within two minutes for much of the day. It's been a little bit chaotic. Yeah, when I, when I was down there, it was looking great. I think they have they must have multiple boats. You couldn't you couldn't see them all lined up, but I would imagine they have they at were least two of them. They were just rolling through juggling. them, juggling. Yeah, it was great. You know what? We got to get an update from the women through Green Gate. I'm going to text Ted Knutson real quick because that pack should be at least through Green Gate now, and we yeah. don't have that. Yeah, and update that should yet. be a pack that includes Katie Asmith, Esther Chillog, Eden Nilsson, and Emily Hoggood. We do know that they are all well up towards Green Gate. We also know we did actually see Taylor Nowlin go through just behind Emily Hoggood as well. So that group of women between third and seventh should be up in that Green Gate zone. How about the vibe here at the finish line? We now have at least a few hundred people here at the track, probably more like over a thousand of people distributed around the infield here and in the stands. Adam, does this bring back memories, buddy? Oh, for sure. Yeah, walking down here, uh, like that last half mile down the road and entering the track, it's, yeah, hollowed grounds. It was, yeah, a little bittersweet to be walking it and not racing it, but it's a super special moment. Yeah, I'm sure Definitely it is spot. for you, man. I'm sure it's tough to return here without being able to compete, but you're a great champion and you're a young man. You got a long, long future ahead I guess of you. So. Yeah, let's hope so. Yeah, yeah, hopefully hopefully next year. Yeah, hopefully next year. No yeah. doubt. We'll see you back. You'll see me back. There's a golden I'm inspired. ticket in your future. That's the goal. Yeah. Once I'm back, that'd be the goal. But uh, yeah, one step at a time. One, Literally one step at a time. Yep. Are you, what is your current clearance of exercise? 
Uh, it's been six weeks off right now, and so probably six weeks more off, but I get to start biking next week, so that, that'll yeah. help keep my sanity for sure. That'll feel good. It's Montana summer. I feel like if you can just start hiking, if they let you, let you start hiking, you'll be a happy camper. For sure. Update, Daniel Jones has passed Jeff Colt, now <gasps> arriving at Quarry Road in fifth place overall. Oh, be still my heart. Oh, no. Come on, Jeff. Come on, Jeffy. He was looking so solid at the river crossing. No, but then we saw him sat at that chair at ALT, and it just broke my heart in half. So I right mean, this now. race is just so freaking hard, man. I mean, you arrive at ALT, you still 15 miles to go. You've gone 85, and at that point, it's sort of like you got to be on the gas pedal. Otherwise, people are coming up by it. I mean, we were just talking about how Jared Hazen last year arrived sure. in third place and never left the aid station. For sure. Yeah. And even, you know, like, I know we all do this because we love racing, but, man, when it comes down to the last 10 miles and it's you've run 90, that's uh, oh. a, a tough, tough spot to be in for anyone. Yeah, and it's like the difference in paces just really start to, like, evaporate at that point, I feel like, or, think, or, or at least get heightened mm -hmm. more than anything. You're going to start to hear stuff over the loudspeaker behind us. The smooth the baritone voice of Tropical John Medinger. Which won't be clear enough for you to actually understand anything he's saying on the live broadcast, but you're going to hear it the entire time. As we see Keely Henninger arriving at the river here. She's probably in 11th place now. Is she covered in dirt? Hard to tell. Come on, Keely. It looked like maybe she had taken a tumble. Oh, no. So I think Keely is now in 11th place in the women's race. Indeed, she is. We have an update from her. Looks like almost three minutes back of Leah, yeah, whatever look, that timing mat like is. Something's going on there. That wasn't 100% like some Keely. Keely movement. I couldn't tell if she was covered in dirt or what was going on. Adam, what are your other responsibilities here at the finish line? This is it. Yeah, then I'm just cheering people on. Yeah. You got a dinosaur suit stashed somewhere? Oh, man, I wish. That would be crazy. Right? I love dinosaurs. But no, just cheering on my friends, teammates. Got to check on it. How's Adam Mary doing? Adam Mary, the, the like Boulder boys. He's like He's moving. Perfect. Yeah. We watched him kiss his baby earlier. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, think, I think he's having, having a day. Yeah. But I like we've seen him a number of times, and at no point has he looked like disgruntled or or down by any means. Oh, yeah. He's just work working it, you it know. First hundred too, you know. It's update update about Keeley from Addie Thompson out on the course. It says Keeley just fell flat and dislocated her shoulder. Steps from the Rucky Aid Station. We all watched her go down. Bleep. Period. <laughs> Oh, Jeez. Oh my goodness. It looked like she was actually holding her shoulder a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it looked it looked like it looked like she was holding her left shoulder really mm -hmm. close to her body. She could oh. kind of sling it through her pack if she's got a pack with her. Oh, so that hurts so badly. So that text came through 11 minutes ago. So it could be that she's Keely, been sitting she's at been that sitting aid, at station. aid station for a while. Her crew will sure. her crew's at Green Gate. Oh my goodness. Heart goes out to Keely Henninger, one of the race favorites coming into today. She has put everything oh, into this performance brutal. here today. I mean. Oh, my heart just like left my body. Yeah, it's brutal. And then your crew is not even at the river. You still have to get yeah, up the Yeah, see, green they've gate. got her arm oh, under, her, under her life jacket. Yeah. She's going full Killian from like the, the 2016 hard rock. hard rock. Okay, so we do, we've got confirmation that Keely dislocated her shoulder just just above just above Rocky Chucky. Oh, we got a thumbs down from Keely. Keely, you don't you can't hear us at all, but we I'm, love you. We love you. And my heart hurts so badly for you right now. And I have to imagine her that like oh, particularly if you don't have like a lot of joint laxity and it's not like a shoulder that just pops out on you all the time. That is. A rude awakening. Oh, it's so pain. Yeah. And you still have 22 miles to go. Yeah, I wonder. She's got Her crew is up at, um, it's up at Green Gate where Jeff Stern is supposed to pick her up. And I wonder if that's a walk up to Green Gate to, to get into their vehicle. Yeah, maybe. Um, or if that's a walk to the finish. We got a big thumbs down from Keeley as she got into the boat. So Keeley out of that top 10 chase. Running is going to hurt real, real bad. I don't know that she's going to walk it in with her shoulder like that. That seems a bit extreme. Um, so my guess is that she's going to go meet up with her crew up at Greengate where she's going to see 
uh, probably JT, her fiance, and Jeff Stern, who's supposed to pace her. There's, that's, no, I was like, that's not Jeff Stern. That's JT. Hmm. And I wonder if JT knows if they were able to communicate across from Rocky Chucky there. Because he's, com he's come down to bring her up into the aid station. She was just right at the aid station is what the text said. That yeah, like stuff. right above the aid station. Honestly, getting up this next section is probably going to be one of the hardest parts because it's like very sandy, as it's you really probably steep. remember. Yeah, yeah, you hop onto that double track and it's a lot better, but there's, yeah, a minute there where it's steep. Okay, so while we, we watch Keeley get help getting out of this life jacket, we're going to quickly throw to a quick commercial break before we come back to do a... Recap of the top 10 men and women, and then wait for Tom Evans to make his way here to the finish line at the Placer High School we track. We should see Tom go over No Hands Bridge here pretty soon, too, but we'll go to a commercial break now. Hey everyone. I'm Jared Smith, product line manager for Hoka Performance Footwear, and I'm here to talk to you about trail running shoes. So as we've expanded the Hoka trail lineup, we found a great opportunity and a need from our trail runners in the racing space and those looking for something that's highly responsive, lightweight, and incredibly propulsive. And that's where the Tectonics came from. Let's break down what's going on in the shoe from the ground up. So from the outsole or the rubber aspect of the shoe, we've used Vibram Mega Grip, which is the best compound we found for our trail shoes. We used a four millimeter lug to ensure that you're getting the right amount of grip, but nothing that's too overly technical, providing good traction on both wet and dry terrain. Moving on up, we have a dual density midsole. So there's two different foams, one that is close to the ground, that is highly responsive and very durable, that really is propulsive and adds to the overall performance of the shoe. And one that's directly under the foot, that's a little bit softer and more cushioned. So you have this great step in feel, very comfortable for those long miles. In between that sandwich is two parallel carbon fiber plates, which really add that propulsive element to the shoe. So moving into the upper, we really wanted to focus on several things to make sure that this was exactly what you need and nothing more out on the trail. So we looked for something that was lightweight, durable, breathable, and hydrophobic, which essentially means it doesn't take on water, isn't gonna add weight, or add any extra bulk. When we're talking about the toe box or the front part of the shoe here, we've added a small cutout of where the laces end to provide a little bit more accommodation so that your toes can splay or spread out. I mean, we want happy toes and happy feet. And then the eye row here is really where the laces go through and help lock the foot into the upper. I run and race in this a lot. Uh, I think the overall experience in this shoe is fun, lively, and propulsive. You definitely feel race ready as soon as you toss this on. So this entire package, in my opinion, is the best that you could have for a high performance trail racing shoe. Okay, we are back in studio as we watch Keely Henninger walk up towards Green Gates after reports are coming in from the course that she has dislocated her shoulder. So our heart goes out to Keely Henninger from Portland, Oregon, one of the race favorites coming into the day today. She's had some bad luck on this course. Yeah, it's it's absolutely brutal. She ran a brilliant 50 miles last year, but rolled her ankle quite a few times between mile like 49 and 55 and ended up having to drop at Michigan Bluff. She fell just outside the Rocky Chucky aid station you know, 15, 20 minutes ago, sat there, I think had, had medical eval, was put in the boat to go across to her crew. She's currently walking up the hill with, with that entire crew, including her fiance JT there on her, on her left-hand side. Absolutely devastated for Keeley today, not the day that she wanted. She had such a brilliant Black Canyon yeah. back in February to qualify for this. Just a world-class performance. Her, me her medical school applications were all accepted and approved of earlier this week. So she got the green light. She just has to wait for interview requests. Poor Keeley. So further along the course, we do have updates from Quarry Road. Jeff Colt, our sixth place runner, did come through 
at 1356 elapsed, but he was only 21 seconds ahead of the GOAT. Courtney DeWalter now closing in on the top six, which we haven't seen done, according to Liam, since Nikki Kimball did it way back in 2006, I think it was. A woman finishing in the top six. Incredible. So again, we should see Tom Evans pretty soon crossing the famous No Hands Bridge. Here's John Ray on the right-hand side coming in to the ALT aid station. Yeah, we think that, say, so say we think that Tom's going to run 14.45 or so. What does that put him on the overall? Is that, like, is that like fifth fastest? So good question. So Jim Walmsley ran 14.46.01. Tim Olson ran 14.46.44. Ooh, so it's going to be tight. And then Rob Craw ran 14.48.59. And what, what are those over in the overall? Those are four through six. Okay, so he will, will likely... It'll likely Fault. be somewhere in the mix. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, so we are likely 40 minutes away from seeing the men's champion, Tom Evans, arriving here at the Placer High School track in beautiful Auburn, California. The vibes are strong here on the football field. Families having fun, throwing footballs, kicking soccer balls, lounging in the beautiful sunshine on a quintessentially lovely California evening here. Unseasonably cool temperatures. It's probably about 80 degrees Fahrenheit as we look at No Hands Bridge here on the left side of our screen waiting for Tom Evans to cross. Yeah, wow, things are absolutely clipping along, Courtney. As I said, Courtney's not running out of her mind. Her running is making us go out of our minds. It's, as Adam Peterman said, she looked completely fresh, spry, like she hadn't even sweat, making it look easy out there. The, the best always do, right? The best always make it look easy. Yeah. I mean, it is crazy, though. I mean, she's had so many of these just transcendental performances, right? Like thinking back a couple years ago at UTMB when she broke Rory Bozio's record. Rory Bozio's record had stood, I think, for almost 10 years at that point. Courtney came and made quick work of that on a longer, harder course. Then she broke the course record at Hard Rock. She smashed the course record at the Diagonal de Fou. And now here she is. We got Alex Nichols on our screen right now. Yeah. Alex Nichols, somewhere in around the top 30 right now. It's good to see him continuing to cruise along. I'm sure he had ambitions of doing much better here today. Yeah, we. Lo it looks like you know. Yeah, Courtney talking about moving into the overall. She has, she's right with Jeff Colt, about 20 seconds behind him at Quarry Road in sixth and seventh position overall. We're waiting for Matthew Blanchard, Dakota Jones, Ryan Montgomery, Cole Watson, and Cody Lind to make their way through that position, as well as Janusz Kowalczyk, Arlen Glick, Ludo Pomeray. Then we expect in 16th position overall, our second place female, Katie Scheid, we're waiting for a split for her from, from ALT still, and that'll be interesting to see the ALT split between her and Courtney and actually just between Katie and Ellie's course record time and then see what's happening in that chase pack. So this is, like, is... Is that Jenny Quilty That's there? Jenny Quilty, our other, our other Canadian. Looks like she may have had a, a tough stretch there on the Cal Street section. She definitely faded further back from her it, friend. It and eats Canadian. people up yeah, in a big definitely way. Definitely does. We've talked about it much of the afternoon. I think I've felt. I think I've gotten fortunate. Cal Street was always an area where I felt good, but maybe that's I didn't because I didn't stick my neck out far enough before that position. But yeah, it is. It can be an absolutely brutal section of the race. 
So we don't have splits from past events so that we can estimate Tom's arrival here at No Hands Bridge, but I would guess it should be any minute now because basically from No Hands Bridge, it's about a 5K to the finish line with a bit of an uphill. So you expect probably about a 30 minute split from No Hands Bridge to the finish. So we should start to see Tom Evans here any second crossing the bridge. So we are now 14 hours, seven minutes into the Western States 100. It's been an absolutely phenomenal, historic, beautiful day here between Olympic Valley and Auburn, California. Corinne and I went live on set here at 4.15 a.m. Can't even do the math anymore. I think that's at whatever, 15 hours ago at this point. And it has just been an absolute joy and a blast to help host this broadcast again for the third year in a row. A big shout out to the massive production team, to Billy Yang, Ethan Vosberg, Kevin and the studio crew for all their help in making this possible. Feels like we took a bit of a step forward here today and we appreciate everybody for hanging with us. Yeah, I feel like it's kind of wild that we've been here since 3.30. Yep. And somehow it's 7 p.m. It's like I looked at my computer and then I looked up and the entire day had gone by and it's kind of freaking me out. There's our BTS crew in the production truck. Skylar Hall's in there. He's going to come on stage here when Corinne and I go down to do the finish line interview. So you'll be joined by Skylar Hall pretty quickly here. Certainly a fan favorite on the broadcast today and everywhere he goes. It looks like we've... Mm, no, I don't have a split at Ruby Point yet. Tom Evans pointed rocks. We should, we're still waiting at No Hands Bridge. <laughs> I'm like freaking out. Don't do that to me, chat. That was uh, funny Crazy. as we all watched Tom come through pointed rocks with Adam Peterman. <laughs> he just said, he's in the box right he's now. He's in the box. You he could just in tell. The box. Okay, so it sounds like we likely somehow just briefly missed Tom at No Hands. It looks, sounds like he came through No Hands Bridge three minutes ago, 7.06 on the clock. He's got basically one climb between him and Roby Point that he needs to get through. He's got some flat running. He's got that climb up to Roby Point, and then he needs just to get his butt from Roby Point to the track. There's one kind of, in my mind, stupid climb between Roby Point and where we're sitting right now. All right, we're going to cut to Zach right away here. Zach, go ahead. What is going on, guys? Back here at Pointed Rocks, mile 94.3, where we're expecting Tyler Green to crest the hill over here as he comes through the valley, making his way off of Highway 49, up this little climb to Pointed Rocks. He's going to come in here. He's going to pick up his wife, Rachel Drake. She is going to pace him to the finish, and I can... I can attest, having a partner run you to that finish line, nothing gives you a greater energy burn, a little reserved than that. So we're going to see him come to this aid station. We will follow him, show you what he's doing through here, and watch him take off. Here we go. Coming in with his pacer, Justin Grunewald. Here we go. Nice work, guys. Get it, buddy. Coming in focused, he is ready to throw down. Not much of a gap between him and Anthony Castalis. He's dropping vests. He's asking for more water. Gosh, so, so good. Tyler Green, the consummate professional. The 100 mile executor joined by his wife and fellow professional athlete, Rachel Drake, over the course of the last five miles of the course. A pretty special thing. Yeah. He got to drop off Justin Grunewald, pick up Rachel. The smile on his face when he came in and saw her. I mean, I'm, 
you know I'm an emotional guy, and it's hitting me right in the feels. Uh, it's just a beautiful moment. He is ready and excited to throw down. He saw her. He smiled. He got excited for these last final miles. And I don't know a lot of runners who are running this pace, running this effort, who are excited to run five more, and he looks like he's doing it. So we're going to go keep an eye out for Anthony Castellas. Hey, going to throw it back to you guys. We'll give you guys a heads up. Yes. Hey, hey Zach, Billy had a great idea. Go get a word with Justin Grunewald because it seems like he pulled a great shift there for Tyler. Let's let's go find him. If he's not, there he is, right here. Justin, we're gonna chat with you. A little. Billy wants us to chat with you a touch. How was it those miles with him? You took him from Forest Hill all the way here. Yeah, yeah. Tell me how that was. I mean, he's a machine. Like, no one better to learn from, unless I guess maybe Jim was here, but maybe that's not realistic. So, just perfect. Every aid station, every mile, and ran strong. What was his attitude coming through uh, each aid station? Was he improving on attitude? Was he was he draining at points? Did you see him have to rally? Tell me about that. Yeah, I mean, overall, just stayed calm, collected, and in and out. I think we caught Dakota's the only runner we saw. Anthony, it sounds like, was charging. We saw the Chico boys, so now Rachel gets to bring him home. His stoke was high to run with Rachel and go see his son, Luke. Awesome. Thank you so much, Justin. Thanks for pacing him out there, getting him here. And it sounds like we've got Anthony Castellas on his way. The Chico boys, if if this is true, if we've got Anthony here, that tells me that he ate up a few more minutes and he is moving. Oh ready my to go. Here goodness. we go. Anthony, here he comes right here. Let's watch this aid station. Oh, Followed by his goodness. friend Jimmy Elam, another crusher from Salt Lake. Let's Gosh. go, buddy. Come on, let's go. I love it both is... Anthony and Tyler so much. This is so hard right now. Dude, he is such a tough dude, man. I mean, so think about the difference here between You've... Tyler just passing directly through the aid station and here Anthony Casales taking an extra minute or two this could ultimately be the difference between second and third place here anthony has made up fairly significant time since alt he's made up probably eight or nine minutes on tyler green he's got like four miles to go to try and earn a second place finish here today oh my jimmy's pacing it was paced him the whole way too that is bonkers how incredible is this, Karim? We just had Tyler Green exit with his wife, Rachel Drake, to cover these final five miles. And now we have Anthony Castales hot on his heels, trying to make the pass in the closing miles of the Western States 100. It's going to be a battle all the way to the track. Anthony ate up a few minutes from the last checkpoint to this checkpoint. He only had about, it was less than two minutes um, from when he got into the aid station. He did take longer. He knew he was taking those few extra seconds. He knows he needs to rehydrate, refuel. He was asking for a Coke and watermelon. He was getting doused and they had business all over that face. There was nothing other than, I am going to shred this last five. He gave himself a solid minute in that aid station took off jimmy gave me a little bit of a wink as he passed by like we are going to do this so it's anybody's race at this point two minutes for the next five miles six miles is not a strong enough cushion to sit back and just coast it in it's going to be a race and i'm i'm so jealous i'm not at the track to see it thank you so much zach what an awesome update there for the pointed rock aid station of that beautiful iconic golden meadow there five miles outside the finish line as we cut back towards roby point here as we expect to see men's champion tom evans crest the hill shortly and when he does he will have just over a mile until he arrives here at the finish line it usually takes the leaders 10 to 12 minutes from when they get off of the dirt onto the pavement to when they arrive here on the track and again and the adoring fans it's two to Heim. three minutes between tyler and anthony right now again tyler green portland oregon nike runner anthony castales part of that salt lake city group unsponsored wearing that chico state singlet he started in an sf giants t-shirt this morning what a dude so as you said, Corinne, Anthony was a full eight minutes back of Tyler at ALT at mile 85. He's now, what, two, maybe two and a half minutes back at mile 95. So that means he 
made up about six minutes over the course of 10 miles. So it's gonna be a nail biter here for the second and third positions. Certainly Tyler is not one to give up now. Yeah, no, it's gonna be a battle. And my question is too, like, if, if Anthony can close it, like, will Anthony have enough room to close that down? Tyler has to know Anthony's back there. Or is this the, like, that is, like, so close to the, like, Claire Gallagher, Brittany Peterson rumble? Or is it going to be, like, the Camilla Mayfield, um, Caitlin Gerben, stealthy pass at the track? Like, that was bonkers. We could be having some sort of crazy sprint finish for second and third. I mean, Tyler was sprinting after Arlen on the track last they year. They were both too. on the track at the same yeah. time. It was silly. Goodness gracious, this game just keeps getting more competitive and more exciting as we have an awesome drone aerial shot looking down on Auburn, California, the endurance capital of the world in the home of the finish of the Western States 100 mile endurance run celebrating its 50th year, the oldest and original 100 mile trail race on planet Earth. Yeah, it is really, really cool. Jilzy's asking, how fast is Tyler's wife? Rachel Drake? Oh, you mean Rachel? Very fast. You mean Rachel Drake, the woman who's won the Golden Trail Series before? She's pretty fast. Yes. She is like eight months postpartum, but she raced the Golden Trail Series, or the, the Broken Arrow, which is a North American Golden Trail Series race last weekend, ran the 23K there, is building back postpartum. She's, she's pretty fast. No question about it. I love what Justin said, too, about Tyler just saying, the dude's an animal. Every aid station was perfect. He's solid all day. Couldn't say it better myself. Shout out to Justin Grunewald for pulling that great shift with Tyler Green. We're going to cut to a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. For me is, uh, I got to think about this for a sec, actually. The box is kind of the place you go in a race where it's just, you're working really, really hard. It just feels like the world's kind of tiny. All you have is your effort, your water and nutrition and like your watch telling you how far you have to go. You're going in the box, whether you like it or not. Okay, we are back in studio and we are waiting for Tom Evans currently at the front of the men's race. Again, it's not over till it's over, but Tom is making a solid, a solid case to win this race today. He's gonna be cresting over the top of Roby Point, and then he's gonna be following those blue Western States footprints through the neighborhood, across the white bridge, down to the track, and then run a nice little 300 meter jog around the track into the finish line. Currently 14.20 on the clock. Tom had predicted it would take 14.28 to win this race. We think he's gonna be a little bit slower than that, but still well under the 15 hour mark if he keeps on moving. That lower right hand corner on the screen, that is Roby Point. That is where you exit the dirt for the final time and put your feet on the asphalt for the final mile or so to the track here. We should see Tom coming through that blue Hoka arch any second now. And once he does, he will have adoring fans from the neighborhood here at Roby Point. The Auburn local community always comes out to celebrate the Western States runners. This is a core part of the fabric of this local community. Tom Evans coming from the UK and he will live in Western States history. Not entirely sure what we're looking at here on the left. Yeah, we've got Ariel. Oh, is that that's Ariel of Roby Point? Sick. Yeah. So we're looking at it from the top and from on the ground there. So yeah, I do recall that this climb. It's, I think it's like six or seven hundred feet. It feels like it's more like sixteen or seventeen hundred feet. It's a big climb. It's a really, really painful climb. And again, men's course record is not up for grabs right now, but Tom is looking at potentially running one of the, you know, somewhere between maybe fourth and sixth fastest time ever here. He'll be bettering his 
um, previous time by probably 10 or so minutes is my guess, 10 to 12 minutes maybe. He Remember he ran a 14.59 here back in 2019 where he placed third. Um, I think he's the only like international runner to go sub 15 hours on the course. Yeah, and now he'll be the only one. To go twice. Yeah, he'll do it twice now. Yeah, pretty impressive. Yep. On par for the class and character of Tom Evans, one of the truly great athletes in the world, somebody who brings a sense of professionalism to everything that he does. He's inspired a generation of up and coming runners, certainly a star in his home country of the United Kingdom, back on American soil, racing for like the fourth or fifth time here where he seems to finish on the podium every single time. Yeah, super, super impressive with his consistency. I mean, I think Tom's technically only, this is his third hundred, and he'll have finished third, he'll have third, third th and first. <laughs> a third place at Western States, a third place at UTMB, and a win at Western States. You know what? You choose Gosh. your races wisely. You perform with those races, races wisely. It looks pretty darn good. Amazing. You have to remember, too, like kind of during the pandemic, right after the pandemic, Tom missed much of the 2021 season due to injury. He had a really kind of wonky knee that needed some surgery. Um, so sat out much of that season, coming back into training and racing last year, knocking it out of the park with a late pass of Jim Walmsley to take third at UTMB last August. It was a super impressive run. Yeah. And there's a great video of Tom making that pass on Jim Walmsley. Jim stepping aside and them having a great they have a hand, moment. nice handhold. Sportsmanship and respect even among two great competitors. On the final climb of the course. Yeah. Trail culture. Yeah, again, the women are super, super tight in that third through seventh position. We're gonna continue to wait to get updates from them. We're looking for ALT updates are gonna be the big deal. So again, Katie Scheid came through ALT at 13.58 elapsed, 6.58 local time, running really, really fast. Again, just, just to put this into perspective again, while, while she's running second to Courtney right now, her current pace is still 14 minutes under course record pace. So Katie Scheid's slowing a little bit, but still 14 minutes under Ellie Greenwood's course record that is about to get, is about is likely to get shattered by Courtney DeWalter. Gosh. The day that will live in history as our drone continues to look down the hill towards Tom Evans as he crests the final hill here into Auburn, California. On the right, we see Luo Kanhua, one of our Chinese athletes here coming into ALT, mile 85. There he is, folks. We have aerial sighting of men's champion, Tom Evans, now just minutes away from the top of this climb here. We will likely have a camera on him the entirety of that final mile plus from Roby Point to the track here. It's always a celebration. One of the rules here at Western States is that you're only allowed to have one pacer with you with the exception of the final mile of the course from Roby Point to the finish. You can have as many companions as you want. So we're often gifted with amazing Scenes of friends and family joining their runners for that final mile. We'll see if anybody can keep up with Tom, but he is about to put the finishing touches on the biggest victory of his career here at Western States. Yeah, really just absolutely incredible performance. Super smart running, moved up. We saw him take that moment to make that shoe change at Forest Hill where Dakota went blazing by, hoping to put the hurt on him. And then Tom actually didn't pick up a pacer then yeah. to hopefully get back onto Dakota's tails and just kind of keep that rolling. And Dakota kind of shattered on that Cal Street section and has moved, moved back in the men's top 10, having, having a we, bit of a day We need to there. ask him about that on the track because 
That was the pivotal moment of separation on the course here today as they exited Forest Hill together. And then the next update, we got an hour later, Tom had a 10 minute gap. Yeah, that was absolutely wild. We thought there was a glitch in the matrix. Yep. So again, don't go anywhere. We are probably, I don't know, maybe 12 to 15 minutes away from the finish of the 2023 Western States 100, at least for the champion. Of course, this broadcast will continue all the way through the final finisher, the cutoff being at 11 a.m. tomorrow morning. So again, of course, we have been focusing mostly on the elite and professional end of the race here for this first part of our coverage, but we will eventually transition into the middle and the back of the pack and we will celebrate every single finisher here today. Zach Miller's walking around the studio with watermelon slices. Zach, hook us up. Thanks, hook, buddy. hook a talker up with some watermelon. I'm gonna drip this all over you, Dylan, I apologize. And we see on the right-hand side here, Shen Ji Shen here, you can take this, thanks. We have Shen Ji Shen coming through the Pointed Rocks aid station, now in fourth place. Overall, and he is cruising, Corinne. Look at Shen. I don't know what Patty did, but he's breathed new life into this man. Patty O'Leary has a way of doing that to people. And here we go, folks, on the left-hand side of your screen, Tom Evans cresting the final hill. Oh, my goodness. Roby Point into the neighborhoods of Auburn, California, joined by Josh Eberly, his pacer. Remember, Josh Eberly is the Western Colorado Mountain yep. Sports Program coach. He coaches a collegiate cross or collegiate mountain running and trail running program. Pretty darn cool. You got coach in your ear the whole time. Come on, Tom. Let's get this thing done. Yeah, this part of the course is always frustrating. You get onto the pavement, you're like, I thought I was at the top, man. It's like, no, you got to keep going. Yeah, like there's there's a couple br hundred meters. Brutal little climb in there. I, I told this story a couple times this weekend to different people, but I remember cresting Roby Point and just being like, yeah, I'm on, I'm like on one. I'm doing this. I'm running well. And then I turned to my left and I looked at my friend Pete Stone, who's about you know probably six two and like 225 pounds, and he's running in flip flops next to me. And I'm like, oh, maybe I'm not running quite as fast as I thought I was. <laughs> and Pete's keeping up with me in flip-flops right, right beside me. So Tom Evans probably going to arrive here at the track in about 10 minutes, tiptoeing up this final incline here. Yeah, through, through Roby Point. Yeah, Tom, Tom Evans currently through Roby Point, joined by his pacer, Josh Eberly making his way here to the track. There's only a little bit more incline before he is basically downhill to the finish. That has got to feel pretty darn good. A dream come true for Tom. He's got two, two old time friends here to cheer him on. His wife who's a professional triathlete couldn't make the trip. It's in the midst of her season as she tries to make the next summer Olympic team. So she's a little bit busy doing her own thing. Tyler and Rachel coming through No Hands Bridge there. Tyler Green, our second place runner here in today's Western States 100. And we will see what the gap is back to Anthony Costales. Last we saw at Pointed Rocks, it was two, maybe three minutes maximum. Yeah, let's keep, it, keep an eye peeled on that screen. Tyler threw around 7.30 p.m. Looking for Anthony Costales to come across the bridge as well. Tom throwing high fives to the local community. The champion and charismatic guy that he is. He's still probably cracking jokes. The guy is funny. He really is. He's going to get here to the finish line and make some absurd joke. I just know it. Did you say on air what he's going to do at the finish line during the awards ceremony? What he said he was going to do? Oh, he told me that tomorrow for the awards, if he wins, he's going to wear split shorts and cowboy boots. <laughs> Flagstaff really did a number on him those last eight weeks, and supposedly he's all American now. Channeling his inner American, Tom Evans from the UK. We have not had a European champion on the men's side since Killian Journet in 2011. Yeah, and the last international winner on the men's side was Ryan Sands. South African. That was 2017. We're gonna yeah. cut back to Zach Marion. 
Very quick update here at Pointed Rocks. We had Jezhen Shen come through with Patty O'Leary as his pacer, asking his coach, Jason Coop, if he could push him. He took a few minutes here in the A station to get some water, get some gels. As soon as he took off, no more than 20 seconds later, we had Danny Jones from New Zealand coming through, and he looked like he was on a tear. He was being paced by Mael, one of our sport's most favorite personalities, running out of here with a like a gallon bottle of water, just dousing both of themselves and drinking from it on their way out. It is going to be a hard race for those two. Both of them left looking fairly good. My money is Danny Jones is going to take them. Absolutely Wild. riveting racing happening here in the top five men's race. But the men's champion, yep. this is going to be a foregone conclusion here. Tom Evans making his way through the final few hundred meters here of Auburn. It's great to see the local community out to greet this great British champion who's been hanging out here in the United States for the past five or six weeks, living with Abby and Cordes Hall in Flagstaff, Arizona getting all his work done. Yeah, I wonder if they've managed to get Abby to the track again. Abby, one of Adidas Tarek's teammates, a Western States finisher, CCC podium finisher, uh, unfortunately took a tumble running with Tom actually like a week ago, 10 days ago, and broke her tibia. And she's a little bit laid up. We've been crutching her around the course today, got her out to Forest Hill to help spectate, hoping they've got her to the track here somewhere, hopefully with her foot up in the air. Here we have Dan Davis on the bike with the camera. Fancy camera work here from our great volunteer staff. Again, a big shout out to the whole production crew here today. It's entirely volunteer organized. It sounds like we haven't seen an update on Castales is placing behind Tyler Green. It's very possible that Tyler Green is going to stay away from Anthony Castells. I think it's going to come down to that final climb up, climb up to Roby Point. I think Tyler is going to need to fight every single step of it to, to potentially make sure that he keeps that margin between him and Anthony. And honestly, I think Tyler can dig like that. Absolutely he can. He is not going to let go now. Going for his second, second place performance here at Western States in the last three years. Tyler Green, we expect to be finishing about 25 to 30 minutes after our men's champion, Tom Evans. And he should be coming into our line of sight in the next few minutes from where Corinne and I sit very close to the finish line. He stops to give a hug to one of his friends or family members or admirers there on the streets of Auburn. Getting joined by a few more friends. So cool. You see some local kids running with him, some people chasing him on bikes. Cordis Hall's joined him. That's who's on his right hand side. Cordis Hall, who's crewed <laughs> him all day long. Yeah, we're crying. We're Cord going to cry. Cordis was supposed to pace him, but when Abby got hurt, Cordis flipped into being the full time crew role, and we pulled in Josh Eberly literally on like Thursday of this week yeah. to come in and fill in as, as the pacer instead of Cordis so Cordis could make sure that he was at every single aid station. Teamwork. Teamwork makes the dream work. Such a good point. Okay, so we have gotten an update from Billy Yang in the studio that Tyler has extended his lead at the no hands bridge to about five minutes. So it looks like Tyler should be safe there in second position, but Anthony Castales is not one to give up now. Either way, it's gonna be a super close finish for the men's podium. And here's Courtney DeWalter smashing through the Pointed Rocks aid station at 7.35 p.m. That means we are at 15.35 elapsed. From here, it should be about an hour for Courtney to get to the finish line. So, sorry, we're 14.35 elapsed. So that means that Courtney is likely on pace for somewhere in the neighborhood of about 15.30-ish. 15.35, 15.40. I don't get it. My jaw is on our table in studio here. That is absolutely bonkers i was like maybe you know maybe 16 15 maybe 1605 15 30 something 
I mean, that's got to be it, right? From there, it's six miles to the finish. And she you looks that, unfazed. Yeah, like she's going to run every step of it. As Tom now crosses the famous white bridge. You can probably start to hear the cheering fans here at Placer High School Stadium. It is a beautiful scene here on the track, as it is every single year. People getting their phones out, preparing to capture this story, to bank it for their memories, to capture the inspiration of seeing the men's champ champion, Tom Evans, arriving here, running one of the fastest times in the 50-year history of the race. Wow, absolutely amazing. Tom is almost to the track here. He's going to be coming in. I'm looking at the clock right now. 14.37.43 on the clock behind us. It is a just a pile of photographers waiting at the finish line, all of whom have probably also been up since 2.30 a.m alongside us getting up the escarpment, getting out and around course. Everyone is going to be completely zonked after this thing. But Tom Evans joined by numerous members from the Adidas Terex crew that have been with him all day are running him to the track. He's almost here. That was a little preemptive. Those are two bikers. Just absolutely incredible. I was told we're not allowed to call him a champion until he finishes. But Tom Evans, I think, is about to become, I can say with some certainty that Tom Evans is about to become your 2023 Western States champion. I've got eyes on him right now as he enters the track. Tom Evans putting on a masterclass performance here today. Heck yes. And there he is, folks, the champion British athlete, one of the most consistent performers on every big stage that he's entered. His second podium performance here at the Western States 100, following up a third place back in 2019. He was third place also at UTMB in 2022, taking home the biggest victory of his career at a the Western Cougar, States 100. A Cougar at the Western States 100. Tom Evans, he's not gonna take a bow. He's gonna salute at the finish line. Absolutely incredible. Best day ever, best sport ever, best race ever. Tom Evans giving the love to the fans here. Like the true gentleman that he is, enjoying every last step of this 100 mile journey from Olympic Valley to the legendary yes. Placer High School track. Tom Evans. Putting on a show for the fans. The camera's ducking out to give him this prime shot all the way to the finish line. Bucket hat and all, I think bucket hat sales just went through the roof. Tom Evans, 14 hours, 40 minutes, 20 seconds. The British yes. Special Forces salute. That 100 mile journey is over. You can rest now, young man. Amazing performance. Officially now the fourth fastest run on the Western States course in its 50 year history. Take a bow, Tom Evans, the champ. Unbelievable, Karen. Let's go talk Look to our this. boy, huh? He's finally stopped his watch. Just want to make sure that happened. Okay, so hang tight, everyone. We're going to go down to the track. Corinne and I, right now, stand by for our finish line interview.
Check, check, check. <laughs> Welcome to the finish line of the 2023 Western States 100, the 50th Western States. We are joined by men's champion from the UK, Mr. Tom Evans, a big round of applause. Tom, an absolutely textbook executed performance here today.
tell us what this win means to you here on the world's biggest stage. I think for me, this year, I put all my eggs in one basket to come to Western States and have my best possible day. Um, and yeah, I've, I still can't quite believe myself and I'm so grateful that all of you guys are here. I'm sure you've got far better things to do on your Saturday night. So um, yeah, thanks so much for being here. It honestly means the world. Um, and yeah, this is my favorite race in the world. And uh, yeah, just thanks so much for sharing it with me. It means the world. So we watched you run this absolute textbook race. We watched you patiently move your way through the field. And then we watched you and Dakota have this like bromance out there for a very, very long time. Then you both come into Forest Hill. You stop to change shoes. Dakota leaves. And we're told that Dakota is like, sick, this is where I break Tom. Like those words came out of his mouth. The next thing we knew, you had a 10 minute lead. So tell us a little bit what happened as you descended Cal Street. Um, I looked down at my watch and I did a 554 mile, um, which was just so stupid. Um, and I really paid for it afterwards and I just thought that was not in the plan. Um, yeah, if anyone followed my UTMB last year, I seem to have a lot of bromances with American men. Um, so, Zach, I know you're here. Um, I'm sorry, we'll run together soon. Um, yeah, and then basically Dakota and I were just taking it in turns, leading. He was probably slightly more comfortable on the downhill. I was probably slightly more comfortable on the uphill. So what ended up happening was I led the downhill, he led the uphill. Um, and yeah, stayed together and yeah, it was probably halfway along Cal Street where I just put in a little bit of a surge for a couple of minutes and turned around and I couldn't see him. And I just thought, oh, I'm just going to have to go from here. Um, even though we've got, yeah, 26, 27 miles to go um, just to make it really hurt. So, yeah, and then just managed to hold on and just out on the course, all the support, the incredible volunteers and the aid stations just make this day the most incredible day in my calendar this year. Um, so yeah, it was just, yeah, the plan that I put together with Scott Johnson, my coach, we executed exactly the plan. Um, so yeah, massive thank you for him and everyone else in my team, from everyone from Adidas Terex who are here today, um, to my other sponsors who get to help and yeah, make it work. Um, and yeah, it was just, I would love to say it was a, the perfect day, but I did have a couple of bathroom stops uh, at the beginning, but that's enough detail on that one. Tom, before the race, you predicted it would take 14 hours, 28 minutes to win in today's conditions. You closed the 100-mile journey in 14 hours, 40 minutes. So it's a little bit slower than you expected. But this places you as the fourth fastest time, the third fastest person ever at Western States. In a career with a lot of amazing achievements, where does this rank for you? Number one, 100%. Um, yeah, I'm sort of always, always the bridesmaid and never the bride, and I just keep finishing third, which is incredible. But I think, in my opinion, in order to win a race, you've got to make a decisive move. And I've probably just played a lot of races fairly sensibly because I... Yeah, I just wanted to have a really good experience. And today the plan was to yeah, get to Forest Hill and then take that risk. And yeah, today is one of the days that it paid off. And yeah, I'm just over the moon. I'm sure it will sink in at some time, but uh, yeah, it definitely hasn't yet. So I know you made some kind of 
decisions on the move out there. You sent your pacer to the river because you and Dakota were rolling along so well together. You know, I thought that that was, you were trying to avoid distraction in the last 20 miles, and instead I think you put yourself into the hurt locker for the last 20 miles. Tell us a little bit about what it took once you made that move to make it to the finish, because we all witnessed that look in your eyes at Pointed Rocks, and it was not maybe where exactly you wanted to be. Yeah, so first off, uh, I just want to say a massive thank you to my pacer, Josh Eberly. Uh, so if you have a massive round of applause for Josh, please. Thank you. So yeah, the plan was to have a, my pacer from, um, yeah, from uh, the Forest Hill down to the river. But because Dakota and I were working so well together, I said to Dakota, look, what's the point in us? both having paces, let's just keep running. If we have paces now, we're likely to just get out of rhythm and try and push a bit early or whatever, and actually we're working really well together. So yeah, I made my call to, um, to my crew, Abby and Cordis Hall. Another round of applause, please. And uh, yeah, couldn't have done it without you guys. And I've lived with them for the last five weeks in Flagstaff. And, yeah, Abby is currently uh, recovering from an uh, injury, so if everyone could uh, send her serious healing vibes, that would be amazing, because she's going to win this race one day, and I'm going to crew her, um, and I can't wait. So, yeah. Tom, take us a little deeper into the experience or the episode where you had to take that risk to break the elastic on the great, the legend, Dakota Jones, you were running toe-to-toe, -to -toe, shoulder to shoulder with for that first 100K. You have to make that calculated risk to win on a stage like Western States. Take us into the mindset there, and then what the mindset was like when you're in the lead with 50K to go, knowing that you're on the doorstep of achieving your dreams. Yeah, great question, and I've, yeah, been a fanboy of Dakotas since I got into this sport and yeah it was amazing and um, yeah just incredible to be able to run with him and chat a little bit with him about the stuff that he's been doing and so yeah that was that was really cool and yeah I guess the moment that it went through my mind was I'd made such a massive effort to catch up with him going down um, the road in Forest Hill, and actually, if it had been the usual course on Cow Street, it would have been way harder. So, because I could see him the whole way, I could just slowly reel him in. And I've, yeah, run quite a lot on the road, and so it was, yeah, being able to uh, run a little bit faster for a little bit was okay. And I just then recovered, and as soon as I started feeling okay again. Um, yeah, I just made a conscious decision on a bit of an uphill to just go past him and, yeah, just push a little bit harder than I'd have liked to have done um, on a bit that I probably should have been hiking. Um, and I then heard him hiking and just thought, right, you've got to go. So just, yeah, put yourself in the hurt locker for five minutes, see if you can get a gap. If you get it, great you've then got to just keep digging. Um, and if you don't, you're going to have to try again later at some point. Um, because, yeah, I do not want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe in a sprint around the track with him. Um, yeah, it was way too much fun, taking my time going around the track. So, um, yeah, thanks again to all of you guys. Maybe one of our final questions, but... We we're kind of looking over past results, and you're the first um, European male to bring home a cougar since Killian Journey. It's a pretty big footsteps to follow in. What does it mean to you to be bringing the cougar home with you? Uh, yeah, I hope that uh, British Airways led it on the flight. Um, yeah, it means the absolute world. This was when I came to Western States in. 2019 is my debut 100 miler um, and this is now my third 100 miler I've done um, and to yeah to be in the same sentence is the likes of 
sort of Killian, Francois, Jim, um, is very cool. We were talking about it on the stage the other day of the men who have podiumed at the biggest US 100 miler and the biggest European, European 100 miler. And it's a pretty small list and I just still can't believe I'm, I'm part of that. And yeah, it means the world. So um, yeah. Well, Tom, on behalf of the Western States community, congratulations on your championship, your victory here today. Thank you for coming to our amazing race, and we hope to see you again next year, that we won't ask you to commit now. <laughs> Round of applause for Tom Evans. Once again, that's Tom Evans from Loughborough in England. That's in Leicestershire. And his official time... All right. So that was your men's champion, Tom Evans, finishing in 14 hours and 40 minutes. And the hotly contested race for second and third is playing out on the final downhill from Roby Point to the track as we speak. On your screen right now, you're seeing Tyler Green uh, being paced by his wife and crew coming on down. Uh, Tyler went through Roby Point at 1451, just five minutes ahead of third place Anthony Costales. So uh, maybe a little bit too much of a gap for Anthony to try to make up in the last mile or so, uh, but definitely a hard fought battle as they're finishing and pushing all the way to the track. Uh, just behind them, we had uh, Danny Jones come through No Hands Bridge at about 14 hours and 50 minutes, so about uh, 10 minutes ago. He came through and should be making his way to Roby Point, and we should be having him cross that timing mat sometime in the next five to 10 minutes. And as you all saw during that interview, uh, Courtney DeWalter continuing to the charge towards the finish line, came across No Hands Bridge at 14.56. Uh, very much putting herself in contention for this top five or top six overall, and just absolutely crushing it um, all the way from the start to, to right now. Looking like she was having fun, high-fiving people all across the bridge. But right now, you see Tyler Green making that last left-hand turn as you pass the infamous white bridge, and it's all downhill from here, following those beautiful blue footprints all the way down to the track. It was great to hear Tom speak about uh, just the necessity to pace the effort throughout the entirety of the day. And what we've definitely seen from Tyler made an early push from what we've seen historically from him, but moderated that effort incredibly well to hold on to the second place, uh, to, to move up throughout the day as other folks succumb to the heat uh, and the attrition of the day. And the same thing is definitely true for Anthony Costales and the Chico boys uh, following suit right on that hill. But you just get to appreciate in this view right here that you're seeing the community that is the Western States 100. You have folks that are on their lawns cheering for, for any runner that comes by. They're going to be cheering now, and they'll be cheering well into the morning as the golden hour approaches. And you see the mob of crew who've all worked to help their athlete get this far. And Tyler's just basking in it, yet again coming in with another outstanding performance here at Western States. This will be his second time on the podium. And he just gets to bask it, bask it all in. I see the bike coming on the track, which means he's got just the last chicane here. A quick left, a quick right, and then 250 meters on the track right here into the finish as you see that overhead view of Placer High School. The cowbells are out. The people are on their feet cheering in. Your second place male, your top American. And Tyler taking it all in. Gotta love it. The entire Nike Trail team doing one last stride across the lawn so they can be there at the finish line for them. As he's hitting all these high fives, inspiring another generation who may be here in 
10, 15, 20 years trying to accomplish exactly what these guys are achieving the dream of running 100.2 miles from Olympic Valley down here to the Placer High track. But it's all smiles for this man. The pain of the first 100 miles is gone. Enjoying this last 70 meters. And he grabs the little the first time that he gets to do this. He's crossed this finish line three times, but this one's going to be especially special with the, with the toddler in tow for the first time. And you see him enjoying that moment. The whole family taking it in. Fifteen hours and four minutes for your second place man, Tyler Green. And impressively, dismounted the child without incident, which might be the most athletic thing that Tyler does today. Kudos to him. We will get the finish line interview here shortly. But we will continue to also watch the feeds on our end because we do expect Anthony Costales to be coming down here in the next three to five minutes as well, depending on how hard he wants to hit this descent and rounding out our men's podium. But you see Tyler talking to the race director, Lord Balls himself. And we'll get them down there. And while we get him set up for his finish line interview, let's go ahead and throw it back out to Zach Marion on course. Uh, give us a little update about what's happening back out there. Zach, what is going on, buddy? What is going on, Skyler? We are losing light here at Pointed Rocks. Quick update before you guys get that interview with Tyler Green. We've got in sixth place, Courtney D coming through here. All smiles, knowing exactly what she's doing. She gave her, her husband, Kevin, just a little wave, and on her way behind her, you had Jeff Colt in seventh place overall, six male. He was looking really rough, said his crew said he had no downhill legs left, but he's going to grit it through to the finish. Two minutes behind him, you had Ryan Montgomery, who gave me an F yes when he heard that Jeff was only two minutes ahead, and he went charging out of here. But the second he left this aid station, Matthew Blanchard was charging in, gave his, girl, his partner a hug, a kiss, a little shrug, and bolted out of here stronger than any athlete I've seen today. And right behind him, 12 minutes behind him, actually, we had Cole Watson looking strong, looking determined. He knows he's in the top 10, but he knows he has to keep moving to maintain that M9 position. So that is what we've got from here. Skylar, I'm throwing it back to you. You guys can catch that interview with Tyler. Awesome. Thanks so much, Zach. Yeah, we have a lot of action happening uh, as we have the overhead view of Anthony Costales making his move down the hill, coming towards the track. So we're going to get almost a double interview going here momentarily. But as we appreciate this overhead view, I'm going to go ahead and throw it on down to the track. Uh, and Debo Corinne should be here with our second place male, Tyler Green. All right, we might just actually put both of them next to each other at this rate uh, with how close they are. We're going we're gonna to see how this uh, games out a little bit. But let's go ahead and take a peek at how far. Oh, Anthony literally is at the bottom of this hill. He's going to be entering the track here in the next 50 seconds at most. And look at, look at the Chico crew, Chico, California home of Chico State University and a very proud alumni group of which Anthony is one. I got the chance to speak with uh, his former coach earlier at Robinson Flat, and he was super excited, not only for Anthony, but just for the entire program and seeing what, what they have produced in the ultra running space with the likes of Anthony and one Tim Tollison. So a lot of love coming from Northern California down here to Auburn and down here to the Placer High track as Anthony Costales makes his way down onto the rubber and the last 250 meters of a hard-fought Western States 100. 
And our third place signature from Salt Lake City, Utah, which is Anthony Kosalis. He won the back canyon for 100K earlier this year. He won the golden ticket. And true to form, the man is high-fiving and kicking. This is a legitimate, I wish I had my stopwatch out right now. The man is flying right now. He might actually still dip under. Well, okay. Can he, can he break 1509? If he brings it all the way through the line, he can actually still dip under 1509, which is still an all-time result. But he's going to take it in. Grabbing the little. And Western States, truly a family affair. We've seen it from all three of our top finishers. And here is your third place male, Anthony Costales. He got the exploding fist bump. He squatted. He stood up. He picked up. How? There it is. Yes, please collapse and rest. Good, sir. Enjoy the hard fought run. So we'll get them situated, both Tyler and Anthony, for an interview here as he gets his legs back under him and we can get everybody situated and connected. Meanwhile, we will go back to looking up the hill for one Daniel Jones. And on camera in the big box, you see Jack, one of uh, two autistic runners that we have competing here at Western States. Uh, Jack is nonverbal and has already made it past Forest Hill and looks to be absolutely grooving, waving to, waving to the crowd, waving to you all at home. And he is having a phenomenal day out there on course. You love to see it. Just like Western States is a family affair, really trying to uh, to show that trail running and ultra running is truly for everyone who wants to make it a part of their life. Jack really embodying representation and showing us that really anything is possible. So we'll be following him throughout the evening as he continues on, but he is past 100K into his Western States adventure and absolutely crushing it right now. And as we watch that, giving you update on Daniel Jones, just as I had predicted, through Roby Point about a minute ago. So he'll be down here on the track in a short while. And then Shin will be getting chased down by Daniel Jones. So hopefully we can get our aerial coverage up there uh, to see because they are about 90 seconds apart, Shin and Daniel Jones coming down, uh, fighting for fourth and fifth place in this Western States 100. In the right box, you see we're trying to get our finish line interview set up. It's going to be a crowded affair as we have the two gentlemen coming down the hill as we speak. Very dense uh, top end of the field, even though it felt like Tom Evans, our men's champion, had had such a large lead. Truly, truly competitive for two through ten. And that's what matters, right? Get top ten, get to do all of this fun next year, same time, same place. And so that's what these guys are fighting for. So just doing a check on the clock. 
Shen should be about 1K away from the finish line. Check, check, check. Okay, guys, we're going to have to do this fairly quickly before we see even more heroic finishers arrive here on the track at Placer High School. We are joined by second and third place finishers, Tyler Green from Portland, Oregon, Anthony Costales from Salt Lake City, Utah. Tyler Green, starting with you, sir. A four-year journey, four years in a row here at Western States. 14th, then second, fourth, and second. Reflect on that four-year journey. Uh, this is just the most amazing place to come every year. Um, but I think we, we, so in 2021, it was Rachel and I that crossed the finish line. And then last year, uh, Rachel was pregnant and we got to cross the finish line. And now we get to bring our son into this. Um, and that's, that's like, I mean, that's what matters most is just being able to share this with my family. My parents are here. Um, my uh, parent-in-laws are here. It's just so special to have everyone and to be able to share it. Love it. Anthony, today felt like you had something to prove. And I think that this third place finish here speaks volumes. And I would love to just hear a little bit what being on the podium here at Western States, the biggest 100-mile race in North America, means to you? I think I'm just glad now. I feel like no matter what race it is, I could be on the podium. So I've done a lot of podiums, done a lot of wins, a few behind it. And this is one that it's a lot bigger of a race, so you don't know if you could be on the podium when it gets to this level one. Yeah, there's a lot of low points, and I talked to him about a low, real low point. I don't know what mile 35, 40, and I'm just uh, glad I got through the downs and the ups. Tyler, you're known for being a sort of conservative starter, a come from behind finisher. Today, you put yourself in the fight early in the race. It paid off another second place here. Was that intentional? Tell us about the strategy. Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't. I think I, my plan was to hold back a little bit in the snow, but I was having a lot of fun in the snow, actually. Um, and so just, in, and then all of a sudden found myself with the main group and picking good lines with like Dakota and Jeff. Um, and all of a sudden I was in the front of that and I was like, oh, this is gonna surprise some people. <laughs> Uh, so that was somewhat unintentional, but was planning on working harder in the canyons than I have in the past. And, and early on I said, I'm not going to finish this race. I'm, let me, <laughs> uh, I'm going to, I'm going to know that I went for it. I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that I went for it. And we were talking about that as well. So, uh, I think I did. Yeah, and I heard some babies got you guys both to the finish line. Anthony, when you finished, and I went over to congratulate you, you said, oh, man, I thought my day was done at Greengate. You made it here. You made it here well clear of the next chasing duo who I, we, we expect here very shortly. Tell us a little bit about digging deep to get here on the podium in those final 20 miles. Yeah, at the, the top of Green Gate or going up Green Gate, I just got really hot, didn't kind of have ice on me, and went on a real low point. And then Jeff Colt came up at the exact same time as me and was just joking around and laughing. I'm like, well, I told Jimmy, I was like, right, he's going to pass me, and so no, it's okay. And uh, took off a little bit before him, and then I was just like, kind of said, F it. I'm going to make him stress about it a little bit. And just hit a really hard downhill, and then all of a sudden, things just slowly started changing. And yeah, then I started feeling real good, and then a little low, but yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was hard. A big round of applause for our second and third place finishers, Tyler Green, Anthony Costales, your men's podium here at the 50th Western States. Awesome, awesome. Just sheer grit from those two rounding out the podium.
Uh, but not to be outdone, we've got Shin coming down to the track right here. About to make the quick wiggle left, the quick wiggle right, and onto the track. Just an absolute grinder of a day. Having seen him out there in some of those aid stations, didn't always look like he was having the most fun, wasn't the most pretty, but he has shown up and shown out as he makes his way here onto the track with his whole crew, his coach, Jason Coop, his pacer, Patty O'Leary. I'm sure Patty is stoked to not be dropped as a pacer at Western States for once. And he did Shin well to bring him here to the finish, running strong all the way to a fourth place as they are hoofing it around the track which they do need to still be moving. Daniel Jones coming down the hill right behind in tow. But right now, with 150 meters left, this is Shin's moment. Shin Jai Shin. Western State's debut. Getting into this race as the top UTMB points leader and capitalizing on the experience from China, your fourth place male, Shin Jai Shing. So much joy, so much relief. You love to see it. Taking in the entirety of the moment. And just a special moment to share with the family. Amazing, amazing moment for Shin. Fourth place, 15-19. And on the far side of the track, Daniel Jones has just stepped on and is making his way around the backstretch. And we're moving from China to New Zealand on the backstretch. This is Daniel Jones. After 15 hours, second and third place, and then fourth and fifth place, only to be separated by mere minutes at most. A true display of grit from Daniel Jones under the radar for many folks. Coming all the way from New Zealand, getting his golden ticket at Tarawera. A silent hunter throughout the day, steadily moved up through the pack and finds himself in position to grab an M5 bib and do it all again next year. But he's soaking in this moment, embracing it right now, entering the last 50 meters. And Daniel Jones crosses the finish line 15 22. So our top five overall separated by just 42 minutes, two through five, separated by 18. So truly, the battle that we've been watching all day to stay in this top 10 has played itself all the way to the track. And now, all eyes turn 
back to the downhill through the neighborhoods because next on course through Roby Point was Courtney DeWalter. Went through Roby Point just about six minutes ago. And she is on pace to be not only your women's champion, sixth overall, and healthily under the former course record. So we'll, we'll see her soon. But you see all the action happening here at Placer High. The crowds are out. The sun is setting. And where else would you rather be on a Saturday night than hanging out at the Placer High track with a couple hundred of your closest friends and a few thousand more watching you online. So thank you all for joining us from wherever you are. And let us know, where, where, are, you coming, where are you coming to us from? Drop it in the chat. Let's see if the chat is as international as this top five has been. Two Americans, three international athletes, and a whole host of excellence. As you see Courtney DeWalter cruising down the road, still looking spry. I was having some conversations at Michigan Bluff when I was out on course with uh, coaches, a few runners that have run this event in the past and had some success uh, making the top 10. And the consensus at that point was that Courtney was gonna go under 16 hours. It was gonna be a function of how far under could she be. Most of them thought about 1540 to 1545. Courtney DeWalter is currently blowing even their expectations out of the water. Just putting on a master class here as we watch excellence floating its way down towards the track. Should be coming up here on uh, the bridge relatively soon and then smooth sailing all the way in. The tie-dye tents there, I believe Tweet might be hanging out around that area. I have to get confirmation from some folks in the know, but one legend working on the downhill towards the finish, another legend currently making her way towards the track here at Placer High. And we've got the down low visual. And you get a true appreciation of the speed at which Courtney is actively running at this moment. And there it is, the final big left turn. And follow the blue dots all the way home. Courtney DeWalter absolutely smashing this course at the moment. I'm looking back at Roby Point. Should see an appearance from some combo of Jeff Colt, Ryan Montgomery, Matthew Blanchard coming through relatively soon. We heard from Zach Marion just a, a few minutes ago that both of those, uh, I guess all three of those gentlemen, were in hunting mode, fully in the box, trying to make moves. So we'll continue to watch how that plays out. But right now, it's the moment to celebrate one Courtney DeWalter as she makes her way in. And I can tell you here in the stands, everybody is on their feet. Everybody is stoked to be able to be here to witness history. We've talked all day about that course record that Ellie set 11 years ago that nobody had been within 20 some odd minutes of. And Courtney DeWalter just absolutely 
not leaving anything to chance here. And coming in well under 16 hours. By the time she gets around the track, will be in the 1530s. Just an all-time result for anybody, let alone the GOAT of female ultra running. Courtney DeWalter entering the track for her last 250, and you just see the joy that she has for the crowd and that they are giving her back. Just an absolute hype train. And you know that as a former teacher, Courtney has a special appreciation for all these little ones being out here and witnessing this and her getting to share that with the youth. Mutually beneficial for all. As the crowd salutes her, she salutes the crowd. Your 2023 Western States 100 Women's Champion, Courtney DeWalter. 15, 29, 36. Finish time. As she takes it all in, Courtney to Walter. Putting that time in perspective, 15.29 would have been second place last year overall. Would have been second place overall in 2021. It would have been fifth overall in 2019, the year that Jim Walmsley set the course record. She still would have been top five overall. Just a master class from Courtney DeWalter. You see her husband, Kev, just laughing. It's funny, we joked about this. Uh, you wanna throw this headset on real quick? Because I think you'll, you'll be able to help me in the story. Billy Yang joining me in the studio as we watch Courtney. Uh, we joked a month ago, we were all sharing a dance floor in a very hot room, and we joked that, hey, this was probably great heat training. Little did we know that Courtney DeWalter dancing until 11.30, just deep into the night, killing the dance floor in, in, that, in that heat was gonna translate to this performance. Are we actually taking credit for the this historical <laughs> moment that we just witnessed? I don't think we're going to take credit, but we might have helped her get one good training session in. I'll tell you what, she definitely put in a training session, if we're counting that as one. She was up all night, tearing up the dance floor with us, thanks to the tunes of one Mr. Skizzle Fresh over here. I'm just speechless right now. I, I, I'm just speechless. What did we just witness? I, I'm trying to contextualize this in in history, and you you can compare the, the raw data of it all, but to see how she performed with the energy that she had that entire time, I just don't know. I, I, I don't know how to, to properly capture this. Interval. Well, first of all, all hail the former course record holder, one Ellie Greenwood. Absolutely. Stood the test of time since 2013, I believe. Uh, seemingly unbeatable beatable record, or certainly one that was really put up there in the stratosphere of can this actually be done in this generation? And not only did she beat it, she obliterated it. 1640 and change to 15, 
sub 15:30. I mean, it's it's just it's unthinkable. I can't believe what I what we just witnessed here. And to all of you guys tuning in, I hope you can appreciate the magnitude of what Courtney accomplished here against a fierce comp uh, competitive field. Katie Scheid, who is having a phenomenal day Absolutely. that will probably be more of a footnote, unfortunately, due to Courtney's historic performance. Wow. Just wow. Check, check, check. I mean, I, I think we'll hear it in the interview shortly. I, I think that Courtney will say that, that Katie being there and pushing her definitely helped goose this along uh, throughout the early parts of the day. But to, to keep your head, to keep your wits about you, down Cal Street in, in the heat of the day when we definitely saw other people struggle and to expand, to be moving up through the men's field the way that she did. She's moved up, what, like 10 places in, in the last like 45 miles or something like that? Like, it's nuts. It's absolutely, I, I, I need to see these splits. I have to know where it stands in the okay, we got it. historical context, but. <laughs> There she is. Oh, my yeah. God. I think we're about to throw it down to, to the finish line. I think they're, they're finishing, setting it up. Um, so they're, they're, they're just doing the last check, finishing check, touches check. there. Uh, and I'll, I'll save everyone me trying to do math in a spreadsheet. Um, but yeah, what are you looking at over here? I, I have the I, I have every okay. split from the last, like, five years. Okay. So cutting. let's go to the finish line. Check, check, check. Okay. Welcome back to the finish line of the 2023 Western States 100, the 50th Western States. Just to put things in context here, the women's course record here at the race was set in 2012 by Western States legend Ellie Greenwood, 16 hours, 47 minutes. Nobody has been within 23 minutes of that record until today, until the all-time legend, Courtney DeWalter. <laughs> Without exaggeration, one of the greatest performances in ultra-running history. Courtney DeWalter, tell us about your day. Oh my gosh, thank you guys for being out here. <clears throat> the day was so fun. I'm so thankful for all the volunteers who were out on course today and who got the trails ready. It was absolutely beautiful out there. Um, and it was very difficult and I'm happy to be here at the track with all of you. So the last time you were here in 2019, things were going really, really good. Like actually the exact same splits you ran for much of the day and then you got faster today. But you know, things went awry, you had to pull the plug on it, unfortunately. What does it mean to be back here in 2021? Uh-oh, we got a race. Can I sit here? Yeah, I think they'll let you sit here. I can turn it. Context, what is happening at the moment? Matthew Blanchard coming onto the track, moving up two spots since we saw him at no hands. Jumping Ryan Montgomery and Jeffrey Colt, just like Zach Marion had told us, he was hunting and he got the job done. Coming across the line, 1537, Matthew Blanchard. Sixth male, seventh overall. Another grinder of a day. Resurrected, looked like he was going through it. Came out of the rough spot and pushed here to the finish. And we're going to have two more coming through the finish line here shortly. Yep, we have one. Looks like Ryan. Billy, help me out. Trying to get a visual. I see a Hoka singlet. Are we looking at? Right, the white hat. Oh, sorry. That's a pacer. True. It's hard to tell between the white top of Ryan and the lighter mint top of Jeff, I think.
That's not Ryan Montgomery, is it? I yeah, it is. it is. That is definitely Ryan. Okay. Oh, my God. So Ryan Montgomery catching Jeff Colt, but giving up a spot to Matthew Blanchard to hold on to eighth overall. What an awesome performance. And having missed this race twice before due to injury, due to conflict. Have yourself a day. Atta. Woo! All smiles, so chipper, given, given love. Just awesome, awesome to see. And fittingly, the last weekend of Pride Month, so getting to bring the flag around. Looks like it was signed by many loved ones, so good for Ryan Montgomery, eighth overall. And Jeff Colt was two minutes back at Roby Point, so really any second now oh, we should also be expecting him to come through. That is a serious nipple <laughs> bleed out there, Ryan. My God. Left it all out on the course. Well, we're just going to chalk it up to leaving it on the course, Billy. But you see in the lower right box, we got Jeff Colt coming down. Wow. Just. We're going to have to go back and look if this is one of the tightest spreads we've seen, at least two through ten at this rate. Uh, I'll leave it to Eight Station Fireball well, to help us out with that. But this is. I did say on a podcast that it is very possible that we'll get all top ten finishing under 16 hours. I, of course, didn't think one of the top 10 people would be Courtney DeWalter in that mix, but am I surprised? At this point, nothing will surprise me anymore. Goat status. I mean, is this cemented? This is going to be a pretty legendary tale that all of us got to partake in, in in some little way. So very thankful to be able to share the moment. Very excited to have all of you in the in the stream enjoying it as we see Jeff Colt making his way onto the track. Mm. Battled all day. Mm. Gave up spots, gained a lot of them back. I am a latecomer on the Jeff Colt bandwagon, but couldn't happen to a nicer guy, more hardworking guy. He came here with intention. He came here with purpose. He wanted to compete. He wanted to be in the mix. Trained his butt off, and here he is, running the track, the famous Placer High track with his loved ones. Attaboy, Colt. And doing just a great improvement on what he did last year. Obviously, that heartbreaking 11th place had to go out and secure another golden ticket, which he did at Bandera. He, Look. And, and he's 70 minutes faster than he was last year. Like that's really learning from, from the, the, the tales, the struggles of last year and piecing it together so that he does not have to go on that golden ticket hunt next year because he is gonna have an M at the front of his bib. Coming in ninth overall, eighth male, this is Jeffrey Colt. Way to get it done. I'm looking in the chat. I know everyone's clamoring for, for Courtney DeWalter. Let's please give all these hardworking runners their due moment under the sun. And I do mean that. It's still kind of light out. Yes. <laughs> First weekend of summer, and we are capitalizing on the, on the long days currently. And as, and as you can see, we'd love to be talking to Courtney right now, but we would have just had four people run through her shot. So it is coming, people. Just hang on tight. And, and here's the thing. In many respects, second is as good as 10th. You still get to punch your ticket back here next year to, to suffer all, all over again. So these, these runners are still grinding out. And, and this is where it gets 
it gets tricky. We have two spots left for guaranteed men's bibs. We got Cole Watson, who was sitting as ninth male. Janosh Kowalczyk was sitting as 10th male, and they were up. Uh, Janosh was up about nine minutes on Ludo. So we'll continue to see how things are progressing. But as it stands, it looks like we're going to have a break in folks actually arriving at the track, which will lend itself to some interview action here at the finish line once Debo and Corinne can get set up once again and we clear out the space. And for all of you at home who are tuning in, you're like, love the elites, but I have a friend, I have a loved one. I have somebody that I follow online and I wanna see how they're doing. If you are looking at the chat box on YouTube, right pinned at the top is a link you can click on to for ultralive.net and it should send you on over uh, to the live results page so you can favorite your athlete of choice and track them along their journey because we still have what, 14 hours and oh yeah <laughs> yeah we're gonna be here for a while are we halfway are we even halfway <laughs> uh, we, we are we are over halfway just over halfway but a lot of action still to come we got a lot of folks who are out here trying to get those silver buckles get under that 24 hour mark before 5 a.m pacific time and then obviously Everyone's trying to make it here before the 30 hour cutoff and golden hour is going to be a spectacle. So we got live coverage for you throughout the night and into the daylight hours again tomorrow. So if you've got a loved one, a friend or just a new favorite runner, you'll be able to follow them along the entire journey. And while they are resetting over there, uh, Billy, I'm afraid to ask, but might as well. How is the, how's your fantasy lineup looking right now? I had to recuse myself, but it would have been busted a long time ago. I probably would have had Hayden in the mix. Anthony, well, the contenders, Tom Evans, Anthony, Matthew, Hayden. I, I figured the winner would come from one of those five. Um, and I probably would have done fairly well. Save for Hayden, who unfortunately had a, I, I believe he fell and re-aggravated re an old injury and mm -hmm. um, unfortunately just could not recover from it. But um, he will bounce back and hopefully toe the line once again at Olympic Valley because I know how much this race means to him. But to the other men, Congratulations, Ryan Montgomery too. I mean, I did not, I probably would not have picked him in my top seven or eight, however he finished, but he surprised me. Jeff Colt, I mean, all, all these guys are just, there were so many contenders for the top 10. Absolutely. And I just, I'm just blown away. I'm still speechless by Courtney, by the way. <laughs> and um, we will check in with the studio to see if we're going to, in fact, line up a interview with her or if she is going to peace out back home. But dang. Yeah, or she might have got pulled for drug testing at this rate. Who, who knows? So we are keeping eyes on Roby Point, trying to see uh, how things are shaking out. We do have Cole Watson coming through the hard closer in his own backyard. Uh, came through about five minutes ago at Roby Point. So Cole Watson should be coming to the track here in, I'd say the next three to five minutes. And for the people in the studio, if you can keep an eye out for second female, Katie Scheid, I'm sure she's not too far behind. And 
so as the sun sets here at Placer High, we've got a whole ton of action still happening here. Photos being taken by runners that have just finished. Pacers finally getting a break. Kids playing Frisbee. It's just a full scene out here. And if you haven't noticed from all those aerial shots as folks come in, this really is a, a community event. It's not just a running community event. This is a whole of Auburn community event. Families coming out, just enjoying their evening, whether they're runners or not, and taking it all in. I saw a couple cross-country kids, uh, local high schoolers, getting a jog in on the course, trying to make sure they got to take in a little bit of the action as as it was unfolding, but just truly a delightful night. Temperatures are cooling down, but the competition's still hot out there. We gotta finish out these men's top 10, figure out who exactly is guaranteeing their way into the race next year. And then we've been following that incredibly stacked women's race all day long incredibly tight pack running other than Courtney DeWalter and Katie Scheid being out front. We had three through three through eight, three through nine being pretty tightly packed throughout the day. And so we're going to keep tabs on that. Uh, we got some camera operators on the ground uh, who will be checking in from aid stations, helping us keep the, the live feed going, making sure that we are all set um, and, and tracking those runners because there are going to be a lot of fireworks unfolding with, with that women's race. Sorry to abandon you for a second. I had to, I had to find out what happened to Courtney, and apparently she ran. She left it all out there and uh, some of it on the track. Yeah. So go big or go home. She, she wanted to make sure, not that I don't think it would come close any time in our lifetimes, but she wanted to make sure she put that record way out there, way beyond reach. No, that, that, that makes sense. And we appreciate somebody in the top 10 going full Patari and keeping, keeping this streak alive. So, so thank you, Courtney, for uh, gracing the plaster track with everything she had inside. As we have one Cole Watson passing Tweet's place. Got two left turns and one long downhill on his way to the finish. And Cole is just such a great story. What was it, five times going for a golden ticket and just missing out? Coming to the race last year on a sponsor spot and not having the day that he hoped for. Running canyons incredibly intelligently, just blitzing the last 20 of that course uh, per coach's orders. And then pretty much executing a very similar plan here, letting folks go early in the race and closing like an absolute boss to ensure that he slides into the, the top 10 here. Cole Watson currently sitting in 10th overall as he makes that left-hand turn. And let's see, in fact, he, he's about eight minutes away, just a little over eight minutes away from coming in under 16 hours. As per many people's predictions, everyone predicted it would be a fast day and mm -hmm. fast it was. And you see the lights in the distance. The track is calling the local boy home. Cole Watson just moments away from securing a top 10 finish at Western States. I know his coach, Brett Hornig, super excited to see this result. When I talked to Brett at Michigan Bluff, Cole had had like a 30 second stop with his crew. They were the last crew on the entire road before, uh, before veering left onto the trail. Super efficient, in and out. I thought he looked great. I talked to Brett. Brett said he's in the zone. That was 45 miles ago, and he's been in the zone ever since. Just crushing it, moving up steadily, 
being incredibly smart, made the shoe change to the Rocket X at Forest Hill. And it's just been flying all the way here to Placer High as you see him entering the track. The former Oregon Duck, no stranger to putting down some miles on the track. But something tells me this last, this last bit might be chief amongst all those memories on a track. This is Tony Watson. He is going to have a two-hour PR from his time last year. And the locals showing love to the local boy. Last year he placed 14th overall. This year he moves up to a solid 10th overall. Betters his time from last year by two hours. This is Cole Watson, 15.54, ninth male, 10th overall. And for once in his life, not having to chase a golden ticket, which I know feels so, so good. Just a fantastic performance from all of our top 10. Trying to see if we might even get an 11th runner under 16 hours. Might be cutting it a little close, but definitely one of the deepest years on record for Western States. And if the studio is ready, I think while we have a break in the action, Going to go ahead and throw it to them for a quick ad break from one of our valued sponsors here at the Western States 100. As the Hoka athlete, our title sponsor, Hoka, get to celebrate Cole Watson coming through. Looking back at Roby Point, it looks like we will not be getting an 11th individual under that 16 hour mark. But just going back through historic splits, I'm, I'm looking back the last few years. I mean, last year we had four individuals under 16 hours. trying to think about that 2019 year, the wildly fast year we had also 10 individuals under 16 hours. So much like Corinne and Debo were talking about early on in the day, 2019 looked to be a, a pretty analogous weather year for what the runners were expecting and true to form they have delivered. Tom Evans, obviously, third place in 2019 with that 14.59, shaving a solid 12 to 14 minutes off of that. A thing, and he predicted it ahead of the race. He's like, 14.28 is probably going to be what it takes to win. And based on how he finished, if he had to run 14.28 to win, he probably had it in him. 
but this is just, just a phenomenally competitive year. And we're only through, you know, nine men. We still have this entire top 10 women's race to still play out. We had Katie Scheid still sitting in second. She went through pointed rocks about 10 minutes ago. So she's uh, probably about five miles away from the finish line. And then behind her, Katie Asmuth and Esther Silog running together through Quarry Road. Nine minutes back from them, Emily Hoggood sitting in fifth place in the women's race. And she had an additional seven and a half minutes on Eda Nilsson, who was just ahead of Taylor Nolan. So third and fourth place, very close. Fifth place, Emily Hoggood, pretty much uh, in no man's land. And then Ida and Taylor, sixth and seventh, closing down. And then to finish out, you have Priscilla Forge one minute ahead of Leah Yingling at Auburn Lake Trails. And they only had eight minutes on Megan Morgan, who we know was being chased down by, by Jenny Quilty. So this entire top 10 on the women's race is going to be banana grams. I'm just gonna throw it out there. We got a little bit of break in the action until Katie makes her way down this way. And then it's going to just be rapid fire, much like we saw with the men's top 10 in this women's race. So we'll continue to be monitoring our feeds at Pointed Rocks, no hands, as we get them. As you can see from the shot at Placer High, the sun is going down, which means our aerial capabilities are no longer, but we will do our best to keep the low cameras hot and on to bring you all of the action. And of course, if you are following your runner of choice, make sure you hop over to ultralive.net. You can favorite your favorite runners, whether you know them personally or not, and follow them along the journey, check their splits, and make sure that they are progressing along their journey down to the Placer High track. As we've just eclipsed the 16 hour mark, no, no shortage of action throwing down here. But with that, I'm gonna go ahead and throw it to the studio to talk about one of our phenomenal sponsors. We'll be back with you shortly here from the Placer High finish line. So my name's Jessica, I go by Jess uh, Brazo, and I am a trail runner, part-time dental hygienist, I study nutrition, I love the outdoors, I mountain bike. I guess I'm a lot of things, and I'm also Jim Walmsley's wife. So my best friend, partner, Jim Walmsley, is running the UTMB. UTMB is um, the Ultra Trail du Mont Blanc. It's a huge run that thousands and thousands of people go to every year. We got back from UTMB last year, sitting down in our living room and just kind of talking about life and the state of the world and also what we wanted to do in the future. And um, his idea was to move to France. <laughs> Two cardboard boxes, some duffels, and some carry-ons. Not just for UTMB, but also 
as um, an opportunity to experience a new culture and put ourselves um, in challenging situations. Well, we poked up just above our house, but now we're disoriented. Mount Blanc's supposed to be this way. That could hopefully help um, just grow both of us as people. I knew we were moving to a small village where the cows outnumber the amount of people. Hi. And also speaking French for us would not be an option the first <laughs> six months we're here. We had our first experience at the grocery store. We went to Biocop. We are cross-checking. This is wheat flour. Wheat flour. I think wheat flour works good. And what normally takes me 20 minutes to grocery shop for the week took an hour and 15 minutes. It's nice to sit down in the car <laughs> and we're finally done. <gasps> But people are really nice and they're receptive and they try to understand us and we try to understand them. Roblechon de Savoie. Mm -hmm. Do. But things like getting a bank account, trying to figure out leasing a car or renting a car, those have been a little bit more tough. Um, but our everyday things I think we're, we're getting pretty good at. Like I can go to the boulangerie, which is the bakery, and order bread now without ordering something that I didn't want to order. And we can go to a restaurant and order in French. So I think this is what we're meant to be doing right now. And we're super grateful for the opportunity to be here. Yeah. Hey the most predictable things have been the sun rises and sets. And outside of that, everything is unpredictable. Some more cows crossing the road. Welcome back in studio here. Dylan Bowman here joined by Corinne Malcolm after a little bit of a break on the track. We are back to bring the action to wherever it is that you are watching. I think first and foremost, we need to address the controversy in the chat, that being the abbreviated interview with Courtney DeWalter. I know, I had such a good question teed up, but she, um, <laughs> she ran a little hard. She's a little sick right now, and so we're allowing her to go lay in medical slash anti-doping yeah. and not putting her uh, back on the stage in a chair maybe tomorrow actually i'll talk to i'll talk to kevin and, and courtney and see if we can get her back on during golden hour tomorrow ahead of awards yeah so we will do our best to get that interview with the champ with the goat so thanks for bearing with us with that it's not super easy to manage the logistics of other finishers arriving here on the track and Courtney, just like one of the greatest performances in sporting history, I feel like. Yeah, no, and, 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 and we need to like pay homage to the amazing achievement she had out there. But we want to also be cognizant that she doesn't want to be on the track right now giving an interview. Oh. And so we're not going to make her do it. Right? That seems fair. Exactly. Right it now, looks like your buddy Janish here. Yeah, Janish Kowalczyk. He's um, being escorted into the finish there by Cordis Hall on his left and Danny Moreno on his right. Remember, he had a pacer um, from Forest Hill to the river, but then has been pacerless on this last 20-mile stretch, and he is going to finish in the M10 position, getting that bib to come back to Western States next year. I already told Miriam, his partner, that I was like, You're, you guys are coming back, right? And she's like, we're coming back. So this is M10? It's M10. Awesome. Great run for Janish. And I mean, to put this in context, he's going to finish in like, what, 16.10? Yeah, Still very, very, very fast. Very fast run for Janish. 11th overall, M10. That's got to be one of the fastest top 10s men's race in history. Another thing Corinne and I were talking about is the delta between Tom Evans' winning time and Courtney DeWalter's winning time was only about 50 minutes. I think that's got to be the smallest delta between the men's winner and the women's winner, at least in the modern era of Western states. Oh, Again, there, there's Miriam joining Janish on the track there. 
Holy Toledo. Heck yeah, Janish. Making Germany proud. His dad, Manfred's probably in the chat. Oh, he's still awake for sure. Come on, Manfred. Janish met him myself for the first time at Black Canyon, where he had an awesome run, finishing third place there behind Anthony Costales and Tom Evans. That's where he earned his golden ticket here to Western States. And we will expect to see, I would guess Katie Shy will be like just on Ellie's course record. Yeah, I think it's gonna be really, really close. Yeah. Um, we don't have um, a split for Ellie at Pointed Rocks because the aid station was actually in a different location. When Ellie ran that race, that was one of those modifies. They moved it off, they moved it off Highway 49 due to, to hazards, due to drunk drivers on the highway, for example. Oh my goodness, stopping to give Tom oh, a hug. Oh, how yes. good is this? <laughs> Paying his respects to the champion, his friend and teammate, Janish giving a hug to Tom Evans as he closes the lap here at Placer High School, earning a proud top 10 finish at Western States. Yes, Janish, sub 16-10, that is bonkers. Super fast time. I wonder, I'm sure we've got <laughs> statisticians. Maybe Liam is still watching from his home in Canada. I'm sure he could crunch the numbers quickly on the fastest 10th place winning time here at Western States. I want to say 1609 has got to be close. I want to say 2019, all the top 10 men were under 16 hours, which was absolutely bonkers. That might have been, and I've said bonkers and like a dozen plus times now in the last 10 minutes, but that is truly the right expression for what has been going on here this evening. Well, that's something that I'm advanced enough to check myself. So let's consult ultrasignup.com here and see. Can I beat you to it? Yeah, mine's going a little bit slow here. Oh no, my internet's not working. We're nothing without the internet, you guys. You don't understand. What a day, Corinne. We've been going for 17 hours. One for the books. Incredible performances. A few disappointments. Sending our love to Keely Henninger. I did hear that she has officially dropped out. I'm sure that's old news to our viewing audience, but something I just learned after spending the last hour or so outside the studio. Okay, aid station fireball. This is the fastest 10th male ever. No way. Thank you, Liam. Thank you, Liam, <coughs> the statistician. If you have enjoyed Liam's stats today, go follow him on Twitter, Aid Station, at Aid Station Fireball. He is amazing. He feeds all of us in the ultra running world all the stats we could ever want. Yeah, one of the greatest follows on Twitter. Good memes, good data, cool graphs sometimes. Oh, sorry, he's saying second fastest, clarification. Kyle Patari, 2019 was faster, yeah. so yeah. you were right. I think yep. all top 10 men there were under 16 hours or something yep. like that. It was That was the year again that I've mentioned that all of the men dropped their pacers on at Roby Point. There's Cody Lind. Cody Lind was getting a pep talk, it sounds like, at the river. He's had a little bit of a tough day out there, but he's being paced in by Luke Nelson, I think. I was really hoping might have seen Keeley's dislocated shoulder and help bandage, bandage her up a little bit. Poor as, Keely. as he's done before for other other humans. Two rounds of bad luck here. I'm convinced Keeley will have her day at Western States. Certainly has all the tools to win here at this incredible race. Fortunately, this is not gonna be her year. And there's Dakota Jones crossing no hands bridge. All right, Dakota. He's gonna make it. Battling for the early lead. Tom Evans all the way through 100K. Be interesting to talk to him and hear where things started to unravel for him. It's interesting to talk to Tom on the track, Corinne, where he said, yeah, there was a little bit of a climb. Figured it's time to push. Dakota went into a hike. I said, I either do it now or I have to do it later. And he did it. And he did it. Katie Scheidt, is that Katie? That is Katie Scheid. Katie Scheid crossing no hands bridge. So she's 30 minutes out from the track here. 
which means she is likely going to be under. This is Rod Farvard coming across um, the white bridge. He is about to come onto the track. This is going to be a very fast 11th place finish for Rod. Not going to get hit by any vehicles out there. A lot of these men were right on the cusp of needing headlamps. Yep. And so likely have like have foregone them or they're tucked into their bags or their packs or their waist belts. But yeah, Rod, Rod raced both Western States and UTMB last year and I think did not do as well as he wanted to at either one of those events. I think that this is um, likely a, a vast improvement over his Western States last year. It won't be a top 10, which I know he wants, but that being said, he's going to be 11th under 1620. Solid run from Rod very, Farvard. Very, very solid run. Cole Watson ran two hours faster than last year. Yeah, incredible. I mean, definitely a fast day. Produced some super fast times. Tom Evans winning in 14.40, the fourth fastest time ever. And, of course, Courtney DeWalter obliterating the women's course record by 60, no, by 77 minutes, finishing in under 15.30. Truly one of the rem remarkable sporting achievements that I can recall ever witnessing myself. And her closest competitor... Katie Scheid, even though she will be likely an hour plus back of Courtney's winning time, still running one of the great 100 mile performances ever. Oh, a massive performance. I was talking to her coach off the track and I was like, you know, Katie's probably still gonna go under the record. And he was like, yeah, and no one's gonna remember. And I was like, oh, we're gonna remember. Yeah. Katie Scheid has run a great Western States. But here comes Rod Farvard onto the track. Remember this guy? Had a tibial plateau fracture this winter from a ski accident. When I saw him back in February, he was on crutches and a straight leg brace. So this is a big comeback story for Rod. Yeah, great comeback story. Rod Farvard from Mammoth Lakes, California. 11th place, the toughest place to finish at Western States. No automatic entry back in 2024. But Rod Farvard should be super proud of this performance. He's going to finish up today at about 16. 16 ish. Yep. 16 hours, 16 minutes and change in all likelihood. A great run from Rod. He should be super proud. Just under 16, 16. Great job, Rod. Oh. Yeah, so just so people people are asking about Gene Dykes as well, who Gene Dykes again is 75 years old, trying to be the oldest finisher here at Western States. He is through Eldorado Creek um, as of 8.15 p.m. He is on his way to Michigan Bluff. He should be there in the next 15 minutes or so, and he'll be able to pick up a pacer there as well at Michigan Bluff. Go, Gene. After dark. Go, Gene, go. Oh, that is a happy Rod Farvard at the finish line. One of the great things that the live stream didn't capture here today was what Corinne and I witnessed on the track as Jeff Colt finished, and then immediately saw Courtney DeWalter sitting in a chair, came up and said, you're my hero, run for office. Yeah, that, was, that was pretty, pretty amazing. <laughs> run for office, Courtney DeWalter. At this point, what more is there for her to achieve within the sport? It's time for her to take on New tasks. So we look back at pointed rocks here, we think. Oh, and also. Is this where we're going to start seeing the. The chase pack that we're waiting for? Have, have they come through I pointed rocks yet? I haven't checked those splits yet. But an update to um, someone asked about, I don't think they were asking about Ooh, Decker. Esther went through pointed rocks five minutes ago in third place. Okay, the battle of the moms between Esther Chillog and Katie Azimuth is well underway. Those two have been battling it out over the past 15 miles in quite a big way. Incredible. Um, but so an update on the youngest 
racer in the field. He's also one of our artistic racers in the field, Zachary Bates. 21 years old. He is on course. He is through Forest Hill. As of 7.43 p.m., he is on his way down to Cal 2. We expect him to be at Cal 2 in the next 30 to 40 minutes or so. And this looks like Katie Asmith coming through Pointed Rocks in fourth place. Again, chasing down fellow mom, Esther Chilag. But going back to what you were just saying, Corinne, awesome story about Zachary Bates. Yeah, That'll be a fun thing for the team to carry to follow throughout the night and into tomorrow. Yeah, 100% running run super, super well. Looks like Katie's being paced by her husband, Pete, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong about that, but it looked like Pete. Awesome to be, see Katie having an awesome day here. Sitting in fourth place overall. Her career best here at Western States was two years ago where she finished fifth. So she's in a position to improve upon that here this year. It looks like she's likely five or six minutes back of Esther Chilog in third place. So we'll see how close the women are behind her. It looks like at Quarry Road. Emily Hoggood was nine minutes back of Katie there. Then Eda Nilsson was another eight behind Emily. Taylor Nowlin basically with Ida there. And then we had the likes of Priscilla Forge, Leah Yingling, Megan Morgan rounding out the top 10. Yeah, it is a battle. How is that? How is that? John group? Ray? Yeah, I think that is John Ray. -a. No, Ludo. Ludo Pomeray. There we go. All right, Ludo. Awesome job here. It looks like he's going to be rounding out a 12th place performance. After a sixth place here last year, the 47 year old champion from France. Super, super strong, Ludo. This guy just doesn't die, huh? It's like even when he's having a tough day, he's still going to run 16.25 at worst. More like 16.21. He's about to enter the track right now. Yep, and um, a, good, a good note in the chat. We'll pass this note along as well for those that will be following Zachary along the course person first. Remembering that Zach Bates is a runner who has autism as opposed to expressing it the other way around. Thank you. Here we go. Ludo on the track for his second Western States finish in two years. Again, as you mentioned, finishing sixth last year. Finishing 12th M position Today here today. Old man strength, as they say. Ludo Pomeray never slowing down. The UTMB champion he won TDS last year at the age of 46. A 20-year career in the sport. An inspiration for the rest of us here. His family traveled with him from France here, finishing up his 100-mile race with him, meeting him at Roby Point to run the final mile. Beautiful thing. 16.22-ish for Ludo here. Still mega fast. Yeah. Finishing with his wife and daughter, Ludovic Pomeray from France. Great run, Ludo. She looks cooked from pacing as well. Yeah. <laughs> no easy feat, I think, pacing Ludo into the finish of Western States. Yeah. Looking down at the finish line atmosphere here. 
It's a little bit quieter than when we saw Tom Evans finish about an hour and a half ago now. Time is a flat circle. Here we are, it looks like back at Pointed Rocks maybe. Runner number 89, Let's see if I can get a name check on him. Well, this is ALT, not Pointed Rocks, it looks like. Runner number 89 is Thomas Wagner from Austria. All right, Thomas, it's probably Toma Wagner back from at, Austria. Back at ALT. Back at ALT. So cool, well on his way to getting a finish here. Looks like 44 years old. Awesome to see this international representation here at the race. Just saw Ludovic Pomeray finish, of course our men's champion, Tom Evans from the UK. We saw Matthew Blanchard finish in, I think, was it seventh place? Overall, maybe sixth male, just behind Courtney DeWalter. So good international representation. We also saw Shen Jia Shen. He had a great race, huh, Karen? Yeah, really, really good. Yeah. He, I was talking to Jason Coop, and he's like, yeah, Patty came in and said, can I push him? And he's like, yeah, of course you can push him. I'm like, what are you doing? Kim Gaylord in the chat saying Katie was great at Pointed Rocks and she's going to push to try and break the old record. Heck yeah, digging deep. And I think Topher is pacing her the whole way in, right? Yeah, we did see her cross No Hands Bridge. At least we thought that was her. It was a little bit tough to identify with the headlamps and stuff. And I don't think we have splits down there, but in all likelihood. Oh, here's Emily Hawgood now leaving Pointed Rocks. Nice. So it looks like she's likely in fifth place. So there's definitely some separation occurring in that once tightly packed women's third through eight positions. So if you're just joining us, Courtney DeWalter has finished and won the 2023 Western States 100 in an astounding time and a new course record of about 15 hours and 30 minutes. We expect Katie Scheid to finish second, probably in the next less than 20 minutes. Again, she will be under the existing and iconic legendary course record set by Ellie Greenwood. Then we had Esther Chilog in third. Hard to predict right now when she'll finish. Katie Asmith behind her. And now Emily Hoggood through Pointed Rocks in fifth. So Katie Scheid went through Pointed Rocks at 8.48 p.m. Oh, look at the, the Pacers light up lights on her pack. That is really awesome. Bring in some Festive. flair. Bring yeah. in some flair to your pacing duties. I appreciate it. Heck yeah. Can you tell who that is? Is that the, what aid station is that? Looks like the river. Tamalpa. Rocky, Rocky Chucky. Chucky. I said I was right. I said the river in my ear, people. Thank you, Billy. So Katie Scheid went through Pointed Rocks 39 minutes ago. I was estimating it should take her about an hour to get here to the track from Pointed Rocks. It's roughly six miles. So if that is the case, is she's going to be right on Ellie Greenwood's course record of 1647. Yeah, it's going to be really, really tight. Although we did see her go through no hands a while. No ago. hands. It, yeah, it's been at least ten or fifteen minutes. So. Yeah, I do. I do think that we'll be picking her up 
Topher's gonna have to push her up that whole climb and be yep. like, you want this? Like, you want you want this? We gotta go. And then I think from there, they can kind of let it roll on the road in a pretty pretty big way. Yeah. So we continue to see the runners arriving at the river. They still have 22 miles to go through the night. We got some, some, some jello legs going on out there right now. <laughs> also, I was talking to Megan Hicks after our prognostication on Friday, which seems like an eon ago. Yep. And she was like, Corinne, we forgot to mention Esther. And I said, I know. We also forgot to mention Zi Fei as well. And I was like, ah, like, can't, we can't do it all. We tried. We know that Esther's going to be a factor. And sure enough, it is looking like she's going to be pushing for a top a podium finish here. She's got, what, a five-ish minute lead over Katie Asmuth, um, who has a eight-minute lead over Emily Hoggood. Emily Hoggood is looking like she might finish F5 once again. So not, not quite bettering on what she did last year as far as placement goes, but hopefully getting a really good run out of herself. And I think while we wait to pick up Katie over by Roby Point, we have a athlete profile of the woman currently ranked six in the race, Ida Nilsson, that we're going to go to. Yeah, I have wanted to run Western States for some years, but then uh, now the last like four years have been a lot of uh, difficulties. Like I had a foot uh, injury for two years, and then it really took time to like uh, getting mileage up again. Like it was even long to run a marathon and. Now I felt this year, like I, I finally felt like I'm starting to get some uh, volume in the running again. So uh, I tried at that canyon, but uh, yeah, I kind of, um, it was a little bit uh, difficult in the middle of the winter, like I hadn't run enough. So I, I exploded at 80K, so I had a bad <laughs> last 20K there. Uh, so then uh, I got back to, to canyons and uh, then I was better prepared and um, and did the race and then I, I was thinking it's like okay I, I will have an open ticket back so if I don't make it I will go back and then I will run the, the world champs and some other races in Europe this summer but then when I, I got the ticket I was, thought it was uh, better to just stay around so I, I um, go, went to Flagstaff and I've been there now for since Canyons and uh, came out to do this uh, the training runs and then I will go back a little bit to Flagstaff again. First of all, I have only done 100k as my longest distance, so a 100 miler is um, totally more time and more. Uh, uh, but also, I felt like, yeah, running here, like more runnable course suits me much better than a more mountainous um, 100 miler. So um, uh, that's why it's like also I felt like oh, Western State, it's uh, probably like a better first 100 miler for me than uh, uh, some other race. So. Um, and definitely I am uh, because I'm coming from like that running background that it's uh, I'm better when it's not super technical, steep, steep up and down, you know, I'm trying to learn and I think it's fun to train in. It's still not my strength in, uh, in racing. So um, yeah, hopefully I, I can last a hundred mile and uh, I like the trails here. I like the trails on canyons and uh, the parts I've seen now it's, um, yeah, it's really a lot of downhill. <laughs> it's like, maybe it would be nice with some more climbs, but uh, why I would like to run Western State, because it's not like really it's like, oh, I just want to do a hundred miler. I don't think I have that urge, but it's certain races that is unique and fun to, to run. So I don't think it's the distance in itself. It's it's the race to attract me. It could be it could be hundred K or 200. I mean, it doesn't matter. It's, uh, it's, it's the race history and the uniqueness of this place. We're we are live. back here in studio. 9.31 p.m. That means we are 16 and a half hours deep into this year's Western States 100. How did that happen? I don't know. Time moves so fast when you're having the time of your life. It is such a beautiful, pleasant evening here. These runners were gifted with a truly special day here on the Western States course. Chill vibes starting to overtake the infield here. People laying around, kicking back, having a frosty cold one. Doing some other stuff that Put, smells a little funny. Yeah. 
not Must too be funny some though. Must be teenagers around here. Yeah, you know, just just a little bit funny. Someone asked how Cody Lind is doing. Doing Cody Lind is on his way to the track with pacer Luke Nelson, but it sounded like he needed a bit of a pep talk out at um, the river crossing. Just things were going a little bit south. I don't know if it was his stomach or not, but he's on his way here with a really, really excellent pacer, but just not having not having his day. Yeah, so it looked like, okay, so yeah, that's where we saw Dakota also. Things sort of together as they crossed No Hands Bridge. And I think Katie Shy was not far removed from that group, if memory serves correct. So yeah, we still are waiting. Who do we see last? Ludovic Pomeray. So we still have a lot of sort of big name athletes or people who we are expecting to be favorites in today's race out on the race course, the likes of Arlen Glick, John Ray, Scott Trayer, Cody Lynn, Dakota Jones, JP Giblin, Lou Okanhua, Adam Mary, Alex Nichols, etc. are still due to finish here this evening. Looks like Arlen Glick, John Ray, and Scott Trayer have all gone through Roby Point. So we may have a bit of a sprint. A little bit of a drag race here for the 13th through 15th positions. Yeah, Arlen, Arlen, sorry, Arlen, that's not his name. Arlen, or Arlen's Darlins. Um, Arlen had a four-ish minute gap over John Rea, and then I think John Rea had about a minute on Scott Trayer. So those, those three are going to be coming in here fast and furious. Arlen Glick on your screen right now, making his way to the track with his pacers. Nice round from Arlen. Looks like he'll close it out in 13th position here. Last year's third place finisher. Arlen Glick. I wonder if he's the type of guy who wished it was harder conditions out here today. Yeah, I think he thrives in the heat. I yeah. think he and Emily Hoggett are both people who really, really thrive in the heat. So I have to imagine that they're kicking, not kicking themselves a little bit, but would have wanted it to be a little bit more awful out there. Yeah. Not awful enough out there today. Not awful enough. You hate when that happens, you know? When things just aren't awful enough. So John Ray should be next behind Arlen Glick. So he's going to be looking at a 14th place position. Last year he was 24th. I just want to point out that Rod Farvard, who we saw finish just outside the top 10, he finished in 2248 last year. Wow. So I'm, I'm going to give him so most he, most improved, maybe. That's a six-hour. A six-and-a-half-hour PR. A six-hour PR for Rod Farvard. You know he's got more to give. <laughs> That's something to be proud of. Here Arlen comes onto the track. Arlen Glick, last year's third-place finisher. Not quite the same day today, but it's still an amazing performance. Arlen, you've made it here. I know he's going to be hungry for more. He's going to Havelina. He's going to get a golden ticket. He'll be back here next year. Yeah. A fair assumption. Yeah, exactly. Ar Arlen's run a 12 hour and change hundred before. The dude is fast. Yep. And to be fair, he's only, you know, 30-ish minutes off of his time from last year. Yeah. You know, he ran a 15, he ran a 15.56 last year for third. He's gonna run a, a 16, yeah, a 15. 56 last year, 1636 this year. Not, not a horrible yeah. day at the office. Yeah. Just not good enough today. Not a perfect day for Arlen Glick, but he finishes with a big smile. Thir 16 hours, 37 minutes. And his whole family in tow. Oh, question is, the, the man has hard rock in two weeks. That's or true. Three weeks. Three weeks. Yep. So, uh, Someone asked, did, do you think he saved a little? Redemption. I don't know if he saved a little, but it's one of those things, too, where maybe he's like, do I have to go to the absolute well for this or not? Yeah, I think he's a tough enough dude. His whole family there. To go out to Silverton and have a good day himself. 
He is a toughie. He's really good at sticking these things out. He was here last year in 1852, so he's got a... Okay, Katie Scheid now through Roby Point. That means she will, in all likelihood, be safely under the existing course record held by Ellie Greenwood, as we see John Ray closing out his 100-mile day here in 14th position. Somebody who I expected to be sort of in the middle of the top 10. John Ray still looking for his perfect day here. And, and, it, and while it wasn't perfect, it's still an improvement over last year. Last year he finished in 18.52.20. This year he's going to finish in 16.38.25. Yeah. So nearly a two-hour improvement over last year. Solid day for John Ray. If he can do two more hours next year, I think that podium's his. I think he's the type of guy who, like, everybody in Boulder knows who he is and knows he's, like, a, a crusher. Super fast cr local crusher, but he flies under the radar everywhere else. Here comes Katie Scheid. Man, what a day for Katie. I love that Katie Scheid's gone, like, full. She is full Euro, but it's, like, I, I'm a big fan, a big adopter of the, like, elastic elastic strap for my number, number bib there. Like, that is really awesome. She's really, really close. You guys, I think it's going to be down to the wire here. I don't know that we're going to quite sneak under. I'm nervous. She, sh she, she should. should. She should yeah. just sneak under. She I keeps think she went at, through Roby Point at 33. Okay, she so keeps looking at her watch. Ago. She's moving. She's yeah. not running slowly here. She's I think, pushing for this. Yeah, maximum it should take 11 or 12 minutes from Roby Point. So. Yeah, Katie Scheid is making her way to the finish here at the track where Dylan and I will go. Hall tail over to the finish line. So following up her win at UTMB last fall, Katie Scheid now coming home to the U.S. to finish second here at Western States. One of the great performances in Western States history. Yeah, on the track right now is Scott Treyer. Look at him run on the track right now. He's booking it. So he finishes 15th here today. Last year he was 10th. Let's see how his times compare. He was 16.35 last year, so he's only five minutes back of last year's time but five places lower solid run from scotty Treyer. this race is just so hard it's difficult for people to understand when they see these crazy fast finishing times tom evans finishing 1440 you know that's six hours faster than people run UTMB. But it really is a different kind of 100 mile racing. Here's Katie Scheid. Closing out the final mile here for Western States journey. Unbelievable race here from Katie Scheid. UTMB champ now taking home a second place. Oh my goodness, here she comes. You can see the track. Come on, Katie. She's got four minutes. Hofer is charging on her shoulder right now. Oh, yeah, where's Topher? I think that was Coop. Well, it was Coop. I don't know. Maybe she to dropped Topher. Topher. <laughs> Topher, where'd you go, buddy? Topher is. Topher might have gotten dropped. Somewhere along the trail. 
It's Katie Shy enters oh, the stadium. No, here. there's oh that's Coop and Kim. Yeah, yeah where is Topher? No, that's not Kim. They're probably already here somewhere. They're probably waiting for her on the track. I mean, he he paced her across Pointed Rocks. He can't be anywhere else. Huh. Well, we'll figure it out. But either way, Katie Shy was running that last mile solo from Roby Point, rounding out one of the great 100-mile races in history. Here, going to finish in 16. Four, sub 16.44 in all likelihood. Going so she will be three minutes off of the old course record to minutes. finish second here today. Again, Absolutely unreal. To repeat something we've said a couple of times on the broadcast and throughout the week, nobody has been within 23 minutes of Ellie Greenwood's course record. Katie Scheid now finishing Fast three minutes under it. Faster than Beth Pascal, faster than Ruth Croft. Katie Scheid, you are a champion. Congratulations on your second place finish here today. Wild. 16, 43, 44. Unbelievable run. She has to be super happy. And we're gonna go join Katie on the track, assuming she doesn't vomit. We'll see you on the track. Second fastest female performance in the history of the race. Katie Shai.
All right, we are down at the river as runners continue their journey towards Auburn through the night. We got the boat crossing. Not as uh, pleasant of a dip as it was just a few hours ago to hop in the river, but these runners are still getting bundled up and hopping over. I believe we do still have the brother of our race director and the founder of Squirrel's Nut Butter manning the ship. Uh, we got a couple boats going around. And just a huge shout out to all of our volunteers who are helping getting these runners all the way from the start to the finish as we pan through the aid station as well. We are setting up our interview here at the finish line with our second place female, Katie Scheid, who just still ran lights out. Just a phenomenal performance right around the previous course record from 2012 that again had not been touched within 25 minutes before today. So no small feat of what Katie was able to put down here. So gonna be interested uh, and super excited to hear from her about how her day went. And then we still have eyes back. Uh, we are tracking the rest of the women's top 10 race. We've got about six women within 20 minutes of each other through pointed rocks. So much like we saw in that race for the men's podium, uh, a lot of folks are gonna be hunting. If you have legs to get up and over to Roby and power down the neighborhood asphalt, this could be your day to move up a few spots here at Western States. And speaking of, if you have legs on the asphalt, we got some runners coming in right now. I believe this should be Cody Lind making his way down here. We talked earlier about how much of a family affair that Western States is, and Cody definitely uh, embodies that to the T with his father being the uh, formerly involved with the medical team here. Deep roots in, in, in the family. So Cody enjoying his journey on down to the track. M9 last year. So not quite the same day, but all things considered, just uh, going to come in about half an hour behind his time from last year and absolutely great performance from Cody Lind making his way on down. And he makes this last wiggle and enters the Placer Hyde track. And you know he's gonna get some love. You can hear the roaring begin. as he gingerly continues to make his way around. His crew is hyping up the crowd. And on the back step now we have Cody Got Cody Lind finishing up the last 100 meters of his Western States. Definitely favoring one side. Probably wasn't the day that he had hoped for and dreamed of, but that does not deter the spirit of a man determined to make it all the way to the finish line.
and wrapping up his third consecutive finish here at Western States. Cody Lind, 16.55 on the clock, 18th overall. And really pushed throughout the day from a whole host of folks. An incredibly deep men's field. And just behind him by three minutes is Dakota Jones, who is mixing it up right at the sharp end of the race early today. But not giving up, he will be coming to the track here in just a few short minutes as we take some views down back at Rucky Chucky. Folks making their way on down to the boats to cross on over. And a lot of the folks that you're seeing at this juncture are really vying for those silver buckles getting under that 24 hour mark. So they have about seven hours to make their way from the river, that last 20 or so miles down here to the track. And right now we're back here at I believe this is Forest Hill with a Gordy Ainsley sighting because why not? The original Western States runner just hanging out in Forest Hill, being a part of the spectacle. So absolutely crushing it. And again, got to shout out our volunteers for making sure that these runners, whether they're finishing in 14 hours or 30, that they're getting the support all the way around. And we have eyes on one Dakota Jones. Coming down this, coming down this last downhill. The man who biked 650 miles to be here, making sure he gets his money's worth, finishing the entire 100 miles on foot. And just two last turns, and he will be here on the Placer High track. Fist pumps. And a man who'd been waiting to run this race for so long. Gonna get a lot of love when he gets here on the track and here he is. So Dakota Jones got into this race as a result of his victory at Havelina last year. Coming just a few short months after his third place at Hard Rock. So you can say that he's had quite a spectacular last 12 months here. Capping it off with 
the special experience that is. 100.2 miles from Olympic Valley down here to the Placer High track. Showing love to all those showing love to him. This is Dakota Jones. Keeping his legs under him just long enough to get the award from our race director. And Dakota had a day out there. He was up there pushing along. First and, first and second place up there with Tom Evans. And even when things started to go a little bit sideways, he did not let that deter him from getting here to the finish at the track. Gotta respect it, gotta love it, that he continued to grind all the way down here. And so momentarily, now that the track is cleared. We will try to get a conversation going with our second place female, Katie Scheid. Meanwhile, Esther Shalog has just cleared Roby Point about three minutes ago. So we'll have her bopping on down here to the track in just a few minutes as well to round out our women's podium. So let's go ahead and throw it on down to the track and have a conversation with our second place female, Katie Scheid. While our camera repositions, we're actually got eyes here on Esther. As I mentioned, currently in third place. And grinding this last downhill to the finish line. She got in as a result of her fifth place finish at UTMB last year. Golden ticket rolled on down to her and she has completely capitalized on the moment. She was also fourth place at last year's World Championships long trail race in Thailand back in November. Check, so no check, stranger check. to surviving hot conditions and clearly that experience over the, over the last fall between UTMB and Thailand has definitely crossed Tropical on over. John, Tropical John, if you so don't we'll mind turning down the tunes. So we'll catch her here at the finish momentarily. But we right now, Debo Corinne, take here. it away with Katie. Up in the booth, if you don't mind turning down the music here on the track. Thanks, TJ. Okay, welcome back to the finish line. We are. Going to hang out for a few minutes here with our second place women's finisher, Katie Scheid. Before we do so, I think it's important to just remind everybody that we witnessed history here in the women's race today. Courtney DeWalter winning. And Katie Scheid not only putting together one of the best races in Western States history, but one of the best races in ultra running history here today. Katie, where to begin? Maybe tell us about those opening miles running together with Courtney. Um, yeah, I thank you, Courtney, for being my tour guide. Um, we had a fun time. I was waiting for her to dig the knife in, though, and she did. Um, but it was, it was fun at the beginning. It's always fun at the beginning. I heard a rumor ahead of the race that you felt maybe most confident about the first 50K and had a little bit of, not hesitation, but nerves about maybe the legs that would come for the 
final 20 miles that were super, super fast. Did that play into kind of tactics off the front of the race? Um, yeah, I think I knew that it was going to be a little chaotic um, if I stayed in the group. And yeah, I just kind of asked Coop if it was okay if I went <laughs> on a little faster. <laughs> he was just like, do whatever you want. So <laughs> um, no, but honestly, I thought we would all be in a group and then uh, Courtney and I were with some of the guys going up the climb and I looked back briefly at one point and I didn't see any other girls and it only been like less than an hour. So yeah, I was like, okay, well, yeah, let's just keep going. Although I did have that like, um, what's this thing where you can't win if you're the first to the top? Yeah, but Courtney went first and then we were like, Okay, now you have to win so you can break this thing. <laughs> and she did, so good job. <laughs> so you must have had an awareness, at least for the last several hours, that you were flirting with Ellie Greenwood's historic time here. Were you looking at your watch the whole time? Was the course record on your mind? Did you know the historical pace you were on? Um, yeah, I was asking Topher for splits all the time. Um, but I had some like pretty serious stomach problems on that whole section. So I was just trying to move the best I could. And um, then we came into Quarry Road and I was telling Topher that I was having a lot of trouble eating and I was just like, tell me what to eat because I can't make decisions anymore. And he's like, Scott Jurek and Hal Corner are gonna be there. And I was like, no, this is like not true. This is not possible. <laughs> and then they were both there and gave me a quesadilla we're going to have to, yeah. All right, we're taking a brief break in the interview to see our third place female come through the line, family in hand. By way of Hungary through Hong Kong, this is Esther Silog, 1707. For third place female. And again, let's put this in perspective. We went from not having anyone within 20 some odd minutes of Ellie Greenwood's 1647. And Esther does just that to finish third on just an iconic day in women's ultra running here at Western States. Huge congrats to her as she takes it all in. The Hoka and T8 athlete again had a great fall between UTMB finishing fifth place and then fourth at the World Championships long trail. And she finishes just uh, about 20 minutes back of the winner of last year's UTMB, Katie Scheid. So really good to see that the expanded golden ticket opportunities to some of these international races have really brought depth additional depth to Western States with these two performers taking second and third here at the Western States 100. And you see we're getting our camera back. We're about to throw it back down to the finish line to finish up that conversation with Katie. Debo, Corinne, back to you guys. Check, check, check. Okay, we are back here with Katie Scheid. Katie's enjoying her ramen noodles here. You were telling us about the time you spent with Hal Kerner and Scott Jurek. I heard you guys got a selfie together at Quarry Road at mile 90. Nine combined wins between those two champions of Western States. That must be a fun memory for you. Anything you want to share? Yeah, um, I hope Scott sends me the selfie. <laughs> 
you had quite the crew out there, including, I think, a bunch of college friends who have appeared all over the course as well. Can you tell us a little bit about the team behind the team? Because I feel like you, while you had to run every single step, you had quite the support system. Yeah, I, in January or something when I was planning this, I was thinking I was going to be like super minimal and not be able to find anyone to help, and then I ended up having to turn people away, so this was quite exciting. But yeah, I had um, Megan and, or Maud and Steven, <laughs> Megan and Steve, um, who I used to work in a hut with in New Hampshire. Then I had um, Brandon Schock, who's a friend from Zurich, Switzerland, who came um, for crew duties. Uh, my parents and my sister um, did a lot of the messy work today, wiping me down, so... I'm probably forgetting somebody, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, him and, him and Topher, obviously. <laughs> and Coop, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Her pacer, Topher, has made it to the finish. We just wanted to confirm that Topher Gaylord is alive after being dropped at No Hands Bridge. As I said to Craig Thornley, it's not the first time Topher has exploded on the Western States course. <laughs> Uh, maybe winding down here, Katie. Your partner, Germain, won the 90K of Mont Blanc in Chamonix yesterday. You guys have been, been apart for, what, six weeks at this point? What, you've been nine weeks since you've been in the U.S.? Both of you sort of celebrating probably two of the best performances of your career from a world apart. Have you had a chance to speak to each other yet? No, I think it, he's probably still asleep. I think it's 6 a.m., right? <laughs> I, I'll call him soon. <laughs> well, a big round of applause for our second place finisher, Katie Scheid, here today. Again, running the second fastest time in Western States history, second only to today's champion, Courtney DeWalter. A day to remember here at Western States. All right. So we got a little visual of the river happening right now. But we're going to be back at the track momentarily because while that interview was happening, Katie Asmuth went through Roby Point in 1707. So about five minutes ago, she crossed through and is in the final mile of her journey down here to the Placer High track. Last year's ninth place female has an eight minute gap uh, or lead on uh, Emily Hoggood, or did through Pointed Rocks. And then the the pack gets very tight in this women's race uh, to round out that top 10. So we're definitely gonna be following it as all 10 women are through Pointed Rocks. Uh, and between Katie and Ida Nilsson, so we had four runners, they were all within 16 minutes of each other. So Katie should lead that train on down um, but anything can happen behind her, and we will be following that all the way down to the finish line as we follow yet another person entering the track right now. Mr. J.P. Giblin is on the back stretch of the track. Coming out of Boulder, one of the Boulder boys has had quite the come up over the last year. A lot of folks uh, found out about him for the first time at this year's Bandera 100K where he took second place and earned his golden ticket here. Uh, but last year, he was the lead man winner, including an 1807 performance at the Leadville 100. So put together a great fall campaign, came back, locked it up on his first try at the golden ticket, and here he is coming through into his last 100 meters here at the Western States 100. You see him coming through, taking it in, give us some high fives. Finishing I believe only his third 100 miler ever. Definitely gonna be a 100 mile PR for him. And the tales he'll be able to tell about today are gonna be quite, 
quite the tail, but here he is, J.P. Giblin, 17-15. Coming through, 18th place male, 21st overall. And the next person, as I was mentioning, coming down should be Katie Asmith. So we'll keep eyes out for, for her as she approaches the track as we are looking back. Again, I believe we're back up here at Forest Hill. Make sure folks are getting in the fuel and keeping it going. <laughs> and here we are on the approach towards Placer High. Folks waving at the drone because this is probably the most aerial action that happens in Auburn throughout the year. So wave hi, wave hi to your friends at home as we are searching for Katie, as she comes in, we'll take it back down to the river. Safety first as we're securing all the boats, making sure we get everybody across in one piece and keeping them moving towards the finish line. And while we have our age groupers moving through the field, we have our fourth place female coming into the track area on what is just an absurdly deep day for the women's race. Hyper competitive, everybody getting the most out of themselves and getting the most out of each other. Katie Asmuth moving up five places from last year's performance as she makes the last left-hand turn and following the blue dots on down the hill. Crew in tow. As I mentioned, Katie had about an eight minute gap on Emily Hoggood at the last aid station. So she should be able to take it all in and appreciate this downhill instead of having to hammer it home. And with Emily Hoggood through Roby Point a few minutes ago, we will begin this Very tight pack running of women coming in to round out our top 10. Katie has put together quite the string of performances since her top 10 finish last year. She placed third at Gorge Waterfalls 50K just uh, a few months ago. Also had a third place at the Way Too Cool 50K, uh, which is notoriously a barn burner. So definitely showed flashes of that leg speed. I'm sure she's pretty stoked that she doesn't have to utilize it too much right here and gets to enjoy all of these steps with her crew, with her friends and family as she makes this last chicane and enters the Placer High track Speaking with her crew earlier in the day, they were super excited about how she was executing her plan. Her spirits were high, their spirits were high. They were having a grand old time while they were waiting for her at aid stations. And they're matching powder blue tops as you see them on the track wearing right now. And 
so they're gonna enjoy this last 200 meters with your fourth place female. Last year's F9, improving on that by five spots. Enjoying the time with the littles here. And you see it's so stoked, fist pumping, hands in the air, showing love to everybody. The kids are having a good time. Everybody's all smiles. Any pain that you might have felt throughout the first 100 miles or washed away in this last point too. Improving mightily on her performance from last year. Again, an all time performance would have been the Would have been one of the best performances in the last decade. It still is for fourth place, Katie Hattismith. 17.21. Just phenomenal. Improves on her time from 2021 by a full hour. Improves on her time from last year by over two hours. Just a phenomenal day. Can't be mad about how it played out for just an absolute crusher, Katie Asmuth. The stoke is high on the track. And you're watching Lo Canwa. Wild, wild performance by Lowe. He won, or excuse me, he was second place at the Canyons 100 miler. The Canyons 100 miler back in April. Got his golden ticket from Thailand. This is his third 100 miler in the last like nine months. And he comes through and crushes it in 1723. Absolutely strong, and you saw it like you saw that stride coming around the track. Gotta love it. Representing Lijiang, China. Good day for him. So, the next male we should see coming through here is going to be Adam Mary, and it's going to be mixed in with this women's race that we're watching. As I mentioned, Emily Hoggood went through Roby about 10 minutes ago now. So any moment she should be popping on to the track here. Rounding out our top five for the women and kicking off what is going to be a very dense, very competitive race to get a top 10 performance and not have to work your way into this race for next year. And so again, I'm looking back at these 2019 
times since that was a pretty analogous weather year to what we experienced this year, a little bit of snow in the high country. We're currently at 1725. That would have been good for 18th place in 2019. Claire Gallagher ran 1723 that year. And we already have four women and a fifth one, Emily Hoggood, smashing onto the track right now. All smiles, embracing the moment. Emily Hoggood, last year's fifth place female, going to repeat that feat here. In addition to her fifth place last year, placed sixth at UTMB. Representing Zimbabwe. I think we got the flag out in its full glory here. Kick it into the finish. F5 in 2022. F5 in 2023. But way, way faster this time. This is Emily Hoggood. Seventeen twenty-six this year. A whole 50 minutes faster than she put down last year. Just wild, absolutely wild. Fifth place female this year, would have been first female in 2018, ahead of one Courtney DeWalter. Just shows you the depth of this women's race this year. Absolutely, absolutely insane. And behind her, is just going to be mayhem, absolute mayhem. As I've mentioned, we have Taylor Nolan, Ida Nelson, Priscilla Forge, Leah Yingling, all within 13 minutes of each other through Pointed Rocks, and just a few minutes behind Emily when she uh, was at that same aid station. Taylor actually just cleared Roby Point less than a minute ago. So she was three minutes ahead. Taylor Nolan was three minutes ahead of Ida Nilsson at Pointed Rocks. So we'll see if that gap is holding. And so we'll be monitoring that as Taylor is now within the last mile of her Western States journey. And then Ida had another five and a half minutes, about six minutes up on Priscilla. But as we know, from Pointed Rocks to Roby, that climb, it might only be, you know, five, six, seven hundred feet, but this late in the race can feel a whole hell of a lot harder. So we'll see how these women progress through no hands. I believe we have a volunteer, a volunteer over there. And as I was talking about, hey, sometimes the uh, the legs fail you on Roby. Sometimes the legs fail you trying to get in the boat. After you just bomb down Cow Street, yeah, you know, you know, just just take a beat to sit down and try not to uh, fall backwards out the boat. So, shout out to all of our athletes making it along the course here. And if you're trying to track your runner, make sure you go to ultralive.net and search by name, and you can follow them along. But with that, while we track these women come down to the track, I'm gonna throw it to a short commercial break.
Check, 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 check. Check, check, check. Okay, we are here for what is likely going to be our final finish line interview. So we're going to make it a big one here with third, fourth, and fifth place finishers. Esther Chilog, Katie Asmith, Emily Hoggood. Incredible running. Some of the fastest times here ever at Western States. We'll start with Esther. Esther, your first time here at Western States, you ran what I think is going to be the fourth fastest time ever. Tell us your impressions of this amazing race. Yes. I'm surprised. I didn't know what was my time. I was just uh, running the race. And um, I think till Robinson Flat, we were running in groups because it was not easy to follow the course. Yeah. So that was good to, that we shared the eyes. Yeah, for sure. And then... From there, I was mainly running alone till I didn't get my pacers, and they did an amazing job. They really looked after me and also my crew, so I was in good hands. And then with Katie, we ended up running quite a, while, quite a bit, right? It was the best day of my life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, it was so fun. We're going to have a lot of tears, I think, in this little interview. Katie... I think when you started the race, we were wondering, you know, like, what, what were you going to have in the tank? You've had a hard year. You fractured your navicular during this race last year. You are non way bearing Then you had this spring of ups and downs that I think prevented you from probably having, like, the perfect prep possible. And then you just ran some bonkers time under 17.30. How are you feeling right now? So surprised. <laughs> uh... Yeah, this day was really uncertain for me. I didn't know what was going to happen out there. And my number one thing all day was I'm just going to be happy. Like, I really wanted to enjoy every step. And it was, <laughs> I really did. It was the wildest thing. I've never run 100 miles and be clear, like, minded all day. I mean, my body is another story that's <laughs> trashed. Uh, totally, like, ugh. But uh, my mind was clear, and it was such a gift because I could, like, like, cheer for everybody. Like, I felt really present all day, and I just had fun. It was really, really, really fun. I mean, yeah. I will say, so trying to chase you down. Obviously, I'm in fourth place, really wanted to podium, like, tried to give my soul I did give my soul again and couldn't get you. Like, I, I'm so impressed. That was so fun. And literally while I'm like, <laughs> like doing everything I can, I'm saying to my pacer, I'm saying, this is so fun, you know? Like, it was, it, it, it definitely, I was saying it was the best day of my life, but after the birth of my kids and marrying my husband, uh, I think I think it was the best day of my life. Definitely the funnest day of my life. It was awesome. Amazing. <laughs> Emily, fifth place here last year, fifth place again this year. Maybe compare and contrast these two experiences. What made this year special? I think um, when I was looking at my watch at like, Michigan Bluff and Forest Hill. I was just blown away with how incredibly strong of a women's field we had. I mean, I didn't know what was going on in the men's field, so I'm sure they were amazing too. <laughs> but um, like, just seeing the women, yeah, we were all together the whole day. How Esther said she had some time on her own. I don't think I ever had time on my own <laughs> for 17 and a half hours. Yeah, and to have at least four of us together the whole way totally. running that strong like wow like our sport so has rad. really grown as a sport and the caliber of athlete was amazing and today really showed that um, <laughs> yeah <laughs> Esther, I think that you were under the radar for a lot of people, which I don't think 
was maybe a good idea for those people. But you will for, forever never be under the radar again. How are you feeling about that? It's good not to be under the, the radar. Uh, sorry for the pronunciation. Um, because there is less pressure. <laughs> I enjoy that. <laughs> We'll have to apply a little bit more pressure next time, I guess. <laughs> Corinne and I were talking today. You were fifth at UTMB. You were fourth at the World Championship. Now third in one of the fastest times ever at Western States. This girl's legit, as Katie says. And when Katie finished, you guys give a high five. You said, moms. <laughs> Heck yeah. Two moms representing. Katie, I remember two years ago when you finished fifth here. You were so happy. You were similarly glowing how you are now. And you said, I can't wait to come back next yeah. year. And you did. So you finished ninth last year. Yeah. And here we are again. Now you finished fourth, your best performance here. We talked earlier this week about your love for Western states. Maybe share it with the people here. Well, I will say, it turns out the race is a lot more fun on a cool year. Like, way more fun. Highly recommend a cool year. Um, so, I think, yeah, I mean, this, this, I love this course. I love this community. I, I love all of you in the stands. My freaking crew. Oh, my God. My pacers. So good. And, yeah, I mean, my sponsor, Saucony, I just feel super supported. And I mean, this race for me is like, where I want to be. I mean, and I do think that the course like suits my skill set um, sometimes. Um, and, and, you know, I think like compared to a UTMB or something, like I, I think I'm more of a runner. We're on me, Jeff. Climber, um, which um, you can hit the track if you want. Climbs. Uh, but uh, I'm not going to, like, hold myself to that. Just that's my current moment. I'm changing that. Um, and I'm doing CCC, so, like, watch out, competitors. Um, I'm going to work on those climbs. I did just fine. Um, uh -huh. Oh, no, I want my kids. Uh, so, yeah. So, guys, on the down, when you go into the track, there's some potholes. Just watch it. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks for doing this. Like, how it's, cool is the live stream, right? It's like the 10 feet yeah, right Gino, before you hit the you track. You killed it. And the volunteers. Did I not say the volunteers? And Craig Thorne. Like, I mean, there's so many. And Diane. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. There's so many of you. There's so many people involved that put this day on. And it's so, it, it's, it's just incredible. And it's throughout the whole year, you know. You're just so invested in the, in the day from all the golden ticket races and I mean, everything with the fire and all, everybody. Yeah. I'm going to watch out for these holes. Big fan. <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like we have another runner on the track, so we'll sort of wrap it up there. But a big round of applause for our third through fifth place finishers. <laughs> Esther Chilog, Katie Asmith, Emily Hoggood. Uh, Some of the fastest times ever here at Western States. Thank you, Debo, and on the back stretch we have our sixth female coming in. This is Taylor Allen. She is seventh class. We've got F6 this year, improving one position on where she finished last year. Taylor Nolan coming on around the track. As I mentioned, seventh here last year, went on to finish ninth at last year's CCC. And comes through and improves one spot here in 2023. Running 1740, Taylor Nolan. And this is where, this is where the train is gonna begin. So, Taylor, was just behind Ida Nilsson at Quarry. Gapped her by three minutes through Pointed Rocks. Had a four minute lead on her at Roby. We have, make sure I 
quote this right. We have Priscilla Forgi just four minutes back of Ida at Roby. Priscilla had about four minutes on Leah Yingling through Pointed Rocks. It's, if you don't have legs for this downhill section, or really to get over Roby, like this whole seven through 10 can, can flip around very quickly, just like we saw on the men's side. So we're gonna try to get our, our cameras up there with some light, as you can imagine, uh, with, with the darkness. We're doing everything we can to, to get as many views as we can for you all. But here we are. Looks like we have Ida. Trying to make sure that I've got as clear of a shot as possible. You can imagine low light plus a bunch of headlights at you aren't super great. But yeah, that is Ida Nilsson coming on down towards the track. As I mentioned, she came through Roby with about a four minute head start over Priscilla, Priscilla Forgy. which means she should have more than enough time to enjoy this last journey, the last 250 meters of her first ever 100 miler. The Northern Arizona University alum who's had quite the storied career, but had not checked the 100 mile box at the training camp kept telling people don't don't be overconfident don't put all these expectations on me i just want to get through it i don't know what i'm getting myself into well she got herself into a good a good journey out there a great time in being part of just a phenomenally competitive women's race Coming in sixth on the women's side, representing Sweden, this is Ida Nilsson. Seventeen forty three on the clock. Just an absolutely stellar day. Again, comparing it to that 2019 year, very similar weather-wise, that would have put her just behind Brittany Peterson in third place on the women's side. Good enough for sixth here today on the women's side and in her debut, in her debut 100 miler. Cannot overstate how spectacular it is to to execute the way that she did a very smart tactical pragmatic day out there i'm sure she's going to have some thoughts about things she could have cleaned up and ways that she could have upped the performance a little bit but the way i see it can't be mad about how that all went down Just phenomenal seventh place female performance for Ida Nilsson. And again, we're gonna go back up the road and wait for Priscilla Forge to come on down because she should be here in just a few moments as we try to get a camera back up there. You see more action happening down at Rucky Chucky. Folks, getting a good old splash as they move through the river. And again, there's gonna be so much support for these runners throughout the night. If you're trying to find a runner, definitely hop over to that ultralive.net and check it out. But down here at the track, we're checking out 
Priscilla Forgey coming through. Eighth place female. She had a two minute gap on Leah Yingling at Roby Point. Looks like she's been able to hold on to it. Priscilla, she was second just a few months ago at the Canyons 100K. She knows how to battle. She's seen quite, quite the uh, array of bad terrain. She was not scared of today's course and she battled like a pro capitalizing on that golden ticket to find herself in the top 10 and guaranteed to be back here next year should she decide to do it f8 priscilla forgy sure our neighbors to the north are quite pleased with that. And now our attention turns yet again to the asphalt as we fully expect Leah Yingling to be here in short order, having come through Roby Point just two minutes after Priscilla. So we'll keep eyes out for her as she will be coming in as our ninth place female. Meanwhile, we are back at the river up. Oh, see, they got her. Shout out to our volunteers running up and down hill repeats uh, in the neighborhood to get us these shots. But a whole crew supporting the Lululemon athlete. She had a whole team of folks from Lululemon out here to do some, some studies to learn what trail running was all about. And today, I think they got a pretty good lesson. As Leah is on the back stretch. Her partner sprinting across the field to make sure he gets the shot. The entire single track podcast crew stoked to be supporting their friend, their colleague, a woman who is no stranger to this race having finished sixth place last year. Again, guaranteeing her spot in next year. After her sixth year, she went to the World Championships, 18th place in the 80K long trail, and then was like, you know what? Let me work on my foot speed. Dropped down, ran that way too cool 50K here in the Auburn area, the cool area. Finished second place. And it paid off as she is cruising here to the finish line as F9. This is Salt Lake City's own Leah Yingling. Very much look forward to her breakdown of her race and the race overall. I had the pleasure of commentating Bandera uh, while she was the on-course correspondent and her encyclopedic knowledge of this sport and her analytical nature of it served her well then and I'm sure it served her well on course today as she was getting an embrace from Mike, her partner. So looking forward to hear the tales from Leah. F9, congratulations. As we flip it back to Forest Hill, more runners coming through and cruising along. Spirits are high, vibes are high. People are just having a good time. Having a good time. We got I thought we had bubbles for a second. Nope, we just got like a little laser light show going on down by the river. Gotta love that. That is the, oh, those are bubbles. Okay, I wasn't tripping. Good. That is the proper vibe for 1050 on a Saturday night. Nothing says party like disco and bubbles. Ask every 
Chicago Rave Kid. And so now things are gonna get a little bit more chill here at the finish line. On the women's side, we have one more person who's going to guarantee their entry into next year's race. Right now, Megan Morgan is holding down that spot. Had about 25 minutes over Jenny Quilty at Pointed Rocks. Went through that aid station some 45 minutes ago. And so I'd actually expect to see her coming through Roby probably in the next, mm, I'm gonna say six to 10 minutes or so if she's feeling all right. Speaking of feeling all right, I gotta appreciate that at the Squirrels Nut Butter tent, somebody was actively applying Squirrels Nut Butter. Even with the temperatures being cool, doesn't mean you can't take care of yourself. And that's gonna be the name of the game for these runners to make sure that they are uh, in, in good spirits and good physical condition as they move their way through the night, crossing the river and ultimately making their way towards Placer. And we're just getting our uh, little guest set up here in the studio. I know uh, the Tour de France starts next week. And I was telling somebody I've never seen Wout Van Aert and this man in the same location at the same time. If you've seen, if you've seen, the, uh, if you've seen the Unchained documentary on Netflix, the hair is the same, it's iconic. Joined in, in studio by one. Tim Thompson, how you doing, buddy? Doing well. That, that was an incredible day to witness. D okay, try to put it in perspective because, you know, I, I crossed paths with you at Michigan Bluff and you were everyone's number one cheerleader. But did you imagine that it was going to play out to be this spectacular or were you just were you just trying to gas people up? I, I, I was not expecting it quite that much. Like, I knew it was going to be fast and I knew we weren't going to have the attrition that we normally would on a hot day, but... That was just mind bending. I mean, think about it. 12 years ago, the movie Unbreakable was made about a time 15 minutes faster than Courtney just ran. That's nuts. That's insane. <laughs> like, how do you even comprehend that? That is absolutely bonkers. How, okay, so as someone who yourself has clearly been in some high competitive situations, including here at Western States, you talked about the attrition rate not being uh, as expected. How are you feeling out there, both as a sort of a crew member, as just a spectator, as a pacer? Like, how, how, how do the conditions feel to you? You know, the, the thing you have to remember is 80 degrees or 82 degrees is still hot. And after that fire, there's much more exposure. So people were warm. And if you weren't taking care of yourself and if you underestimate the heat, you were going to blow up out there. So, I mean, it was it was toasty. Ida, who I was pacing, she doused herself at Roby Point. Like she poured water on herself. Like you're one mile from the finish and she still needed to cool down. That is that is wild, but that just shows like how competitive this race was that you had to, until the very end, take care of all of those little points. Uh, from, from your perspective, as a race director now, uh, and somebody putting on a, a pretty big, pretty big uh, trail festival. I think uh, we can we can say that officially. How how did you feel about the volunteer support and and how folks were able to take care of themselves out there today? Unbelievable. I mean, this event annually sets the precedent for just top-notch deliverables. The volunteers are always amazing. You cannot like walk away and not feel changed just by the warmth that they pour into every single runner. And this year was no different. Like it was absolutely spectacular from the very beginning to the very end. You know, it's, it's, I mean, there's nothing like Western States. So, so there's nothing like Western States, but what keeps drawing people back? Like what is so special about this event? I mean, I was talking to a few folks who uh, have run this in the past and we're coming back to pace as well. So, so even if you're not racing yourself, what keeps drawing folks to 
Olympic Valley and to Auburn every year? Community, hands down. Like, it, you can't replicate this anywhere. You know, even if you had the exact same course over in Europe or the exact same course in Asia, it wouldn't be the same. It's, this, it's the heart of this community. It, you feel it from wherever you are, the people out on the course, the long-term volunteers that have, like, I mean, I was telling Ida as we finished, like the people that have been around this race for decades, this is their next child. Like this is something that is important to them. It is family. And you feel that when you interact with anybody around here. So, so how do we, how do we try to bottle this up and explain, <laughs> like, how do we explain this to, to folks in the live stream? Like, I think there's a pretty healthy community in the chat right now. People have been following all day. Yeah. I was reading a, a comment from someone who like went from their computer to their phone to watch this when they went to the bathroom because they didn't yeah. want to miss a moment. How, how do you, if you had to summarize it in like five words for folks who've never been here at the track, how, how do you summarize it? Why do they need to be here? <sighs> That's tough. Uh, I, I mean, it, it doesn't get any more real than this, especially in a world now like, you know, in our future, AI is gonna take over and all these like virtual reality areas, but there is no supplement for spending time with people in person, embracing them with a warm hug and being out here on the track or at Forest Hill, Michigan Bluff at the start line up in Olympic Valley. It doesn't get better than this. And if you haven't been here, put it on your bucket list, come on out. It's unbelievable. It will live up to the hype. But anyone that's in the chat room, they're part of this community, you yeah. know, which is really great. Like that, this is worldwide, you know, and they're as much of it as we are, but put it on your list. Come on out here. Absolutely. Even if it takes you 10 plus years in the lottery, yep. depending on how things are going. Start a little like saving jar, put it on your counter, <laughs> states fund and come on out and hang out with us. It's an absolute blast. And so I can't I can't let you go without asking what what's next for you? What's on the docket? Where where are we going to see you next on on some live stream online you know it's uh i'm going after my white whale i'm heading to utmb uh, and thankfully craft we're we're taking the, uh, an entire team over there and we'll be there the the whole month of august so i'm gonna spend six weeks in chamonix and you know just uh go out there and have some fun so what i'm hearing is we're gonna see you here racing next year because you're gonna get one of those golden tickets from utmb well, no they did away with a golden ticket at utmb ah, i think it's ccc right. Isn't that right? Oh, uh, yeah, I think that is right. Yeah. Could, right. I, could I do the double? Listen, man, I'm not going to put anything past you. No, but I want to come back here so bad. And I mean, I will return to States every year. Someday I will run it again. Maybe it'll be next year. I can't wait to do it. And I mean, you, anytime you're in the, like, out there on the course, like today, you just witness magic and you want a piece of that. My boy Castalis in his debut, <laughs> Chico. I am so I have so many hugs to give right now. I I need to get off this and go find some people because I am just so psyched. Everyone had such a day. Like, Absolutely. It it man. I was saying earlier. I you know I was speaking with your coach, uh, your Gary. former coach. Yeah. yeah. I ran into him. Uh, I one of my old high school teammates went to Chico. Also an alum. Also coached by Gary. So like I know about that alumni community, and I know it's very tight. Yeah. So I'm stoked for you. I'm stoked for the entire Chico enterprise. I'm stoked that you guys are just like slowly like low key building this trail running dynasty between you, between Anthony, like. Y'all are doing, y'all are making moves. I think you'd be hard pressed to find another university in the States that has more powerhouse than, you can look at women and men. It's, it's unbelievable. Dude, well, I'm gonna let you get out of here and go give some hugs and, you know, say hey to everybody. So, Thanks for everything you guys did today. Dude, appreciate you. How are you feeling? Hey, listen, I only got another eight hours to go. So <laughs> it doesn't matter how I'm feeling now. We'll see how I'm feeling at yeah. 7 a.m. Well, thank you. No, thank you for being here. And uh, dude, enjoy. I'll catch you, I'll catch you tomorrow, I'm sure. Oh, yep. Awesome. Appreciate, appreciate the uh, the young gentleman, the former local, joining us. Just a beautiful head of hair. I'm so glad I got to see that, see that up close. So we're gonna we're gonna throw a uh, throw together another guest slash interview here momentarily as we. Uh, uh, you guys can't see this at the moment, but Tim literally just like ran up and bear hugged somebody. So he was not lying about his plans directly after coming off the stage. Um, so we have some views here again down at the river. It's just a good old party as folks are getting ready to uh, make the climb up to Green Gate. I believe we're on that side of the river at this point. And that's with... Uh, 
Let's see if I can identify who that runner was. That was Arrestus Pat Hastings that we had just had on screen there coming through. Coming out of Fort Collins, Colorado. So good vibes all around. You're seeing Pacers and crew smiling, keeping their runners moving forward. And it's just a vibe. It's just an absolute vibe. People are having a good time. I hope you guys are having a good time at home and just gigging along, you know? Even if you got a soundtrack going on a second tab while you got your own little dance party going, since we can't play music without getting pulled down on YouTube, hope, hope, hope you're having a good time. Or if you're one of our international viewers, it might be Sunday morning and you're having a cup of coffee and enjoying the time, catching up on last night's Unseen Bits of Love Island or something. Whatever, whatever feels good. We appreciate that you are joining us here. So to level set here, uh, just to do a bit of a recap of where we have been throughout the day, uh, and that's a lot of places. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about our top finishers. So uh, you should see it scrolling along the bottom. Uh, in the bottom third, but on the men's side, uh, your champion was Mr. Tom Evans uh, coming out of Great Britain, 1440 on the clock, uh, followed by Tyler Green in second place and Anthony Costales uh, in third place, as we were just talking about with, with Tim uh, representing Chico State uh, and his new home state of Utah. Uh, Shinji Shing was in fourth, Daniel Jones in fifth, Matthew Blanchard, a hard charge in the last four miles of the race to move from eighth to sixth. Ryan Montgomery moving into seventh place uh, after two years of getting into this race and not being able to make the start line, capitalizing on his opportunity to run 1538 for that eighth place finish. Jeff Colt coming through in ninth and then uh, actually, excuse me, eighth male, ninth overall. Uh, and then Cole Watson, the hometown hero, having gotten his ticket at Black Canyon, or excuse me, Canyon's 100K, uh, turning around and coming here to crush it, running sub 16, and then your 10th male was uh, Janosh Kowalczyk. On the women's side, it's been just silly. Like, it, like, undescribable. I can only imagine that we've run out of adjectives to describe how today has gone down. Courtney DeWalter besting the course record here by a solid basically 80 minutes um, to finish in the believe, sixth overall and first female. Katie Scheid also beating the existing course record, which again had not been, nobody been within 30 minutes, 28 minutes of it uh, since it was set back in 2012. Uh, she comes through for a second place, also besting the old course record when, as uh, Katie runs 1643. Um, Esther running 1709 for third. And then the just a dense pack came through shortly thereafter. Katie Asmith in fourth, uh, running 1721 and improving five spots on her position from last year. Emily Hoggood, F5 last year, F5 this year, running 1726, followed closely by Taylor Nolan, Ida Nilsson, and Priscilla Forge and Leah Yangling. So just absolutely uh, jam-packed competition on the women's side, and we are awaiting our 10th and uh, final auto qualifier for next year, which currently uh, that position being held by Megan Morgan, who just went through Roby uh, about seven minutes ago. And so any moment now, sometime the next, again, any moment now, two to five minutes, I would guess, uh, we'll be approaching uh, the track here at Plaster High School in Auburn, California, rounding out our top 10 punching her ticket here next year and keeping the good times rolling. Keeping the good times rolling. Try and do a little uh, quick digging. Make sure that I am uh, capturing everything correctly. Yep, so uh, Megan Morgan from Boulder uh, punched her ticket at Black Canyon 
We've seen historically a lot of success of folks um, who ran Black Canyon and punched their golden ticket there and turning around. And for Megan to be in her, I believe, debut 100 miler to show up with a top 10 on what is just a historically deep day uh, is going to be quite spectacular. So we'll see her coming in momentarily. I looked up here and I saw that you were alone and I was like, oh no, we can't let him do that. <laughs> I Why would we let him do that? Th I have to come join because we have our F10 coming in, I believe, shortly. Correct. Yeah, any moment now. Uh, she went through Roby about nine minutes ago. Oh, so, heck yeah. So we're going to roll on down here and punch that final auto ticket for next year. I love it. I love it. Who? Someone said earlier this week that I think it might have been the single track boys. I'm going to call them that. The single track boys. <laughs> they don't have names anymore. They're not Brett and Finn to me. They're just the single track boys. That there were 20 golden tickets up for grabs here at Western States. They're auto entries, right? Like, that's yeah. kind of like the golden ticket idea. And Meg Morgan, if she's grabbing that F10 spot for next year, 25 years old. Wild. Youngest. Wild. What, the youngest woman in the field? Youngest right? woman in the field, yeah. It's just like debut 100. Like, yeah, this is fine. I'm just going to be in a historic competitive day and just show out show up and not have to do this again for a whole year yeah you don't right? want to. just you're guaranteed you're guaranteed in and that is a huge huge deal that is that it, it does save a lot of headaches if you don't have to chase these golden tickets and run around um, and and really try to shore things up so uh, we'll again be very interested to hear how this went for her lessons learned uh, I'm sure those will be unpacked for days and weeks to come for many of our runners um, as we head back out into the field and see some of our age groupers, their lessons being learned, also highly important. Yeah, no, I think what's, I, I never know if I'm muted or not, it's a whole situation <laughs> in here. But yeah, I think that, I think one of the really cool things about the Western States broadcast in particular is that it, we, we're, we're live, we're live until the clock stops running tomorrow at the 30 hour mark and we're all in tears sobbing over golden hour situations it's going to be absolutely wild oh just gonna be nuts like i'm super stoked to see both the that push to the 24 hour mark yep. and, the, and that silver buckle and then golden hour where it's just like straight up just it's just a stream of stream of people stream of tears yeah and it's really cool too because i feel like that's where like there's a huge push at 24, but there's this bulk of finishers that come in in that like 28, 30, 29, all the way to that 30 hour mark. And it's just, those stories are phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, we all aspire to be like the elites, we'll copy their training, we'll follow them on Strava and get stoked. But it's, it's these folks with the everyday stories that are actually just like us. The folks who are working nine to fives, full families, and still finding a way to, to grind uh, their way through this race after, you know, years of trying to get in and they get to achieve their dream. It's yeah, awesome. So we're watching, I think this is Meg Morgan and her crew coming in, but someone asked if, uh, for an update on Hella. Hella is come through the 62 mile mark. Um, really excited to keep an eye on Hella over the course of the remainder of his race. He has made it to Forest Hill and will be well on his way to Cal 2. We expect a Cal 2 split. Again, that's mile 70.7. Somewhere between 11, 50 p.m. and just after the midnight hour. Yeah. It's crazy that it's not midnight yet and our 10th place female is currently sprinting through yeah. town. Like, literally, when you compare this, like, these times for a 100-mile race regardless of difficulty these are wild times but to have it be in these conditions with the overexposed nature of the course compared to past years because of the fires and people still showed up pushing through the high country and those in that snow people still showed up and now you have meg morgan on the track i mean so showing the up fastest for 10th. ever 10th place finisher for the women was Kemi Bruos last year in 1934. Meg Morgan's about to run 18-10 in a little and be 10th place. That's that is nuts. absolutely insane. In a more standard hot year without the snow, though, like, like last year, for example, that would have been good for 
between Louisa and Emily, so between fourth and fifth. I mean, there's there's gonna be so much in the after action of this race. It's like, was it a nature of these these folks being in this specific race that drew it out, or is this just going to be the new normal? Is this just where the competitive nature of ultra running has gotten? With it, it's going to take these types of performances moving forward, every race, to to show up and be on the podium or to be in the top ten. I mean, minimal minimal attrition. Like it's been just a really amazing race from start to finish, with runners duking it out together all day long. We heard that from our third, fourth, and fifth place finisher on the track about how much they pushed each other throughout the course of the race. But yeah, big round of applause for the 25-year-old from Boulder, Colorado, Meg Morgan in her 100-mile debut. 18, 11, 31 on the clock. So freaking fast. Absurd. We're talking 80, 80 plus <laughs> minutes faster than the fastest ever 10th place female finisher. In comparison, the men's, I think the men's were, was 2019, was that, that yeah. year where they ran so, so expeditiously. And the 2019 finish for the men's top 10, for example, which is the fastest 10th place finish there, was Kyle Patari in 1556. So not quite as fast this year, mm -hmm. but very, very close. I think uh, 11th that year was 1608 in Ryan Sands. This year, uh, 10th was 1556. Uh, 10, I think, or 1610. 1610 mm -hmm. with Janusz Kowalczyk. So, really, like, very, very fast. The women's field in particular, exceptionally fast today. It, it, but the thing that keeps coming up, and, and you guys brought it out in the finish line interviews, is as competitive as it was, it was fun. Yeah. And they were, in, they were enjoying it. it. <laughs> There's like, yeah, I'm just going to put myself in, in the pain cave, in the box, whatever mechanism you want to call it. And it, they got this out of themselves. And, and had a blast doing it. I mean, Katie, Katie Asmith was never going to give that mic back. We we're just going to, we we're all going to be disciples of Katie Asmith by the end of that conversation. Really, just a very inspirational human being. Like one of one of the questions that I always want to ask folks of uh, of any sort of background that come into a hundred milers is why. What's your why? And like, what was your why? 80 miles in when everything hurt and you kept going? Like, was it still the same thing? What was the mantra you were telling yourself? And the fact that she was out there just like, I want to give a monologue. She was she was ready to testify. Um, it just, it shows that there's a certain spirit about this race um, and, and anything you can do to really put yourself out there on the line that is admirable. And we, and we should all just be trying to aspire to, to, to meet that moment. Yeah, I'm kind of dying over the... Uh the old, oh, there's Corey Woltering crossing the river right now. Yeah. But I'm kind of dying over the, like, we didn't give Tom enough shine chat. Cause, okay, Tom's my teammate. I run for Deep Esteric. <laughs> I love the heck out of that guy. I think I was near tears at his finish. We've celebrated Tom extensively today, and we're going to celebrate him extensively tomorrow. Yeah. His performance was absolutely mind-blowing, as were the men who came in behind him. Tom ran, he's the, sec he's, th he's the first ever European to go under 15 hours on this course when he ran it back in 2019. Mm -hmm. He's now done that twice. twice. He's bringing the Cougar home. He's hoping British Airways lets him take it as a carry-on. <laughs> like, we love Tom. Trust me, we love Tom. He's going to be at the award ceremony tomorrow in split shorts and cowboy boots. We got a lot of love for that guy. He, he, is, a, he is a character. And like I'm, I'm super interested to see what comes next for him because he actually doesn't have a ton of ultras that he does. Like he's very selective about races that he chooses. And when you can put down a performance like that, so just masterful tactician. He said it's going to take 14:28, and if he had to, he could have pushed that last yeah, three miles. Yeah, ran 14:40, like made made it happen. Super, super fast. A, almost a 20 minute PR mm -hmm. from the time he ran in 2019. Like that is. I've said bonkers a lot today, but that was bonkers. It was. That's my new catchphrase, guys. Get with it. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, so Corey Woltering leaving that river crossing, heading up on his way to Green Gate. So good up Corey Woltering back in this field. Absolutely. He had a, I think it was an IG story like a couple days ago. He was like barely able to, to move and, and like he was wondering if he was getting sick. And so to have him out here just grinding, not letting this moment go to waste, always a pleasure. And he's, he's just such a good time and a good member of the community. Always brightens the light of everyone that's around him. So, so glad to have him back.
Yeah, so our next our next finisher on the track should be Adam Mary. I was just thinking to myself, I wonder where Adam Mary is. Adam Mary is going to be going to be finishing his first hundred mile here in just a little bit. He came through Roby Point at 11:11, so he is making his way down the road on his way to the track. The next female finisher to the track is going to be Jenny Quilty, um, finishing just outside the top 10. She is not through Roby Point yet. We'll be keeping our eyes peeled. And then Casey Lichtag is well on her way. She's moved, her, she's moved herself way up and actually uh -huh. into the top, like pretty just, just outside the top 10. And she will be getting her ninth finish, which means Casey Lichtag is coming back next year. Indeed. Yeah, and she's had quite the journey to get back here. Yeah, yeah, and, she has. And so, so to take this as a almost a demo run to be like, yeah, I can do this again and a, and a confidence booster, knowing that she has a sort of cheat code golden ticket uh, because ninth time finishers get the auto bid to come back to, to do number 10. She's gonna be she's gonna be a force. It's gonna be very entertaining. As we see more runners making their way up towards Green Gate. Are those jorts? Oh yes. Those Let's are go. Jorts. I like this. This is a bold strategy. I am here for it. If you're not having fun, what are you doing out there? This whole aid station is just a party, and jorts pretty much meet that right right in the center of that of that party. Yeah, all these aid stations are really very phenomenal out there. Have we checked in on um, our our buddy Gene Dykes in a hot sack? We have not. I was thinking about that right before. All the, all the women right came before down. I crashed crashed the party no no it, it was like 25 minutes ago and then he's moving he's through Michigan Bluff came through Michigan Bluff at 9 37 p.m. he'll have picked up a pacer there mm -hmm. um, presumably you're allowed to pick up a pacer after a certain time at Michigan Bluff yep. um, when they're heading into the dark they're allowed to pick up pacers there and they expect him in Forest Hill in probably the next like 15 minutes or so so Gene Dykes getting it done. He is well on his way, I think, to yeah. staying ahead of cutoff times. And if he can make it here before 11 a.m. tomorrow morning, he will be the oldest ever finisher of Western States. By like two years, right? I believe with 73 is the... I think so. 73 or 74. It's definitely a full year. But unfortunately, the oldest woman in the field, Angie, dropped, had to... I don't think she made a cutoff early, essentially. I think she got cut at that Duncan, yeah, yeah, yeah. That Duncan um, Canyon's cutoff. Um, but so at 69, started the race, which is so, so like very cool to see. Absolutely. Yeah, a whole lot of tales uh, will be told, especially in that golden hour we were talking about uh, between 10 and 11 a.m. And so uh, speaking of some of those tales, uh, I think we're going to throw one uh, up here because, again, this race is about community. We've seen so many people come across with their families, with their loved ones, but uh, you know, it's a story of representation as well, and and making sure that folks see themselves in this community in trail and ultra running. And Zach Bates up there as well, just cross just crossed the river, uh, a runner with autism, absolutely crushing it here at Western States, and we're gonna have a tale uh, coming to us from the studio. I'm Zach Bates. I'm from Sholo, Arizona. We were watching the broadcasts and then they called one ticket from Sholo. And then I heard Di Diane and John on, they were like cheering and we were cheering. It was awesome, yeah, we were, it was very exciting. Well, this is a iconic race, and a lot of great runners do it, and I thought I would want to try, so. Do you have a running hero in this sport? Um, I don't know if I have, well, there's a lot of runners I like. Like, well, one big runner is Dean Carnassus, there's Courtney, there's Jim, there's uh, Killian. There's a lot of really cool runners that I like. I when since I was younger, I don't know why I actually started. I just started doing some running, and then I liked it. Yeah. Can yeah. You, can you talk about what exactly you like about running? 
I don't know. I just like to go out in the wilderness. That's nice. I often feel good. I feel like my endurance just gets stronger. So like I feel like I like to feel like I can move around real good, comfortably, and I feel great. I am tempted to sometimes go kind of fast because I want to try to just be awesome. But then I think I think I should just take it slow and just get it done. And then um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be hard and it's going to hurt, but then I'm going to finish. That's going to be awesome. It'll be a great moment. What is your uh, What is your one piece of advice to younger people like yourself or maybe younger people who have never done anything like this before and you want to encourage them to run and get outside? Well, you just um, think about your goals and then that will help drive you to do them. So like when you don't want to do something, you're just thinking about your goals of why, why you're doing it. Yeah. And you're doing UTMB this year too. Yeah. It's a big year for you. Yeah, it's, gonna, it's a big year. <laughs> Are you excited? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm excited. And there you have it, Zach Bates, 21 years old. Youngest in the field. Meg Morgan was the next youngest in the field at, at uh, 25. Yeah. Such a such a boss. Like, And the fact that he's going to be doing UTMB as well is absolutely amazing. Um, and, he, you know, he's had a pretty consistent training block. Uh, heard from some folks locally uh, that he's been really smart about how he's building up towards this race um, and just super consistent very healthy and you see him right here actually on screen just crossing the river we are 18 hours and 22 minutes into the race so very well uh, very well in position to potentially get this silver buckle Looking at some historical splits, this is pretty much right uh, around the time that a lot of folks have run uh, about that 23.30 uh, finishing time if they come through Rucky Chucky at this, at this point. So, got to be watching Zach, see if he can get that silver buckle and achieve his dream. Hey, and on the plus side, a lot of the runners that he named is... Uh, folks that he likes and follows are going to be at that award ceremony tomorrow, and he gets to share uh, share that audience with them. So, super excited to see how that plays out for him. As we got some other runners down here at Rucky Chucky getting ready to cross the river, making sure they have what they need, taking care of themselves. Crossing in the dark's got to be pretty fun, I or maybe a little scary. I don't know. Maybe it'd be scarier if you were crossing on foot in the river. You know, when mm -hmm. you take the dip overnight on lower snow years where there's l lower water across this crossing. They, they string a rope across and they've got volunteers that stand, literally stand there in the water, every, you know, waist deep in waders every, you know, five feet or so. And you and your, you and your pacer, you know, walk your way along the rope and they tell you jokes and that kind of stuff. It's super fun. But d at night in the dark, that would be a little bit like, a little bit stressful. See at night, that's when they should just like let the volunteers go. And then you just have to like be out there by yourself and be like, are there sea creatures? We don't know. Let you really start hallucinating at 70 some odd miles into an ultra. That's that's what we want to do. As we see more runners coming on down towards the river. Yeah, really, really good to see the runners making their way down there. Yeah, it's I'm still just beaming over the mighty fine like women's field, getting to sit there with Esther Chillog and Katie Asmith and Emily Hoggood, and then all of a sudden watching Taylor Nowlin like just rip around the track. I don't know if they got a close up of her sprinting oh, around yeah. that corner, but she was she was going for every second there. That was absolutely wild. I mean, the the number of folks who've looked so good coming down the hill and into the finish is remarkable like obviously unusual in like in golden hour we're kind of used to seeing like the 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 lean 
but folks were grooving. Like even Anthony Costales was in a full kick as well. You yeah, know, like it was it was wild. Yeah. So right now on your screen, that's going to be Adam Mary making his way to the track. Ryan Thrower there getting some footy. Adam Mary, debut Western States, debut 100 mile race. I'm really curious to hear about how his day played out. I, we saw him throughout the day. He was never really in the mix, it felt like. But at the same time, like he didn't go out m too much more conservative than someone like Cole Watson. Yeah. And so I don't know if it was like went out conservative and just didn't quite have it to kind of like up the ante over the course of the day, or if or if things went wrong. Like you just don't you don't know. I didn't know that Jeff Colt was projectile vomiting until after I saw him at the finish line, and he was like, yeah, ever like after 80, mile 81, nothing nothing was going down. I mean, and that's like all, that stuff happens. It happens, and you can't necessarily predict when it's going to happen. All you can do is troubleshoot. So, we'll we'll have to check in with Adam and see see what his tail was. But you know what? Good good training run, good uh, educational experience, and we're going to find out a lot that he can put to practice. Yeah. When he golden tickets his way in next time. Oh my goodness. Yeah. There's this this whole. This whole world's intense. <laughs> I just like I'm just bl I'm I'm flabbergasted over the things that took place today, the things that transpired today. Absolutely, absolutely nuts. As we have Adam Mary hopping onto the track, 250 meters to go. Add a boy, Adam Mary, or as like we or as we like to call him, Dadam, Dadam Mary. Nice. He and Adam Peterman were on the world's team together, and you couldn't have two Adams, so it was Adam and Dadam. It just, it just do makes it feels sense. good. You, you got to do it. Feels you just good. don't fight it, you know. <laughs> you just don't fight it. You got the whole crew rolling in. Is that is that Matty D there as well? Yep, that's Matt Daniels there, his training partner and good friend. Well, I think one of his confidants is someone mm -hmm. that he can bounce ideas around with when he's trying to figure out, um, you know, training training questions he might have because he's self coached yeah. right now. Really, really cool to see. Yeah, they had a very healthy training group going up there uh, in Colorado, and those Boulder boys—they're gonna—they're gonna keep tearing things up for quite some time. And this is yeah, this I think still that's Drew Drew Holman with him as well. Of course, what a powerhouse! Yeah, I think he's got Drew Holman and Seth Ruling with him. Just a classic trifecta of Boulder boys. Right. Yeah, he's gonna be just fine. Any any lessons to be gleaned from today will be taken to heart, and I'm sure we will see him here soon enough absolutely executing the race that he wants today might not have been that day but it's a day that he can still be proud of as he comes in here 18 hours and 28 minutes mr adam mary oh get, get the, the kiddos. baby yeah oh the baby yeah adam mary new dad love it love to see it I got to hold Lou at the finish line for a while for Tyler and Rachel. It's a dangerous baby. <laughs> That's all I got to say. That's my two cents on babies. It's a dangerous baby. I've been wildly impressed with how I, I this must just be like a parental instincts thing. I don't know. Don't have kids. But um, nobody's like been shy to hold their child as they were coming across the finish line. You, you just ran 100 miles, turned yourself inside out, and you're like, yeah, I'm going to take I this. I trust meal. carrying this very delicate creature across the finish line. Yeah, right. totally. Yeah. I'm like, not gross. I'm not going to drop it. It's the dropping thing that, that terrifies me. Ra Rachel Drake did make sure that Tyler didn't run Lou's head into the clock, which Smart. I thought was really, really good yeah, mom yeah. move at the finish line. <laughs> I really liked the mom, the mom corral around the clock as Tyler and Lou came came down the finishing stretch and that that's what makes a good partner you know look <laughs> looking out for your failings you know that i think that is someone's asking how close jenny colty is to the finish i am curious about that too because she should be the next woman to come across the finish line here jenny quilty has come through pointed rocks we do not have a roby point split yet she came through pointed rocks about an hour, hour ago. ago yeah so she's so pretty close we should get a roby split here in just a little bit. Mm -hmm. As we're back at the river, making sure all our runners are safe and accounted for as they hop in for just a little boat ride. That's Valerie Renholt that you saw hopping in 
from Davidson, North Carolina. Wow. In that 40, 40 to 49 group? Mm-hmm. Sick. So <laughs> she waves, waves to the camera. I Pre love it. Appreciate that. Uh, currently eighth in the women's 40 to 49 division. Did that, not know we had that. That, so. women's that women's 40 to 49 division is absolutely insane. I mean, Ida Nilsson was at the front of that. Ida missed, I don't know if you noticed this or knew this, Ida missed the Masters course record and the 40 to 49 course record that Ragna DeBots has by two minutes. Awesome. And I don't think they knew that that existed. No. And I told Tim at the finish line, he goes, like, was like, shoot. Like, Would have hammered. I think we might have been able to push for that if we had known. Yeah. Which is a bummer. It happens. But... You know, you don't know what you don't know, and exactly. that's just the way the cookie crumbles. I mean, in in the grand scale of the day, can't can't be upset. Ran a phenomenal debut, um, and positioned very well in a very competitive field. So, just means she has to come back and, and knock it out. It'll happen. Yeah, it'll happen. I I suspect that of this list, who have auto entries. I'm, I'm imagining that many of them come back. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I think last year we had so many um, interna like international women in that top um, five group. But also, like, so when I say that, too, you know, that included, like, um, who am I thinking of? Elsa McDonald. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for her, like, she had, like, her previous experience at Western States wasn't, like, the best she could do yeah. and so when she came and really crushed it last year i think she was willing to kind of step step away again but again it's like you know ruth croft etc trying to like just i think mix it up coming back year after year is maybe not as much of a thing for the international athletes that come over for, for this race versus mm -hmm. the um the americans who are like this is our this is our race absolutely absolutely and i think that's one of the the cool things about having these international golden ticket races is it's kind of enlightened us on some races that we might have been sleeping on domestically here in the United States. You know, this these races that are happening out in Thailand, being able to see, um, especially on the men's side, all the Chinese athletes come through and, and getting to do a deep dive on, on who they were and what they were bringing to the table. You know, it, it allows us to expand our scope as well. So, I mean, there, there are some... Uh, What's the term that the, the single track boys use? The uh, random ballers? Random there's, ballers. There's a lot of random ballers I heard, internationally. I heard that we're going to let, yeah, we're gonna let Brett and Finn on this thing at some point, too. Risky business, it, guys. Risky business. Yeah, we, we we said we'd wait for the sun to come up before we did it, lest they uh, think that they have a, an after dark privilege on YouTube, and who knows where that goes. So we're going yeah. to put them in sunlight to, to try to keep them on. Finn's worried that he's mostly going to be speaking gibberish at that point. I think Brett is really excited, though. Yeah, as, as they should be. As they should be, that second sunrise, and then we're going to kick them out for as we head towards Golden Hour around 8 a.m. tomorrow morning, welcoming every single runner to the finish line here at the Placer High School track. It is really cool. There were moments last year where we had six, seven people on the track at the mm -hmm. same time, and we're trying to get their bib numbers, and we're trying to pull up their bios, and we're trying to make sure that everyone gets a shout-out. It is chaos, but it is super exciting. It's the best chaos. Yeah, it is very, very exciting. Absolutely, as we see more views from the river uh pop-up tent from tamalpa uh shout out that bay area running group uh love it and speaking of masters athletes we're talking about the the 40 to 49 record tamalpa notorious for winning uh or being competitive in that like 70 to 79 men's cross country i love that there's a specific 70 to 79 men's cross country it's championship wild. that they are specifically good at it's wild yeah, someone was asking about if, if someone declines an entry from the top 10, would it roll down? No, it is it is purely based. So I, I declined in for 2020, which obviously then got postponed 2021. Um, after being top 10 twice, I was like, you know what? I am I am ready to experience other races. I can experience this race in other ways. I can volunteer, I can crew, I can pace, et cetera. Instead, I ended up sitting in a studio that I didn't know was gonna happen, which is super <laughs> sick. But you know, like you say, so yeah, you decline and that the, that spot just goes to the lottery essentially. So that spot just ends up being utilized from all of you guys that are putting in in the lottery. So, so let me ask you a little bit about coming to this race, both as a runner and then in another capacity. So personally, I've never run the race, but I was talking to some folks uh, when I was out doing my on-course commentary about what brings them back in a crew capacity or even just to spectate if they're not racing. What, what for you draws you back? What makes this such a special event that you still want to be a part of it, even if you're not competing in it? 
Um, I think it's partly the community. I mean, I've uh, my first experience here um, was crewing and pacing Sarah Kai's in 2017. Okay. Um, had a hard day, but it was just like we were in it and we were in the thick of it and we like got her to the finish line. She should have been like a sub 20 hour top 10 person and had like a 28 hour day where we walked it in from Green Gate. It was long. I like fell asleep walking <laughs> on the trail several times, but that's just like, that's the way it goes. And you just, you make it happen. And she got everything that she possibly could out of that experience. And I was hooked. I was like, ooh, yeah, this is, this is for me. Mm -hmm. I put in for the lottery. It was my second time, second year putting in them for the lottery, and I got drawn like 12th on the wait list. Nice. And I was like, oh, cool. I guess I'm running Western States. We had not been planning to run Western States like that year, but you put in for the lottery because it takes forever to get in, right? Exactly. But I do think that it's just it's really special. It's it's family. It's seeing my friends. It's seeing people um, exploring their limits. I, I coach runners. Um, I have two runners in the race, Danny. Um, Kilgore, who is making his way to ALT right now, hoping for a sub 24 hour finish. Um, I think he's more than capable of that. And then um, Jeff Colt, who we saw finish earlier. Yep. So it's been really fun. I've, I've gotten to coach a number of athletes every year, generally like two to four athletes for Western States every year. And it's been, it's been like a phenomenally fun experience to get to witness people finishing during all times of the day, inc including well into golden hour. Absolutely. So what's, what's more nerve wracking for you competing in this race or coaching athletes in this race oh it's i mean when it's other people's goals on the line that like is obviously like i want them to succeed particularly when it's like their first ever or their only potential chance it feels like to to like make it to the finish line it's like you don't want to mess that up yeah. and it is devastating when someone gets timed out or if someone doesn't quite make it to the finish line like that is that is really really hard so um I have had athletes who have been really close to cutoffs or have been who have been actually who have been timed out in, in this race or a UTMB style race. And like that's that's hard, but it's like we do everything we can to try to make sure that they're as prepped as possible. I was just pulling up the bib number of the racer on our screen. I was wondering if she was having an issue there because I thought he was rubbing her back, but I think he's working on stuff in her pack. This is Helen Rolf on our screen. 51 years old. From Australia, one of our international runners. Shout out. Try to figure out what time is it there tomorrow. Like, yeah, who's, if you're from Australia and you're watching right now, what time is it there? Let us know. Matt Feldig is in the chat. He can let me know. Yeah, uh, Matt, tell us what time it is <laughs> in Australia. But no, that's, that's exciting. I mean, yeah, it's, just, it's, it's, just came into Forest Hill right now. Gonna be heading out trying to get to Cal 2. I mean, that's its own trick coming from the Southern Hemisphere. You got all, you're basically coming from winter and you're like, all right, cool. I'm supposed to be getting ready for this very hot race. Like that, I can't even imagine. Super what, hard. What that's like. Super, super hard. And that, and it's just, it's those types of stories. And at this point of the race, these are all folks that are everyday people, folks with jobs, folks who are, you know. Folks who've been putting into this, into this race for four, five, six, yeah. eight years, you know, who just like, this is finally their opportunity to get it done. That is so incredibly exciting. And we're going to be here to follow them the entire way. So thanks for joining us in the chat and online. There's Casey Licktag. Again, working for her ninth ever finish here. Ninth in a row mm -hmm. as well, That which I, you know, may never happen again. Although people like um, people like Emily Hoggood, people like Katie Asmith, I think are well on their way to trying to make that happen. It's uh, 4.40 in the afternoon. Okay. Oh, perfect. Everybody. Is You're awake. Controlling. Yeah. And, but, the, but what's interesting, you know, talking about folks getting uh, a, a host of finishes here is, again, we're seeing people be highly successful in their late 30s, early 40s, late 40s. I mean, how many how many of our top 20 are folks that were that are masters athletes? And so if they keep grinding at at their current rate, we're going to we're not only we're going to see age group uh, records fall, but we're going to see more and more folks rack up those, you know, 10-year finishes. Not sure if we're going to see as many folks knock out the the 20 year. Oh, I think that might be <laughs> darn near impossible at this point. I think you got to start young and you got to be able to get in guaranteed every year. And 
that used to be a whole lot easier than it is than it is now. Exactly. I want one of these sick volunteer shirts. Like the retro but cool. You yeah. Know? How do we get one of those? I mean. Do we not count? No. Hit us up, team. <laughs> Bam, where are you at? We want to support the 50th edition as well. Yeah, I want the cool retro logo with the modern font. I didn't even get to talk about this earlier, but the uh, Michigan Bluff Aid Station, 70s themed. No way. Yeah. Oh, I love it. That's that. I got a. You I, had a good time there. I had an absolute blast. Soundtrack, banging. It, it, it was speaking to my soul. I would have just hung out there the entire time. Uh, Victor was on the mic. He was wearing a uh, like a blondie top and these like checkerboard like pizza pants. What? It was it, I don't I can't even describe it and do it justice. But it was everybody was having a good time. Tie dye. We had headbands. They were giving out swag. It was just oh it was, so it was cool. Full on, it was full on rager. So so cool. So um, looking back for Jenny Quilty as well. Going to be our eleventh place finisher in the women's race she has come through Roby point she came through Roby point at 11 34 p.m here local time about seven minutes ago i'm getting mm -hmm. better at public math as this <laughs> broadcast goes on my brain is working well team mm -hmm. dan davies is going back out mm -hmm. dan how many miles do you think dan's run today i'm probably more than he's running a while i'm just coping yeah. i should probably know how much he's running today <laughs> i think he's been on the bike for part of the day so i feel a little bit better than that yeah, I saw somebody in the chat earlier was like, how does this compare to an Iron Man? It's like, well, it's about 80 more miles of pounding. Yeah, it's so, just different. Yeah. It's just different. <laughs> They're different sports. See a runner navigating the steps on down. I mean, most most of the, uh, the hard downhill is behind you. So good to see folks still making their way over to the boat. But yeah, we should have Jenny Quilty down here, probably in the next five or so minutes. Yeah, I would think so as well. I think at some point we'll get we'll get footage of her making her way this direction, likely running running towards us, lights ablazing. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, finishing out the uh, the Canadian contingent, we snuck one into the top ten. Jenny not quite able to make it there today, but still it. Pretty good showing. Oh, a really good showing. I feel like she put herself in the mix a bunch. I feel mm -hmm. like she was never far from being in that. I feel like she spent a lot of time in that, like, 8th to 12th or 13th position. She's going to end up finishing 11th here today. Um, you know, everyone wants a top 10 finish. It's hard when you don't get it. But I think that, you know, she, she put herself out there and she ran a really good race. And I think we're going to see a lot more from Jenny Quilty as well. Absolutely. Yeah, she came in uh, as a result of uh, Dwight Intheon. Yeah. Over I, in I, Thailand. I, I still cannot pronounce that, but I just you go can. for it and <laughs> hope that's right. I, t I like to pronounce things with a lot of confidence and people do correct me, but I just try to try to own own it, you know, you just own it and you're like, that might be wrong, but I'm gonna try. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we can do a lot of research, but pronunciation guys usually aren't attached to our spreadsheet. So Yeah, I have to go around and ask people how to pronounce their name. I had Esther send me a voice memo. Smart. I was like, I need a voice memo of your name so I can send it to Topher for other announcements. Yeah, I usually just skip names. I don't know. I say this as somebody with a rather messed up spelling of their name. So thanks, mom. Yeah, um, Schuler. Yeah. I love it. You're not my. You're not the only Schuler that I spend time with. So this is, this is you're you're good in my book. I mean, I'm still tripping up baristas. So that's really where the fun comes in. In my head, I call you Schuler. Most people do, and then they like type it out, Schuler, and I'm like, that ain't it. And they're like, my bad. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> it's okay. My name recently was spelled K O R R Y N. And I was like, that's the most Gen Z name of the Gen Z spelling that's I've nifty. ever seen. Yeah. But back to our racers. Is that Vic? I can't see his bib number. Uh, Two. 354? 354? Is that Vic? If someone's in my ear, do we know? That 354 doesn't exist. Oh, that's Top Woman. That's why. Uh, Ming Zhao. Oh, okay. Not Vic. But I do think that was 354. I do think that was um, Ming Zhao. Mm -hmm. From Naperville, Illinois. 
coming through Forest Hill. Yep, that would be right. Time in 11:30, 11:43 p.m. Looked like he was eating some some cup of noodles. I would eat a cup of noodles right now. I'm kind of <laughs> hungry. Well, one of you, one of us gets to leave I in like 15 minutes. I know. I had a sandwich <laughs> a while ago. I'm really digging this hot dog situation going on. Is it the Pacer constructing hot dogs? Is that what's going on right now? Absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> one for you, one for me. Let's get it done. Cheers. Cheers from the hot dog fam. We couldn't see his bib, but he's got a hot dog. He's taking it to go. Is that a is that a hot dog for the boat ride? I mean, what better place to have a hot dog than? I'm, I'm pretty sure it's like they're at a carnival. Here he goes. Down to the river, hot dog in hand. I am digging <laughs> that style. That is some swag if I've ever seen it. Absolutely amazing. Coming out of Rocky Chucky, hot dog in hand. That's is, a vibe. That's a vibe. You know it's almost midnight when we say that's a vibe with some degree of like seriousness in our voices. Well, listen, as a as a high school coach, Ooh, I, yeah. I do everything I can to both be relevant and cringy at the same time. So get excited because that's what's going to be taking you guys through the night because I'm on that overnight shift until 7 a.m. So that's a vibe. Buckle up, kids. I don't know. I've heard I've heard Finn and Brett might come in as early as five. That is that a rumor? That's a rumor. Oh, no, buddy. I mean, listen. You if, love if, it. If the runners can grind through the night, I can grind on camera for them. I think that this is Jenny Quilty coming. Yeah, in. absolutely. Try to get a little bit more light to get in front. Yeah. Yeah, we're good. That's good. Jenny. Yeah. And not in a position where she has to really sprint to the finish here to protect her spot. Gets to enjoy this entire journey in as she comes through the gate and on to the Placer High Track. 250 meters to go to the finish line for Jenny Quilty. Your 11th place finisher here today. Jenny is going to be finishing. Oh, my goodness. It's only 1847 on the clock. Yeah. She is the new fastest ever 11th place finisher. Mm -hmm. That is bonkers. I've said it again. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Eighth Asian Fireball is going to put that on his next betting sheet for a race. It's going to be how many times does Corinne Malcolm say bonkers on the live class? Jenny Quilty. Uh, I mean, in fairness, it's not too late because you do have the golden hour shift tomorrow. But just look, just so much bounce, so much joy. Wave it. Oh, my God. I mean, she's going to run sub sub 19 hours. She's going to be 1849. She's going to be sub 1850. That is so, so fast, Canadian Jenny Quilty. Because I can tell you that last year's 11th place finisher was Canadian Anne Marie Madden in 1938. And I got to congratulate her after the race saying, hey, congratulations on your fastest race ever, or the fastest 11th place finisher ever. Yeah. Jenny Quilty just usurped that in a big way. Yeah, by, talk by 50 minutes, 50 minutes. I talked about how she had won Squamish 50-50 last year and won Dwight. Dwight and Theon. Thank you. I'm, I'm here for you. But 1849 for your second ever 100 miler. A fast 100 miler too. Fast. She doesn't live that far from me. She lives in um, Abbotsford. Word? Abbotsford. Okay. Abbotsford, uh, British Columbia. Those BC folks. BC folks. You can't trust them, you know. They're fast. <laughs> you can't trust them, BC folks. Yeah, my reference frame is like Ryan Reynolds, so yeah. I don't Hillary, know. Hillary Yang is going to go give her a big hug because they are friends. They're homies. Canadian homies. I just assume all Canadians are friends with all Canadians at this point. Particularly all Canadian trail and ultra runners, right? Yeah. It, that, that is like a niche group within a niche group. The group has gotten really small at that point, you know? We got another runner on the road, it looks like, yeah, making their way from Roby Point. Who might it be? Who are you, kind, kind gentleman? Uh. 
Would that be Chris Christopher? Shirk? Yeah. Christopher Shirk. Another Boulder boy, not necessarily in the group, but from Boulder. Your third master male. We'll see if we're right. We've got stoked oak oat sleeves on. Unless we're further back on the Where course. Where are we? Oh, no, 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 no. This is Gene. Gene. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. This is, this is outside of Forest Hill. He's running down. Oh, okay. He's running like down Cal Street. The only other place with asphalt. I was, that makes I was like, this man does not have the beard that Christopher <laughs> Shirk has. I was like, where else is the road on the trail? I t or on the race, I totally panicked for a second. This is on your screen right now. This is the 75-year-old in the race. The, the man trying to be the oldest finisher ever of Western States. Gene Dykes. And listen. He's moving. Moving. I'm I wish I looked like that half the time. I wish I looked like that in just my normal day to day life. You know, your normal runs? Yeah. I was like, my chiropractor would be stoked if I ran that well. Yeah. No, Gene Dykes is currently the gentleman you see on your screen with his pacer on Cal Street. Is he coming into Forest Hill or leaving? He's, he's come Le through Forest Hill. So he's yeah, he's, he's, yeah, he's crossed over that timing mat uh, at 1845, so six minutes ago. And, and shoot, crushing it. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm trying to, I'm going to go back and look at some historic splits to see. Yeah, it looks like he's working on getting some salt pills out of a bag there. Something of that nature. I have to imagine this camera is just like blinding them. Yeah, that's always the tricky part of being media is you want to. It you want to tell the story, it turns but out you don't filming at night is really hard for everyone involved, both the runner and the camera people and the viewing audience. Mm -hmm. Very, very cool. I wasn't sure if we were going to get to see him at all. That is huge. That is pretty, pretty dope. I'm super stoked for Gene to just be just cruising. And so, yeah, looking at uh, a quick snapshot of... Historic splits right there in that golden hour pocket. Uh, really the last 20 minutes of golden hour is sort of the pace that this is putting him on. So um, we will be sure to to keep tabs on Gene as, as cutoffs keep approaching and he keeps beating them because I'm just going to will that into the universe. But Gene Dykes here on screen, just absolute legend, absolute stud. Yeah, we're, we're going down. The, yeah, we're definitely going down the road. Get ready to make that Cal Street turn here in a little bit. But this is this is a good showing. This is a good showing for Gene. I'm going to see if I can see if there's anybody else around him uh, other than his pacer, obviously. All right, so um, so Ming Zhao, who we had seen uh, just a little bit ago in Forest Hill, uh, went through Forest Hill about two minutes across that timing map before Gene did. Um, there's another runner, Corey Norris, um, who was 40 seconds ahead of Gene coming across that mat. Uh, Corey's got a lot of fans at that Michigan Bluff aid station. I was chatting with them. Um, when I was out there and, and they actually asked me like do you know where Corey is Can like helping them navigate the tracker um, rough and ready California that's a local boy and he's going to be right in front of Gene um, and they're going to be a, they're going to be cruising along trying to beat these cutoffs here and it's going to it's going to be a good time so. it sounds like they're really 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 close to the yes. cutoffs like maybe yeah. on top of them right now mm -hmm. but they got across the timing mat in time which means they still are alive and, and making moves towards uh, 
towards Cal too, I guess. Or is the river? Would Rucky Chucky be the next? Oh, where is the next enforceable cutoff? We can figure that out. We have technology, just like you at home of Google. We do too. <laughs> we can do this. Do the web. Our internet is working way better than it was when everyone was trying to be here at the same place as us. Very true. But we can we can figure this out. I believe this is probably in our aid station information. Mm-hmm. Which is somewhere. Let's see, the cutoff. Next enforceable cutoff would be. Oh, yep, Cal 2, 240. Is this, wait, what about Cal 1? It's got an asterisk, which means something in this guide. But it's, yes. the, but it's the same one as Cal 2. So I guess it's just like, hey, if you're not through Cal 2 and 240, then you're getting pulled. You out. Yeah. Okay. So they've got two hours and 44 minutes to make it eight yeah. miles. So the... And the thing to remember is that the cutoff is different than what they think, than what is like suggested as 30 hour pace. Correct. As well. So those, those two things are a little bit different, a little bit more aggressive. And so they're going to be pushed up against those cutoffs as they make it towards them. I guess the Forest Hill cutoff, right, was 11, was technically 1145. Mm -hmm. I think he came through like right at that. If you clear the mat, you clear the mat. And I think too, it's like dependent on like where they're taking the time from. Sometimes it's at the beginning of the aid station, sometimes it's after you leave the aid station, it becomes like this whole situation. So he was likely into the Forest Hill aid station proper ahead of that and then cross the timing mat just after, if that's the case. Yeah. Um, because the, the timing mat is outside of the Forest Hill aid station. Absolutely. And speaking of timing mats, we got uh, yeah, runner finishing 1145. here. But 1845-55 a lap. So, he, yeah, he's he's fine. He's good. He got out. Also good, Chris Shirk of Boulder, Colorado, who uh, he, he does have a significantly larger beard than Gene Dykes. Uh, yeah, confirmed, as we now see. We we're allowed to that we could identify him. <laughs> and so he is finished here, uh, 18 hours and 57 minutes. Your third master in the race. And I, I think pretty pleased with how that, that day played out for him. I gotta imagine. Yeah, what an incredible just day of performances. People are running so fast. I bailed off the live the live broadcast set real quickly to go give Jenny Quilty a big hug <laughs> and be like, you know that you ran so stinking fast, right? Like how, you know how impressive that is, right? Can we just discuss that for a second? And she's like, yeah, I knew that I was probably going to run really fast. All of it, like be like my time was going to be mm -hmm. fast with the conditions we had. And I was going to potentially not be in the top 10. And she's like, you know, it's hard. All she's like the, the three women I'm chasing, I'm like really good friends with. It was like Leah Yingling, Meg Morgan, Priscilla for um, Forgy. I think they're all coached actually by the roaches potentially okay and so she'd be like chasing people that she's like pretty close with and good friends with and whatnot and so she was like i don't you know she's like i really want them to be top 10 too like that was really hard so yep did not did not quite make the top 10 but ran really really fast lights out so so we're gonna go ahead and uh as we've been talking about Gene Dykes, talking about some of these folks that are bumping up against cutoffs, uh, we want to celebrate not just those that were at the front of the race, uh, obviously, Courtney DeWalter and Tom Evans winning, uh, but we got folks that are still out there grinding throughout the day. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to show a little package here about some of our mid-pack runners, our back-of-the-pack runners, and uh, give everybody the shine that they deserve. So throwing it to you guys in the studio. Hi, my name is Wayne Pfeffer, Bib228. Super excited to be running my first Western States after a number of years in the lottery. Uh, special thanks to my crew, Lisa, Brady, Madison, and my parents who will be there all day. Uh, shout out to my friends that will pop in and out, and uh, to my pacers, Brendan O'Donnell, who will take me Forest Hill to the river, and my son, who will take me Pointed Rocks to the finish. Uh, my daughter told me last week, when your legs are tired, run with your heart. I'll keep that with me all day, and see you on the track in Auburn.
Hi, my name is Fred Leach and I'm from Portola Valley, California. I am BIB 284, which is my birthday in European notation. I'm running Western States for the second time, aiming for my fifth 100 mile finish and 30th ultra. I want to give a special shout out to my wife Jamie and my kids William and Emma who have supported me constantly throughout training for this run. Also a big thank you to my coach Stephanie. I'm excited to share some miles with my friend Crispin who will be pacing me and a big thank you to my crew Julia and Reed. Hey, it's Pam Reed. We're here at the Olympic Valley getting ready for the 2023 Western States happening on Saturday. I'm so excited. I'm going to do Western States, Badwater, and Hard Rock back to back to back. Thanks to my crew, Susie, Harold, and Elaine. So I'm going to go rest up and I'll see everybody on Saturday morning. Hey guys, this is uh, Nathan Dib from Porter Ranch, California, Los Angeles area. Uh, small business owner, the passion for running, love the trails and the mountains, and thankful for this opportunity to run Western States. Uh, Thank you to my Pacers, Anna, Jeff, and Jamie, my nephews, Dylan and Jaden. They're all out here to support. Thank you for all the positive vibes from back home, all my family and friends. There's my uh, Pacers and crew over there. <laughs> yeah, let's go. See you guys in Auburn, hopefully. Let's do it. Awesome, awesome. So many tails in the middle and back of the pack. So excited to be able to bring them to you for the next 11 hours. We just crossed over midnight here, local time, 19 hours of race has elapsed. And these folks crossing the river down there are well on their way to the track here in Auburn, California, well ahead of the cutoffs. We got... Uh, as we mentioned, about two hours and 40 minutes until the cow two, cow two cutoff. And a solid five hours until the cutoff here at Rucky Chucky. So we'll keep following along, trying to bring you as many updates to folks uh, as we can, as lighting and bib numbers allow. Um, but as always, if you are looking for your runner, uh, check that ultralive.net. You can type in by name or by uh, bib number, and we'll do what we got to do as we check in on Gene Dykes. Having having a bit of a spot of bother out there, so uh, hopefully he can get moving again since he was right up against that uh, that cutoff at Forest Hill, and we uh, hope, hoping for the best as he moves forward. Um, I believe this aid station is down at Quarry? Somebody in the studio might be able to correct me on that because uh, the low angle makes it a little difficult to see who is sponsoring this aid station. But um, we're going to have as much coverage throughout the course as we can. Obviously, nighttime makes drones a little, a little difficult to throw over. Uh, the brush and wooded areas, but trying to trying to bring you as much as we can, and especially for as long as we can, up to that 30-hour mark and golden hour here at the Placer High Track of the Western States 100. Just a level set. This is Skylar Hall coming to you live from the Placer Track. We are... 19 hours into Western States, our male finisher, uh, male winner, Tom Evans, finished about uh, four and a half hours ago now, uh, 14 hours and 40 minutes in. And our women's winner, Courtney DeWalter, uh, finished just under 15 hours and 30 minutes. And it has been a jam-packed day full of tails. Obviously, stick with us here. We'll take you through the 30 hours. And then if you missed anything, you're going to be able to find all of that coverage on the Western States YouTube. So make sure you hit that like button. Make sure you subscribe and you'll be able to keep tabs on uh, all the, the after facts. And especially if your runner was out here or you were pacing and you want to go back and find it, all of those videos are going to be there for you to check out. But here we are. We got Gene Dykes, our oldest runner in the field trying to become the oldest 
finisher of Western States ever at the ripe young age of 75. And his pacer is doing, doing, doing due diligence, keeping him moving as best as he can. And that's what it takes. It takes a village. Most everyone we've talked to in studio today, out there on the course, they've all highlighted this element of community, this element of family. And whether you are a runner in this race and it's just you and your pacer and your headlamps, or it's everyone at the big aid stations like Forest Hill making a whole scene with all of the noise makers, that, that's your community. Those are people supporting you, trying to make sure that you make it from the start to the finish. And that's what it's about. So super stoked to see Gene out here. Absolutely just being an inspiration. Already gone more than 62 miles across the 100K mark and is still pushing steady stepping forward. Trying to get an overall picture of where we're at in the race at this moment. All things considered, we have had 32 folks cross the finish line here of the 379 starters. Only 31 drops thus far, so we still have, somebody can do the math on that, about 310-ish runners still out there on course. It's a lot of activity to follow here over the course of, well, Gene is bringing up, uh, bring up the race about 63 miles in now. That means we got 300 folks in the last 37 miles of their Western States journey. A lot of, a lot of fun, a lot of stories, a lot of pain, but a lot of perseverance out there right now. As we take it back to the river, down here at Rucky Chucky, we got some more runners hopping into the boat to make it across, because it's definitely too high of water for this year uh, with all the snow melt. Try to see if I can get a bib number. Appreciate the, the GoPro team helping me out here. All right, so if I read that right, it should be Sarah Rondorf. Hold it down from Andover, Minnesota. Let's see if she's moving well, gotten boat without incident. Got the pacer along. She's like, I don't need a hand, I got this on my own. That is what is up. And the party keeps going. I don't know about those dance moves. Without hearing the music, I don't know if, I, if those were quality dance moves, but I support the energy that they are bringing to the runners down there at Rucky Chucky. Just having a blast. And that's what the runners need right now. You know, they've been at it for 19 hours. They are grooving and grinding along just like we have Gene Dykes doing right now on screen. And anything we can do to, to brighten up their day a little bit. We're probably approaching about 1.5 minutes. We get to two miles downhill. Uh, so the first, first section just downhill on the pavement. Then it turns into a, a bit of a trail. There for generations, it feels like. You know, we got, we got some aid station folks that have been in for 
two, well, three, now, right? four years. We've yeah, got folks that that. for <laughs> over two decades. Well, not so not quite. You can guys. still uh, so, still come um, to catch people. Huge but... Shout out to our volunteers, oh, yeah. our yeah. aid station captains, yeah, our media so team. Nobody's going to be passing us now. Yep. And then obviously all the pacers and crew helping these runners on the acute and individual level uh, make it all the way to Placer. We're watching more action down by the river. I believe that was bib 175. Let's see if I can confirm that it was indeed Richard Thomason. I believe it was representing Cape Town. Shout out Cape Town. So yeah, so uh, I believe my chat is up to date. Um, and the question around uh, Cordy DeWalter uh, finished outstanding course record by about 80 minutes um, did not complete her interview uh, with us post race because she got a little sick as one does when they run lights out uh, an all time baller performance um, yeah she's good she's okay uh, talk to her husband um, yeah everything's fine this is just what happens when you turn yourself inside out and try to get the most out of yourself you sometimes leave it literally all out on the track so um, she's good she made it through drug testing um, also like a pro um, and and she is now recuperating so all good there but thanks for checking in folks And here we go. We still got Gene Dykes on asphalt, so still making his way towards that left-hand turn off of Forest Hill Road and onto uh, what most everyone knows as Cal Street. And so we'll definitely keep tabs on uh, on him as we go. I believe on screen, this is Jamie Knott from Calgary. So another Canadian baller hopping in the boat here. Yeah, moved down uh, pretty, pretty gingerly. Toward, towards the boat as one would expect when you've been grinding for the last 19 hours through snow, through ice underfoot, through hot temperatures of the day, and then 13 miles of straight downhill and just ruthless uphill to, to add to it. But Jamie, no stranger to uh, 200 milers and no stranger to Western States, actually ran here back in 2017 that last fire and ice year uh, and ran a 28.35. So pretty much still bang on uh, to, to get another good finish here. Maybe even actually beat that time from 2017. So uh, shout out to Jamie for for putting in the work and grinding down there to Rocky Chucky. Just 20 more miles to go. <laughs> Meanwhile, Cruz chilling. Maximum relaxation. Everybody needs a good chair. I, at this point of the day, will support that, um, but also definitely got to make sure they're staying, staying warm. So definitely need to keep layered up and rocking. As we got eyes on Gene Dyke still moving down. His pace are checking the watch to make sure that they are consistently grooving towards uh, the Q 
Cal 1 and Cal 2 aid stations. If you are looking for a runner, you want to check in on folks, or you just want to favorite them so that you can eventually take a nap, come back, and check in on them very conveniently, uh, go ahead and head on over to ultralive.net. And right there, you can check out all the runner tracker, find out how folks who've already finished have done, and where folks on course are at. I don't know if this guy's doing like a Naruto thing, if he's putting on sunscreen. I don't really know what bug spray. I don't I don't know if these dance moves are okay for YouTube consumption without some sort of rating, but hey, he's having a good time with his birthday hat on, and I'm going to allow it. Which makes me believe this might be Yeah, I think I I think I know exactly who those folks were. Um, if the birthday hat strikes me. So um, So yeah, so we'll we'll be down there for one for when one David Lamb of the Bay Area and San Francisco Running Company comes through. Because uh, today is David's birthday, and we are going to celebrate all the way from uh, apparently the river to the finish line um, as, as he comes through. So I will also send some texts to make sure that my teammates please, please dance better. And we're back with Gene Dykes rolling through. It looks like we are off the main um off the main road, we've made the left-hand turn and are grinding our way down towards Cal 1. So this section, of course, has definitely been uh, altered a bit by the mosquito fire that impacted uh, not just the race course, but the community surrounding this area um, last fall. With the fire, obviously, we lost a lot of the vegetation uh, in, in that area. Not so much an issue here um, at nighttime, but as they had to reconstruct a lot of that trail, um, in many respects, it's actually significantly smoother and, and more buttery uh, than it has historically been. So hopefully um, that that is a little bit um, more beneficial uh, for Gene as he chases these, um, as he chases this cutoff. So that being said, we are going to, uh, we're going to bring somebody into the studio and chat uh, if, if she can meander up here. Cool. It's happening. Uh, as, as she fills in the, I, we're going to give you as much chair as you want. Uh, we have the legend uh, that ran, not, not even a random baller at this point, um, but a name that you all are going to have to remember for some time to come, Canadian All-Star. Jenny Quilty, how are you doing? <laughs> okay, I got you. All right, now that, that was my fault. Now you're set up for success. Um, so we have Jenny Quilty here. Um, very happy to be done. Very happy. I wouldn't wish it away, though, to be clear. Like running, I know it's something people wait 10 years to get into and spend a lot of their running career dedicating their time to getting into it. So I was not wishing away any miles. But now that I'm here, I'm very happy. <laughs> <laughs> and, that's, and I think that's completely warranted. You had a phenomenal day out there. This is a highly competitive field, and the you you ran the fastest 11th place finish by over an hour. Like it's 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 a blessing and a curse to have such a good day time wise and still be sort of the first one out of that automatic entry. But mm -hmm. How are you feeling overall about the day? Are you, are, I mean, proud, yeah. exhausted? Like, walk us through your mental state right now. I'm honestly quite ecstatic. I'm probably the happiest 11th place finisher of all time <laughs> <laughs> um, because I had set time goals for myself that ranged from saying if I was in the 18s, I would be over the moon. This is only my second 100 miler, yeah. my first time at States. So 
if I was under nine, or yeah, anything within 18 to start <laughs> would be so, so wonderful. And then uh, I also figured up to about 19 and a half would probably put me in the top 10. About three or four hours ago, I knew that wasn't going to be the case. And I was still gonna run a time faster than I really had ever imagined on this course for myself in my first year at it. So I, yeah, I have, like there's nothing that could have went better for me today. Uh, I'm so happy. Well, brief time out. Mm -hmm. Speaking of happiness, uh, we do have a proposal currently happening on the track. And I'm assuming because there's a hug that <laughs> she said yes. Yeah, I feel good about that. Okay, I gotta, I gotta track down who just finished. Um, so I want to make sure that we, we celebrate that moment because who doesn't love love? Um, ben Cook? Ben Cook. Benjamin Cook. Western State's finisher and now newly engaged person. <laughs> so congrats, bud. Um, also, way to get back up off of one knee after running 100.2 miles. So, so. All right. That's probably the riskiest part of that. <laughs> we've we've seen some very interesting decisions carrying babies, mm -hmm. kneeling down. It, it's it's been a scene up here. Um, but but back to you and and back to your day, as you as you mentioned, uh, you had a time goal. You thought, hey, if I if I hit this, I'm going to be like right there in in that uh, that top five, top ten. As you got reports that that was not necessarily going to be the case, how did your mindset? shift at all? Were you just like, yo, I, this is my plan and I'm sticking to it? You know, or did you have to like sort of have a mantra? How do you adjust on the fly in, in, in these sorts of conditions? Yeah, I think coming into the race, the first thing I had set up for myself was to run my own race because the field is so competitive. Yeah. There are women who have very different strengths than I do. Uh, so I really didn't want to get caught up early on doing anything about my own race plan. So that had just been kind of the plan the whole day. Um, and I, I found like I had moments maybe earlier on where I thought, oh, okay, I'm gonna catch those two runners. I'm gonna maybe move up to eighth, you know, or ninth. Um, and then as that shifted, I went, you know what? Like it is what it is. I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna keep putting my all into this. I'm going to keep chasing, and see what happens. And I mean, the the best reality to me ever is that the field is too strong. Like no one crashed. You know that that's the best thing. Like that's so cool. And uh, I I truly couldn't be happier for the historic year that it was here in so yeah. many different ways. Uh, and to be part of that field and, and not get caught up, yeah, in worrying about that aspect on its own. Like it was, yeah, it was super fun. Like again, it's Western States. You make the start line, you're winning. <laughs> exactly. And we've, we've been talking about the community element and, and you know, sort of like how this all feels like one large family. This is your first state. Mm -hmm. So now you get to be indoctrinated into the family. Yeah. So congratulations. Well, and last oh. year I paced Katie Asmith. So I feel like that was also a huge indoctrination in many ways. Yes. And again, like so happy for her today. We got to run together a little bit. So it's, yeah, once you are here or do anything really around this event, I think you're part of the family. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, we appreciate the folks in, in the live chat showing you love. You, when when you were coming in, like, folks were going ecstatic in the oh. chat. So you got a lot of fans. Uh, I, mean, I assume a lot of new fans because you absolutely balled out there today. Thank you all. <laughs> and and the question I, I, I have to ask you is, this is your second 100-miler. You really, well, your first 100-miler was how many months ago at this point Six. like like where do you go from here what like obviously you, you want to sort of decompress from this experience but but now you have you have an idea of where what your potential might be what, what yeah. where do you want to go ah uh, <laughs> i don't know <laughs> to bed <laughs> Just, um, no i i do have ccc coming up next and i do think utmb is something that's on my list for one day um i mean so far, the 200 milers I've done could not be more different with the Doethanon 100 miler in Thailand with, mm -hmm. you know, uh, was it 30,000 feet of vert <laughs> and very different trails um, compared to this. So I, I, yeah, I think it's definitely opening up the door that I, I've kind of known about for a while. Like every time I run longer, I'm like, mm, that seems to go kind of well. Yeah. So <laughs> I think I did have a moment today where I was like, you know what? I don't think I want to do a 200 miler. Like that crossed my mind out there. <laughs> Fair. So I can't say that's next, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think um, I also don't want to overdo it. Like it's my first full year of running 100 milers. So I think kind of one to two a year is a great spot for me to go in the next while. But yeah, I, I don't know. I'll share when I find out. <laughs> awesome. Well, we yeah. will be here 
searching for the answer. And and the last the last question I have for you, because I know you want to go to bed and refuel and just like be a person, um, <laughs> is you know we saw so many young fans out here on the track supporting in the stands. We've seen folks uh, who are watching with their with their young ones mm -hmm. uh, in the live feed. Any message to the to the folks, what young or old, that might be interested in uh, pursuing an active lifestyle that you want to send out to the crowd? Oh, I love that. I love that you broadened it to old or young, like any age. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, message like to humans <laughs> in general, it, like whatever, uh, whatever you're passionate about, do it. Like just make that a priority in your life. Ask for it, even if you have to ask for it from people around you and it's something different than what you've ever wanted to do. Um, I think there's a lot of power to doing things that make us happy. For sure. And I hope everybody has the opportunity to seek that out in their life. Abs yeah, words to live by. Absolutely great. I don't know how you were so pathetic after, <laughs> after running 100 miles, but like, I'm here for it. So oh, thank, thank you, you for spending your day with us out there, for sharing your journey uh, that we got to follow along. Thank you for taking time to be up here with me. Thank you. Now go rest. Yeah. Go enjoy your go enjoy your evening. Thank you. Appreciate you. And we'll see you again here soon. Thank you. <laughs> and here we are on the track. More folks bringing in uh, to the finish. <laughs> Let's go. Jordan Chang coming through, representing Blacksburg, Virginia. So I'm pretty sure that was the VA he was throwing up there. Beast Coast, Mid-Atlantic States, stand up. And we got somebody else joining in the studio as Jordan comes around last 50 meters, pointing, showing love, realizing the dream. And hey, you can't be mad. Random ballers coming through in 19 hours and 26 minutes at Western States. Just an absolute day for Jordan Chang. Shout out, congrats. Kissing the babies, shake some hands, check the box, go get a snack. Speaking of a snack, I'm joined in the studio by, <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that analogy. Uh, Jam Jam, Jamil Curry, how you doing, buddy? I'm good, sir. <laughs> this is your second live stream of the day, <laughs> legally Tr speaking. Trying to see how many we can do today. How, how, how have you been? What, what were you doing out there with, with the live stream? Where, 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 where's, where's your spirit at? Yeah, well, I'm still awake, which is surprising. We'll see. There's no photos of me asleep on the track yet. but Yeah, being the operative word. It's not over. It's not over. Yeah, I got recruited to join the live stream team this year, so I'm officially credentialed, although I'm not wearing my credentials as you are. I don't know why I'm doing I it. I snuck in here. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, I... I got to fly some drones today across the course, which was a lot of fun. So was out at Michigan Bluff and Forest Hill and then the Rucky Chucky River Crossing and then the finish line here. So got the top 10 men and women in and then decided to give it a break for the night and we'll be back again tomorrow. This is not the first time you've been at Western States, but this is the first time you've been a part of the live stream, the official production here. What, what What's that experience like? What's it like to bring this iconic race to the people, knowing that you direct iconic races as well, but but Western States holds a special place in your heart and in the community's heart. What's it like to be a part of this team? I mean, it's just awesome. It, I think I heard on the stream, you know, it's a mostly volunteer team out here that is doing this, volunteering their time and their efforts to bring these amazing images and stories bring them to life and bring them out there to all of you and the viewers showed up today big time we got to shout everyone out i think we're the entire production team i think is blown away by the viewership numbers i think it's just a testament to what you know western states is in its 50th year yeah. it's a special year and the ecosystem of western states is incredible the people that are involved it's just it's great to be part of it in my small way i didn't do a lot but it's just nice to be here and, and to give back hey man i was standing next to you when you got a couple of those shots uh the tom evans roby point 
track down. Uh, you know, the, those those are those are important moments. You know, you, you've captured some moments historically that might not have seemed like a big deal at the time, but then ultimately sort of make make people's experiences, make people's make people in, come into the sport in many ways. I mean, thinking about Zach Miller, how many people, you know, were aware of him going into World Champs because of Miller v Hawks and you know, videos like that. So. It, yeah, it's great. And I tried to record as much as I could today, especially as the day started to unfold and just knowing that this could be a historic day with what Courtney did out there, with what Tom did out there. I mean, we're, we as a sport, want we're going to want these images. I mean, in, in real time is amazing that we got to share those, but also just that we can have these and that we can look back upon them. Like, imagine if we had just incredible drone, drone shots of Ellie uh, and her course record or those that came before us, Scott Jurek's, all his stuff. I know there are a lot of films out there, but it's just cool. And so as a, as a sort of student of the sport, uh, in many ways, you've helped write a bit of that story, but where do you see the narrative element of ultra running going and trail running going? Do you see it as we're in a position where we're still trying to build the brand or do you think we're at a point where we can really like, instead of worry about breadth, we can go deeper with some of these stories. Where, where, where do you see the landscape at right now? Oh man, getting the deep question yeah. here. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think telling, I think that second part sounds great to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, we've, I think we've done a lot over the years, but I think, I think telling those unique stories is is super important. I mean, we were just watching Gene Dykes throwing up. Yeah. I think is he in Forest Hill right now, or is he? He's, where little, is he? he's now making his way down Cal Cal Street. Yeah. And I think I think we ultimately cut from that shot because we're like, I don't know if this needs to live forever <laughs> on the internet, but uh, you know what he's doing out there. There's just a lot of a lot of great stuff out there. Absolutely. So so let's talk about the Masters athlete element of the race right we've seen so many folks in their 40s 50s 60s and beyond doing big notable things in the sport but you can see from even your own races folks that are entering the sport at that age tell me more about what you're seeing uh as a is it a renaissance the, of folks finding running is it folks falling back in love with running and you know are we going to see uh, a larger impact for uh, our masters runners as they continue on uh or, and, and this sport continues to grow i mean what we're really seeing is i don't know what you call it but the octogenarians i mean that to me is an incredible thing that has kind of happened recently we had all the guys at jackpot we're seeing gene dykes out here pushing limits working towards a finish at Western States, which hopefully we'll see here in a few hours uh, later this morning. And so, yeah, people enter the sport, I think at any, at all sorts of ages. And I don't know, I, I didn't, but, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I think you've only been here for like 20 years or I've whatever. Been, I've so been here too fun. long. So people are probably ready to push me out. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Only by making you do weird challenges and eat weird foods and try to do oh we got some ideas don't don't say that on don't say that on the internet man they're gonna make us execute always i know um so so let's talk about the the race that unfolded today uh because we we haven't had you on the live stream to chat about it obviously on the men's side tom evans for the win uh with a a beautifully executed race uh, it sort of broke away on Cal Street from from Dakota Jones and really ran away with it. And then still a highly competitive uh, top 10 after that. And, and hell, even into the 15 and, and 20 range on the guy's side. And on the women's side, pack running. You had Courtney off the front uh, following or uh, being followed by Katie Scheid. And then you basically had a group of four and like another group of four uh, right behind. What were your impressions of the race, uh, both following it as you were flying out here this morning, uh, and then uh, and then watching it unfold, tactically, was it what you expected was going to happen today, or yeah, what, what were your impressions? Yeah, I mean, it was a little. I was following it as much as I could with everything that I was 
going through to get here today. Uh, but then, you know, witnessing it in real time was was really cool. And of course, it's a continuation of some of these storylines from the Golden Ticket series, which I think is, and I was able to go to a lot of the races this year. And, and of course we helped live stream some of them. So I, I didn't get to talk with all the athletes personally, but just seeing it is really cool. You know, we had, you know, Yanosh and, or even more so Tom Evans and Anthony Castales who battled at Black Canyon and they're out there, you know, near each other during the race. Um, I was filming at Forest Hill watching Dakota run through there first and they had that reroute that you don't turn left on Cal Street this year. You have to go further and I didn't even know about that change. Mm -hmm. I was a little confused. Personally, I wasn't watching apparently all the charts, but watching Dakota run down basically forever down that main street and then tom evans catch back up with him and i barely caught a glimpse of them i don't think it made it onto the live but they linked up just as they were hitting that dirt road heading down towards the river crossing i was like that is so cool these two incredible athletes teaming up here running stride for stride you know kind of into the meat of this race here at western states and of course we know what happened after that but yeah so you you've sort of brought up the fact that you've had the opportunity to live stream a good number of these golden ticket races uh obviously javelina and black canyon being part of aravipa and then the aravipa orbit which you own and direct um but then we also had the opportunity to do bandera as well with the expansion of live streaming these races and having this content that lives in the moment but then also in perpetuity after the fact how do you see that playing into this this overall narrative? Like the fact that we can talk about, you know, a Ryan Montgomery not finishing at Bandera, but then going to Tarawera. The fact that we can we know the names of, a, a, you know, Jeff Colt or a JP Giblin, where we might exactly. have had that information. Like how do yeah. you how do you see the live streaming sort of impacting uh, the stories that we get to follow at Western States, but then also how that might translate into. Uh, the careers that some of these folks uh, and the contracts that they might sign. Yeah, I think it's an incredibly exciting time where there's a lot of passionate people that love this sport. They're, we're all, it seems like we're all just working together to do our own piece of it. Even, I got to shout out, I mean, all of the media organizations that are out here this week, you know, taking the time to come out and, and take the risk and the investment to make something happen. We got some, Oh, this might be Gene. That is Gene. You got Gene Dykes here in the as we talk about this as one of our storylines out there on the trail, which is great to see. Um, but yeah, we've got some incredible just people, groups, passionate, you know, making investments in the sport, coming out here. Single track podcast guys got to shout them out. They did some some really cool stuff out of their uh, their rental house this whole last week. I was was glued to those interviews, really candid interviews. It's awesome to see it. Um, but yeah, I think it's incredibly important, I think for Western States, just for the sport in general to have, you know, we can't live stream every race. Right. It's just not possible. It's it's a huge commitment of time and energy and expense and, and attention. And I think having a few of these series is is critically important. And it's really cool to see it all play out I mean, there are people that are working so hard to get into this race, and yeah. and here they are. This is the day. This is the special day for out, for all of them. And and there is the all of the drama that goes with sport out there, and you see it unfold. I mean, I didn't quite catch it. I think I was flying at the time, but Ke uh, Keeley at the river, mm -hmm. I didn't quite hear or see what happened there. But it's like another. Like an agony of defeat again after a triumph at Black Canyon this year. Yeah. It's just the roller coaster of the sport on display of just humanity. Absolutely, yeah. And and for those who might not have been watching at the time, uh, the long story short is that uh, Keely Henninger was uh, vying for a top five overall spot in that highly competitive women's field. Um, took took a bit of a fall, dislocated her shoulder. Um, was unable to uh, fully rectify the situation, had to get taken across the river in the boat uh, and then uh, sort of hike her way out of, this, of, uh, of the race. So uh, 
this on the heels of last year having a pretty bad ankle roll uh, that took her out of the race around Michigan Bluff. Um, so, so definitely uh, one of those unfortunate storylines that that plays out. But it is again sort of the the agony of defeat. But in some respects, um, also makes us more invested in uh, what happens next. How does she bounce back? Um, obviously, hoping that first and foremost she's healthy and well. But then. Uh, the redemption tale that comes from that. Well, looking back to our course real quick, we, we kind of took a little side tangent there because we didn't have any runners that had hit Roby Point inbound here for the finish, but now we do. And in fact, Casey Lichtai mm -hmm. is now through Roby Point here, coming in for her ninth finish of the Western States 100, which will guarantee her a slot next year, going for her 10th for her 1,000 mile. That is such a again talking about folks who had some struggle had some challenges um and have been able to persevere um casey obviously former winner of this race um and and bouncing back obviously not necessarily vying for the top 10 uh today but knowing that mission one is to get to the finish line as long as she gets to the finish line she gets one more crack at it next year uh guaranteed sort of a uh a excellent facet of this race is once you finish nine you automatically get to come back the next year for for your 10th 10th attempt uh to to get that special buckle so well piggybacking off that i think i was about to say you know someone like casey the ups and downs i mean she had so many ups at this race and then has definitely had some struggles with the exception of someone like tim tweet my hair <laughs> with his what 25 consecutive sub 24 hours i think yeah, that wrong, is yeah. it's like you could say you had a down year but you still went sub 24 right. <laughs> like is it really a down like yeah if that's your floor i think you're doing quite okay in life and most people would be stoked for that but no oh, go for it oh i was just gonna say this is is this down by the river it is i'm I'm loving the shots down there tonight, and they seem to have really, they lighted up really well. Mm -hmm. It looks really awesome down there. Yeah, no, you got you to shout out the the volunteers out there holding it down, uh, making sure we have these shots, making sure that we are doing it. Is that who I think it is? Is that Mr. Uh, Sadibe? It that looks like, does... Cor is that Corey? Oh, it is. It... That's Corey. It is Corey. All right, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know. They were both wearing. Where is dark. Hella? Um, he was through Forest Hill last time we checked, probably about an hour ago. Um, but he's moving. But yo, Corey is just vibing, just having a good time out here. So glad to have him back. Oh, Hella is through Cal Three at the moment. Sweet. So we should actually be seeing him um, sometime relatively soon down at the river as well. I have to keep an eye on that. Yeah, Corey. It says court. Oh, so is this Green Gate? Does that make sense? ALT. Oh, okay. We're at ALT. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, this is the first time I'm seeing this <laughs> this tree. Oh, okay. Now I now I'm putting yeah, it it together. Makes sense. So good for Corey. And yeah, so we're down. This is back down at the river, um, at Rocky Chucky on the near side. As runners come, get some snacks, get attended to, and then hop in the boat for a uh, short little cruise across the riv we got a runner coming in here with that very bright uh setup Let's see if i can pull that uh that bid number so casey we're waiting on her she'll be our next finisher here at the high school she came across roby point which is just over one mile downhill to the finish and that was at 12.35, so approximately eight minutes ago. So we should be seeing her within the next five to eight minutes, something awesome. like that. Awesome. Yeah, I think uh, the runner we just saw on screen at the at the river was uh, Simone Silatita from Italy. Wow, this field is so deep, and I think the front of the pack was so fast that I've forgotten about some of the people that are in the field. And I apologize <laughs> to them and to everyone who's out here, but we also have Alex Nichols coming in soon. Yeah. I'm all, I'm just looking down this list. We got Tomo in the field. Shout out to Tomo from Japan. Yeah. Ryan Kaiser. 
is out here. Riley Brady still coming on in. I mean, there, there are so many stories out there. Jeff Kozak, he beat me at San Diego 100 a handful of years ago. He's out here. This is great. And it's just such a wild time because here's the thing. We've had, I mean, how many people finish at this point? Like 33, 34, uh, 34 finishers, and we're still under 20 hours. That's incredible. Yeah. It's going to be a big silver buckle year. I mean, we're going to have well over 100, I'm sure. And that's going to be one of the storylines that we're going to follow here as we uh, go through the night and approach that 5 a.m. cutoff for the silver buckles. Um, for those who are unaware, basically two colors of buckles. You got silver, you got bronze. You get a silver one if you're under 24 hours. You get a bronze one if you finish between 2401 and that 30-hour cutoff. So um, we fully expect that there will be a big tranche of folks that are trying to push in that last uh, you know, 23 to 24 hours, and we're going to celebrate all of those folks, and then we're going to keep celebrating everyone who finishes after that, just with a slightly different color buckle as they come through. Is this Casey? I believe it is. If we are on cement, that definitely means it is Casey. Coming on down the final grind through the neighborhood. Coming onto the track, actually. Wiggle, wiggle. I look up, I see the headlights. She's coming on the back Here stretch. we go. Casey Ligtag coming in, finishing her ninth Western States. And she is on the track. There she comes. It's special. It's special. And she is it, kicking, enjoying it. I mean, it feels like it's so much later, but it's still sub 20 hours. We have to remember this. Correct. Still an incredible time, an incredible run out here. And and to think about what she's come back from that surgery, she wasn't able to bear weight for weeks afterwards. And not only to come back here, but to thrive in doing so and guarantee that she comes back again next year. She is, she's already like stoked all the time but this one this one's going to mean a lot to her i've been amazed at how fast some of these runners are doing this track lap yeah it's incredible my jaw has dropped multiple that, times that is awesome and she's coming in with with the crew 19 hours and 47 minutes for casey Licktag. just boss absolute boss there it is, ninth time. And we'll see her back next year. That's got to feel good. I, I mean, not just for her. feels good for everybody who helped her get to this point. I mean, I know uh, very close with her family uh, back at home. You know, if you follow her on, on IG, she's always uh, posting about them and, and how they're uh, just getting through life together. But and I mean, it's going to mean a lot to the aid station that sort of like gave up their their guaranteed race admin spot to put her in so she can get this night. Like people are people support they're, her. They're invested. They are very invested in her as a person and her as a runner. So super stoked. Have to we see talked her. about these shirts that the finishers are getting? Yet? We have not. OK. Do you know much about them? I know that you and everyone can get them. Really? Yeah. Oh, if you go to the. Uh, Western States website. Really? There's a like store link at the bottom. You should be able to pick up those bad boys. Uh, I think these are the if I, if I saw them right, these are the Rabbit branded ones. So okay. uh, And Fleet Feet locally also has them. So All you can right. check out. All right. Yeah. That was not meant to be a sales pitch. Well, I just saw that they're handing these Hawaiian-style <laughs> shirts out yeah, to right. all finishers for the 50th anniversary. Well, I'm just giving you the facts of the case. If you want one at home, do we That's have a think. dedicated Gene cam that I'm not aware of? This is pretty much This is it, looking yeah. great. So Gene is our final runner in the race. Mm -hmm. He's 75, and he left Forest Hill or checked into Forest Hill 11.45 p.m. Alongside Corey Norris, who's also out there. But there's a handful of folks within about 15 minutes of Gene. There's about 10 of them. So this is our currently our caboose of the race. The sweep. The sweep. Who is the sweep? The sweep cam. I mean, it's it's 
it's so awesome that we have volunteers who are willing to take their time and energy to help us bring this uh, bring this to you all. So, so thank you to this. They're getting camp. some good miles in. <laughs> yeah, just a nice little training run. No big deal. All these light up signs, the Auburn Lakes Trail signs. I need to get out there on this course more because I am missing all this. This is great. Well, sir, uh, I know a couple golden ticket races that happen in Arizona that you might be able to hop in. And I actually, I'm hunting for my Western States qualifier for the year. I, I'm i behind. I don't have one yet. Well, I'd tell you I'm you're running also out of time because <laughs> everything's sold out. Well, you also are behind on training, but that's that's oh, an that's issue another, I'll take with you another, another, another uh, time. Yeah, another time. Um, yeah, I think you might know a guy who knows a race that is in your own backyard that you could probably run really nope. bad too okay if it comes down to it and then finish fast enough to also help with the live stream please and thank you um as we are here looking at a aid station being manned by a i believe walrus um yeah we're gonna go with walrus and it and also looks like they had a dj launching. at this one well a little hurt i wasn't called but it's fine um i'm having fun with you all here uh we're having, we're having a grand old time down here at the river as we got more folks coming through. I'm going to try to get some bib numbers here so we can shout these folks out and uh, give them a whole a whole lot of love that they, that they deserve. All right. That looks like bib 375. That's Justin Mayorga. And just uh, hanging out with him was Jared Struck, it appeared. Jared, I don't even know. That, that can't make sense. Let's go with Garrett. Yeah. Yeah, that tracked. There we go. Garrett Peltonen, that's who is also in that group. And a quick check-in for those of you at home who are tuning in to see some finishers coming in soon. We've got three more runners that are through Roby Point with a mile to go. This was actually about close to 10 minutes ago for some of these folks. We got Reed, Reed Brewer. Indeed. Stephanie Austin and Thomas Wagner are all inbound from Roby Point. We should be seeing them relatively soon here yeah reads uh reads a local boy Folsom California Stephanie is coming to us from Australia and Thomas Wagner is that also us what's AUT country's AUT. Austria? Austria. That makes sense. So we've got some international runners making their way in here. Could probably squeak in under 20 hours still. Nothing to it but to do it. He says having not run 100 miles today. Is that 115? 115 Clifford Matthews it's going to take a little sit. Or no, 3.15. Oh, 3.15. Okay. Travis Mattern, Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Hey, let's go. Oh, and we've got someone on the track. They are going so fast. Oh, my goodness. Is this two people? Is this a race on the track? I... It's got to be, right? Yeah. No. I mean, well, I think there was or some space between Alex just, and Tom. They're just happy to be here. Well, that's just how Reed gets down. Yeah. That's pretty standard Reed, Reed behavior. Do you know Reed, or you just? I do. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Okay. I, I guess you. if you, did, yeah, if you didn't know that, uh, yeah, no. Reed is a, uh, I believe, SRA elite athlete uh, coming from Folsom. So actually uh, pretty much down the road from one Cole Watson that you might have 
been following today. Um, yeah, I run into Reed all the time at, at local races. So I see the big stuff. Reed sign in the background too. Yeah, I mean, this is his backyard for sure. So I know a lot of folks are stoked to see him uh, finish here today. Under 20 hours. So just a, uh, he'll be happy with that. He'll be happy with that for sure. And we'll be on the lookout for Stephanie Austin next from Australia. So I want to verify. I was like, I'm pretty sure Reed hasn't run Western before. Yeah, this is his first Western finish. Um, he's run a lot of races in this area. Rio de Lago, uh, way too cool, canyons. Like, he knows these trails back and forth. Um, but super stoked for him to finally get the big one out the way. So, good job, Reed. And yes, he is also just wickedly fast. So, I was not surprised to see him throw down on the track just because that's Reed behavior. Uh, Gene Dykes in the aid station. Got to assume this is Cal 1 getting loaded up. And these volunteers are definitely making sure he gets everything he needs and gets out of Dodge because he has one hour and 55 minutes to get down to Cal 2 before that cutoff. So they're going to take their time to do it right, but they're also going to get him right on out the door. And Stephanie should be coming on the track any moment now. As we continue to have eyes on Rucky Chucky, aid station down at mile 78. And there, there she we go. is representing Australia. Crew had, I mean, arguably some of the best shirts um, of, of the day. Stephanie came in via a golden ticket at Tarawera finishing second place there. This is her debut 100 miler. And I think she's going to be uh she's going to be back. She's going to be doing big things. And here she is, slipping under 20 hours. Again, this is just a wild, wild women's race to have Stephanie Austin, 19 hours, 58 minutes, 37th overall. And just, just smashed it. 13th female in 19 hours and 58 minutes. I just, I, Is this the most women we've had sub-20? It has to be. I mean, F11, Jenny was an hour faster than any F11 ever, so I got to assume. Um, I, I kind of hope it's the eighth patient fireball is asleep and can't fact check me on that, but uh, but but yeah, it's just a wild time to <laughs> it's just it's a wild time in statement. And even though we are in the cool of the night, 
runners making sure they are hydrated and moving well through these aid stations. Love to see it. I think this is that, I think it's that ALT aid station. Without the nice trees, kind of hard to to get a full appreciation of it, but we got runners still coming through. And we're gonna have runners coming through for the next 10 hours as it is now 1 a.m. here Pacific time. 20 hours race time. This looks like pointed rocks to me, but We'll see here, 118. Wait, there is no 118. Oh wait, maybe there is? David Wilkins. Thank you. Talk about lo local boy. Slept in his own bed last night, coming from Truckee. Yeah, this is Pointed Rocks. So, yeah. So we are here watching David Wilkins coming through Pointed Rocks. 13 women have broken 20 hours in Truckee being literally the next town over from where Olympic Valley is. David just had a uh, pretty solid Silver State 50 performance last month ran a 938 there and john medinger just came over the loudspeaker saying that the most women that had broken 20 hours was 10 previously and 13 this year absolutely and looks like we've got eyes on our next finisher coming in should be thomas wagner And after that, we'll be keeping an eye out for Alex Nichols, who's our next runner due in to Roby Point. Mm -hmm. But first, we have Thomas from Austria. He's like, like not, not to be outdone, you guys all got to see my beautiful country a few weeks ago for World Championships. Now I'm going to come tour yours. I love it. I love it. Getting it done here. Last turn, and then onto the track. I can see the headlamp in the distance here. So this is something that you would appreciate. Uh, Thomas won the Iger Ultra Trail 250K. Dang. Last year. Wow. 50 hours, 47 minutes. So no no stranger to being out there and, and this is a walk putting in the some park. Hurting. Yeah. But here he is coming around the track. Just a little less than 200 meters to go. So he's going to be the first person to finish just after this 20-hour mark. But no shame in the game because he's still going to be top 40 overall at Western States. The manager just said, uh, proud dad of a little two-year-old. So hopefully they're... Uh, getting to appreciate this via the live stream all the way all the way around the world is it's midday there probably midday yeah, yeah. so hope good they, time to tune good time to finish hope they got to uh appreciate uh a dad and a partner 
coming across the finish line here at Western States, having a absolutely banger of a day. Well, at this point, we don't have any more inbound runners. Just a quick heads up. I think in a few minutes, we're going to be ending this stream number two and launching stream number three, which is already on the YouTube for the Western States channel. So that'll be coming up in a few minutes here. And that will carry us through the next set of hours. I don't know if that, that might be the final one. Is it, is it three in total? You know, I didn't, I don't know. I think it, I think it is. So you can go <laughs> up to 12 hours. So it, don't quote me on this, but it might be the final stream. It's all good. Into the next section segment. Either way, pretty sure it should auto push you over. But we appreciate you all hanging out with us and continue to do so through the evening uh, because we still got 300 people out there that we got to bring home. And we want you all to share in those moments and in that energy with us. So make sure you stay locked in. You know, if you, if you got premium, you can just put YouTube in your pocket and go for your run. Turn the screen off so you don't accidentally text or call some people you don't want to uh, or write weird things in the chat. And, yeah, just keep vibing with us throughout the night here and into the daylight. Absolutely. We'll be here. I guess the sun's going to be coming up sooner than we think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Another four hours. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we will get a proper second sunrise. Um, pretty much it, we, got, we got a lot of landmarks coming up. We've got the 24-hour silver buckle cutoff coming and then we got second sunrise and then golden hour and then the awards ceremony so we are just going to be just bang on full of fun for the next 12 hours there's a lot to come there's a lot of energy out on that course still look at all these people down by the river just such lots a of crews hanging out making the trek down there taking the shuttle buses And it's all to support people just trying to live their dream. That's right. Folks have been dreaming about this for years. Folks have been in the deck. Or Qualifying been in the year after year, <laughs> yeah. running, traveling, training, all leading up to this day, to this moment. It's a lifestyle. It is a lifestyle. And, and these folks are living their best life out there today. And we're glad to be a part of it as we're down here at Rocky Chucky at the river. You get through here, you got 20, 21 miles to go, and a very short boat ride coming right there. <laughs> Courtesy of Mr. Thornley. Indeed, indeed. I was thinking about that when I was watching him rowing, and I'm just thinking that is the type of strength that I do not have. Yeah. Because I was getting tired just holding up my drone controller <laughs> this afternoon for a couple of hours. Well, I do know that uh, he's got he's got strong arms, and they don't chafe because he is lubed they up with his, don't <laughs> with his girl's nut butter. <laughs> he's got that covered for he, sure. He definitely does. So this is our sweep cam, I am assuming. I'm trying. Yeah, it's kind of hard to tell. I think him and his pacer might have flipped around. Gene Dykes uh, being yeah. on. Yeah, I think we're just get brief snippets. There's they're in and out of service once they get down past Cal One. Definitely. But we will continue to, t to track the tail of Gene Dykes. Uh, if he was moving, that means he's at least out of Cal 1, though. Um, and he's got that hour and uh, basically now an hour and a half to get through Cal 2. Um, so he's got to cover ooh, five miles. And yeah, so... Gene's got to cover five miles in 90 minutes. So this is, and that's, that is a hard cutoff. So we're going to be keeping tabs on that um, as 2.40 a.m. approaches. We have about a two minute warning to our new stream and you will be switched over directly. So don't worry, but we will be uh, switching that on over. We're switching a lot between aid stations here. We'll try and keep you guys updated. The one with the uh, tree here is Auburn Lake Trails, mile 85.2. Yes, want to shout out, uh, coming from, I believe we are at the river still, uh, when we saw Ken Zemock 
uh, from Reno, so just a, a month, an hour up the road from Olympic Valley. Um, he is currently leading our 50 to 59 division. So got to shout him out. Um, actually, that was in the river because he had already come through Quarry Road. So that might have been a uh, pointed rocks. Yeah, coming. this one's this one's pointed rocks yeah, right yeah, here. Yeah. So. All right. And as runners are taking care of themselves, we're going to take a moment to take care of ourselves here. Make sure we are fueled up and ready to rock through the night with you all. So we're going to take a brief break. Uh, that stream, uh, as Jamil mentioned, is going to end here, but you all will be automatically pushed into the next one. So take this moment. Make sure you get your drink of choice. Make sure you got your snacks and buckle up because it's about to be a real fun 10 hours from here. Get oh. yourself prepped for the final push here. Let's but, get it. Uh, we'll be taking a short break and we'll be right back. Catch you guys soon. <laughs> 